The Senate will come to order. There's a privileged report at the desk. The secretary will read the report. Senator Diedzik from the Subcommittee on Conference Committees recommends that the following senators be, and they hereby are appointed as a conference committee on House File Number 100. Senators Port, Umu Verbaten, Murphy, Pa, and Rasmussen. To that motion, all in favor say aye. aye. Senator Diedzik moves the, following, the foregoing appointments be approved. To that motion, all in favor say aye. Those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Members remaining under the order of business of motions and resolutions, Senator Friends, Thank to you, designate Mr. special orders. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, pursuant to Rule 26, I designate the following bill be made a special order for immediate consideration. Members, the special orders list is on your desk. Members, as Senator French mentioned, the special orders is on your desk, and we will start with general orders number 151. That specifically is House File 1938, Senator Rest, which is the omnibus tax bill. Senator Rest. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, today, um, I and the members of the um, Senate Tax Committee on my side of the aisle are happy to present um, Senate House File 1938. Um, Mr. President, I'm assuming there is no special uh, motions or amendments that I need to make to have the bill in front of us the way we want. Senator Russ, to that question, no. Uh, we you. have before us House File 1938. And the Senate language is in it, is that correct? Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank Senator you Russ, that's Just my understanding. Trust but verify. Thank you very much, um, Mr. President. Uh, the Senate tax bill provides $4 billion in tax relief, the largest tax cut in um, in state history, as a matter of fact. Um, it does a number of things to get there. It provides a billion dollars in rebates to middle-class Minnesotan families and individuals, a billion dollars in social security tax reductions. These are all over the next four years, which is our planning documents. One billion dollars for families with extreme childcare expenses, a billion dollars to families with kids, who are especially impacted by the high costs of, um, uh, of life right now. Uh, millions more are provided to help Minnesotans with property taxes, energy costs, and other everyday costs. Over $1 billion in the DFL budget um, are available for local government's aids of one sort or another, over 500 million of that is in the, um, the tax bill that will help local governments provide um, for public safety, for uh, safe and stable housing, for property tax relief, for safe elections, and certainly for income tax reliefs through the various credits. Uh, we're going to, um, we are a team in our committee, and that includes um, our Republican members as well who have been um, so, um, so helpful uh, in, uh, in a number of different areas. And so I don't want to forget, I'm going to thank them right now, Senators Housechild and Draskowski, uh, Senator Putnam, Senator Miller, Senator Dibble, Senator Nelson, Senator Dietzik, 
uh, especially uh, Minority Lead Weber and Vice Chair Klein. I also want to just point out and recognize the efforts of Senator Nelson and her staff in helping and working with Senator um, Housechild on the uh, local sales tax options. I want to thank, and we want to thank our pages. We've had five who've rotated throughout the uh, committee this session. Uh, the lead page is Margot Meyer, Kaylee Courtney, Diane Enders, um, Eliander Sonderope, and Sam Novacheski. Uh, from the Department of Revenue, we have benefited from the uh, uh, intelligence and good judgment of Joanna Bayers. Um, we want to thank our um, legislative assistants and committee administrators, Lamont Pickenen, who works for uh, Senator uh, Weber, uh, Jamie Hishlin, um, who works for Senator Housechild, Tyler Klein for, Sen for Senator Klein, Dan Mickelberg, who is a Republican researcher, Krista Broughton, a DFL researcher, um, Beth Johnson from Senator Dietzik's office, and uh, Christy Blood and Mitch Bergren from my office. And in particular, and especially from all of us, um, Senate Council and, um, and Fiscal, Nora Pollock, Eric Sylvia, Casey Munn, and Bjorn Arneson. And I would encourage members to publicly and personally, individually, um, support and thank all of these fine people. Um, but today we're going to now proceed to a, um, a run-through of the bill, and I've asked various members of the uh, tax committee, uh, the Democratic members, to uh, uh, make presentations. Uh, we have signed up those people with the, uh, with the President's office, and um, uh, that is my introduction, and I, I believe... Um, uh, uh, Senator Ch Champion, you have that list, and we would request that you call on people in turn. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you so very much, Senator Ress. Senator Putnam. Thank you, Mr. President and members. Um, I rise to speak a little bit about the provisions on the taxation of Social Security benefits in the bill that we have before us today. It's a complicated issue one on which we have strong, strong feelings and have been working very, very hard. This session, under the leadership of Senator Rest, the Tax Committee developed a compromise proposal that would exempt 76% of Minnesotans from paying the tax on Social Security benefits. Thanks to Senator Rest's leadership, no couple earning less than $100,000 or an individual earning less than $78,000 will pay a dime of taxes on their Social Security benefits. These numbers aren't a cliff, though. The benefit continues until it's phased out at $140,000. Now, it's worth noting that when we talk about which states tax Social Security benefits and which ones don't, sometimes you hear the numbers 11 states don't tax Social Security benefits, sometimes it's 12. That's because number 12 is New Mexico. New Mexico stops taxing at $140,000. In some ways, this puts us in that same territory as a state that some consider not taxing the benefit at all. In doing this, we will provide $1.1 billion in tax relief to 322,000 Social Security recipients through 2027 who will see an average benefit of over $700. With this phase out, couples earning up to $140,000 and individuals earning up to 118. This is the largest tax cut for retirees who receive Social Security in, uh, benefits in the history of Minnesota. Now, it's important to note that this bill also provides tax relief for those who are ineligible for Social Security benefits, firefighters, state troopers, and others. For the first time, these retirees will have access to similar tax benefits as their peers. Couples earning less than $100,000 may subtract up to $25,000, and individuals earning less than $78,000 can subtract up to $12,500 of their benefits. This is especially important, particularly for our state troopers. Their pensions have horrible colas, and for too long they've been left out of this conversation. This bill hears their concern and remedies this slight. 
Senator Rest and the tax committee have done a yeoman's work in a difficult political context to bring tax relief to Minnesota's seniors, and I am grateful. Senator Klein. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, it's been a privilege to serve as vice chair on the taxes committee uh, this year with Senator Rest as chair and Senator Weber as minority lead. I want to briefly describe for members the uh, provisions surrounding property taxes within the bill uh, and also local government aids and one-time spending. Uh, starting with one-time spending, uh, we do uh, propose uh, rebates uh, out of the one-time surplus that we have, rebates totaling $1.09 billion returned to taxpayers in fiscal year 2024. This would entail $558 for couples filing jointly if they have an income under $150,000, and $279 for uh, married or single filers if they have an income under $78,000, plus $56 per dependent up to three dependents. We also have one-time money going to public safety aid. This would be $300 million in one-time aid to cities, counties, and tribal governments, as well as annually $25 million in grants to local governments through fiscal year 28. The runs for how this uh, will be distributed to cities are available on members' desks. Shifting to property tax relief, we have a number of mechanisms within this bill to provide substantial and well-needed property tax relief to keep Minnesotans in their homes in a time of rapidly escalating property values. Uh, we have an uh, increase in the homestead market value exclusion, which will now allow up to $517,000 of market value excluded from market value for property tax purposes. This has not been increased since 2011. It's estimated that 1.3 million homesteads would benefit from a net $52.8 million decrease in homestead taxes statewide. We are increasing the targeted property tax refund so that if individuals' home values go up by more than 10% in a year, uh, they will be eligible up for up to a $2,000 credit on their taxes against their property tax increase. We're increasing the homes, excuse me, the agricultural homestead market value, uh, and we are increasing the senior citizen property tax deferral, uh, increasing both the income levels at which people are eligible for that, and also decreasing the total number of years you need to reside in your home to be eligible for that. We're increasing payment in lieu of taxes uh, funding to uh, local governments, uh, and uh, in addition, Local government aid and county program aid will be distributed according to a new formula which was developed through the League of Minnesota Cities and coalition partners. Uh, League, local government aid will go up by $40 million a year and the same will be true for county program aid. Uh, again, members, runs for your local county and your cities are on your desks. Uh, we are going to fund soil and, cons soil and water conservation dis districts. Uh, to the tune of $12.7 million a year of sustained funding, which they can now rely on instead of having to return to the legislature for an appeal every couple of years. Increasing electric utility transition aid for communities that are uh, off offloading uh, coal firing plants, such as Becker and Oak Park Heights, et cetera. And we're transitioning uh, communities uh, with 4D housing uh, for changes in their property taxes. Members, lastly, I want to speak to uh, the fact that we will be expanding homestead uh, classification uh, property taxes to uh, individual taxpayer identification numbers, increasing eligibility for the homestead exclusion. Uh, members, we worked with Senator Weber on tax increment financing proposals this year. Uh, several members submitted local projects for tax increment financing. These were uh, examined closely, and I'm very grateful to Senator Weber for his assistance in uh, checking those over. Uh, some amendments were offered, but all the projects that were offered are included in some form in the final bill. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Hostile. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I'm going to describe a couple of different portions of this tax bill. Um, it's been a great ride joining Chair Rest on the tax committee as a freshman, um, and I've learned a lot. But we've also done a lot of good work in helping support families across Minnesota in this bill. Article 1, Section 28 is my Great Start Child Care and Dependent Care credit. Um, as we know, families are facing financial pressures every day, and fewer and fewer young people are starting a family and businesses are facing workforce shortages unlike anything they've ever seen. 
When I've traveled around my district, the number one thing I hear is a lack of housing and a lack of childcare. Employers deciding to open businesses in our state across Minnesota need to know that their employees have affordable childcare for their families. This is a two-pronged challenge that can be addressed using the Great Start Child Care Tax Credit. By including this credit in the tax bill, we're addressing both the needs of our families who are trying to strike the right balance while supporting our businesses to keep our workforce strong. I'm proud we're providing nearly a billion dollars in funding for this credit. Families earning up to 200000 will qualify for credits ranging anywhere from $1,500 to $12,500. This will be life-changing for so many families and businesses across Minnesota. Section 26 is my film production tax credit. Um, two years ago, we passed into law Minnesota's first film and TV tax credit with a goal of creating a powerful economic development tool for our state, and it certainly has not disappointed. Minnesota, as we know, has one of the most geographically diverse landscapes, communities, and environments in the country, and I'm especially proud that I get to represent one of the many beautiful places in our state and my region with Lake Superior, the Boundary Waters Canoe Area, the Iron Range, and so much more. Um, tax credit programs like this have an impressive track record in other states and around the world. Now we in Minnesota have seen those benefits as well. Current law has the program at $5 million with a sunset in place. Uh, my bill would expand the program to nearly $10 million and would extend the sunset to 2032. We know that Minnesota is the perfect place to build this industry. We have the workforce infrastructure in the relevant trades. We have the talent, we have the geographic diversity, we have the seasons, we have the interested parties, and we have the Minnesota work ethic. I was especially proud to work with Senator Nelson in a bipartisan way on local sales tax requests this session. Um, it was a great experience, and I think we set up a process that could be a model for future tax bills in the future where we got together and heard from all of the different communities across the state interested in a local sales tax. Having recently served as a city councilor in Hermantown who has gone through this process on the other end of the table, I can tell you that our communities do need this option. Um, and as we know, these sales tax requests would have to get approval from their local communities. We have included all of the sales tax requests we have received, and those must still be approved, as I just said. Lastly, we also have included several sales tax exemptions, which you'll find on the form, let's see, page five of seven on the Excel sheet. Everything from schools to communities um, getting a sales tax exemption to help them afford their various projects and support our economy. Um, I hope you'll join me in supporting this tax bill. Thank you so much. Senator Dibble. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I just wanted to discuss for a few minutes, for a few moments, um, the uh, elements that you find on starting on page 62 with sections 41 and 42, um, which have to do with uh, treating those companies that do business in Minnesota and earn profits in Minnesota um, under what we call the unitary principle, or what we have also commonly been uh, talking about the last few days as um, worldwide reporting. Uh, Mr. President, uh, the, the proposal is, is fairly simple uh, and fairly straightforward, and it recognizes that um, those companies that are operating in Minnesota, conducting sales, uh, earning profits, um, and are uh, attributing those sales and those profits to uh, offshore companies that they've established are actually one company, uh, and for the purpose of, of corporate tax purposes, um, would would be, would be taxed as if though they're operating entirely within the United States as we do uh, presently. Uh, Mr. President, uh, this is a, a, a very good idea uh, because uh, to do otherwise is very unfair. Uh, very unfair to those small and medium-sized businesses that don't have an international presence, that don't have gigantic uh, departments full of accountants and lawyers to set up these shell companies to attribute uh, either intellectual property or patents or licenses uh, artificially and, and then attribute those sales and that activity uh, to those companies for the purpose of avoiding taxes. They are our Main Street businesses or mom and pop businesses um, that are forced to compete on an unfair playing field, as well as those just regular working families in Minnesota that are working hard to, to pay their taxes. Um, so, Mr. President, uh, I think this is a good provision. Um, uh, it uh, helps support all of the incredible progressive uh, tax relief that we have in the bill that Senator Rest is spearheading, uh, whether we're talking about child credit, child care 
uh, credits, um, uh, working families uh, relief, uh, the, the targeted property tax that uh, Senator Klein was talking about. Um, this is an important provision that's uh, very worthy of our support. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Divo. Senator Rest. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I want to just um, briefly refer members to um, Articles uh, 12 through 17. Article 12 deals with uh, defeasing the stadium bonds um, and has no other um, policy uh, connected with it, although certainly there's a great deal of interest um, among uh, various groups in uh, Minnesota with um, how how um, the uh, mechanism of, um, that has been used to uh, pay the stadium bonds, um, how it's going to continue to um, act. Uh, article 13 is a miscellaneous. We have a couple of miscellaneous articles. If you're looking for one of your provisions that might be um, uh, included there, um, it really truly is uh, miscellaneous. One of the provisions deals with with um, local election uh, local elections expense reimbursements for uh, local local governments. Um, it deals with the allocation of solid waste to score grants, um, and and so on. Um, it also includes um, Senator Dietrich's uh, tourism improvement districts, and. Um, uh, that is a great deal of that article. Um, the others, the last four, are come from the um, department, um, minor policy that, um, or technical changes to current statutes. Um, there have been some, a couple of revisions in there, but none that, uh, none that uh, invokes um, serious uh, changes to the statutes with regard to uh, tax policy. And uh, with that, uh, Mr. President, I offer the A37 amendment. Senator Rest offers the A37? That's correct. Amendment, and the Secretary will, will report the A37 amendment. I don't pre I, I'll go ahead and request a roll call on this one, I guess. I'm not sure it's necessary, but uh, uh, Senator we'll Rest, do it anyway. I request a roll call. Thank okay. you. Roll call requested, roll call granted, and now the Secretary is going to report the 837 amendment. Senator Rest moves to amend House File Number 1938 as amended pursuant to Rule 45 as follows. Page 2, line 45, after paragraph, insert C. This is the A37 amendment. Senator Rest, to your A37 amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Um, President. You can see by looking at it that a number of the corrections here are or effective dates or starting times or ending times. Uh, there's a lot of language starting at um, page 1, line 11 through 19, and it's simply a restatement of language. Um, um, and uh, Mr. President, am I assured that members have the amendment in front of them? Uh, members, uh, do you have the, the amendment in front of you online? And they have given the Okay. The high sign. Send a rest. Thank you. I just didn't want to get too far ahead of myself. Um, so uh, lines 11 through 19 uh, restates language uh, for the um, uh, PTA uh, non-resident allocation. And it was simply just moved from a, uh, another uh, section. Um, and so line 20 does the same thing. It, and then there are corrections. Um, there is um, page two, lines two through seven. Draw um, Senator Nelson's uh, attention to that. It is adding a new definition for the new markets credit, and and similarly, uh, page two, lines eight through uh, eleven. Uh, Senator uh, Weber's um, page. Two lines 12 and 13 correct cross references for the short line railroad infrastructure modernization credit. Um, and others are adding references. Uh, page two, line 16 through 19 uh, restates the income thresholds for advance payment of refundable uh, credits to match intent 
and also the spreadsheet, more importantly. Uh, page two, line 20, modifies the 4D1 classification report requirement relating to a number of properties counties must identify and survey, um, which is to say not more than 10. Uh, lines on um, page two, lines 21 through 23, clarifies refund language for various local government construction project exemptions, those are sales tax exemptions, to match other exemptions. Um, lines, uh, line 225 spends, specifies the end date for the purchase window for the city of Ramsey's construction project exemption. exemption. Page two, lines 25 and 26, clarifies the refund language for various local government construction projects exemptions, once again, to match other exemptions so that they, um, they come forward to the public on a level playing field. Uh, 227 correct, corrects a cross-reference, reference 228 to 33, clarifies language in the Brooklyn Center local sales tax to match other authorizations in the local sales tax article. Um, uh, page three, lines five to 11, um, adds a proposal uh, prohibiting Met Council bus bonds from, used, from being used on light rail. This is not a um, uh, uh, particular departure from um, policy regarding those bus bonds. It is routinely stated in any language that deals with that. And then um, uh, section 319 to four, th I mean, page three, page three, line four, 19 through page four, uh, uh, line 13 um, is, uh, and section four is nearly identical to language proposed in the DOR policy and technical bill. Um, I forgot lines uh, for Senator Kroon. The lines, page three, uh, lines 12 through 18, adds language to establish the am amateur sports account and the special revenue fund. Um, Mr. Um, President, that is, my, that is my amendment. And I it ask for a yes vote. And the roll call was requested and the roll call was granted. I'm gonna go to Senator uh, Kroon. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I was going to bring a uh, separate amendment on this, but I'd like to thank Senator Rest for including the, this language in her A37 amendment, um, which, as she said, creates a special revenue fund for the Minnesota Amateur Sports Commission. Um, the Minnesota Amateur Sports Commission, for those of you that don't know, is, I believe, I've been told, is the smallest state agency that we have with a budget of uh, not much more than $350,000, and the National Sports Center in Blaine is under the direct governance of the Minnesota Amateur Sports Commission. It was created by the st state of Minnesota in statute. Um, the National Sports Center programming promotes um, the commission's uh, statutory mission, Mr. President, to champion our statewide system of amateur sports by generating economic benefits through sporting events, providing increased amateur sport opportunities, and improving infrastructure through developing new sports facilities. Uh, the National Sports Center is Minnesota's premier amateur sports facility, having opened in 1990. Um, and uh, it offers all sorts of programming, soccer, hockey, golf, figure skating, lacrosse, ultimate frisbee, rugby, baseball, and broomball. Uh, the National Sports Center is largely self-sufficient. It does not come to the legislature every year asking for handouts. It's very creative in creating revenue streams, um, such as partnering with the Minnesota United, who plays their games in St. Paul, but their headquarters and their practice facilities are at the National Sports Center in Blaine. But there are deferred maintenance on many of their buildings, and it's fiscally responsible for us to protect those assets, Mr. President. Uh, it has a $90 million economic impact to Minnesota, but it's more than just economics, Mr. President. It provides opportunities for our kids. Um, the National Sports Center is moving towards adaptive sports opportunities as well to make amateur sports available to all Minnesotans. And uh, this provision is revenue neutral with implementation for future considerations. So I support this amendment. Encourage a yes vote on Senator Ress A37. Thank you, Mr. President. 
We are still on the 837 amendment. Senator Weber. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, would the uh, chair, would Chair Rest yield for a question? Senator Rest, will you yield? She will yield. Uh, of Senator course. Weber. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Rest. I just wanted clarification that uh, this amendment, uh, every facet of that, probably with the exception of the addition uh, that Senator Kroon just uh, talked about, uh, is indeed uh, technical in nature and, is, and does not involve any controversial items. Senator Rest, to the question. Um, Mr. President, Senator uh, Weber, certainly to my knowledge, that is correct. Thank Senator you, Mr. Weber. President and Senator Rest, and I would encourage a yes vote. Any other discussion on the 837? Senator Jaskowski. Thank you, Mr. President. Wondering if uh, Senator Rest would yield for a question. Uh, Senator Rest, will you yield? Yes. She will yield. Senator Jaskowski. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Rest. Senator Rest, can you tell us what the uh, provision of Section 4 of the amendment on 3.19 through the end of the amendment, what that does? Senator Rest. I'm sorry, um, uh, Mr. President, if uh, Senator Driskowski could give me the lines again, please. He said 3.19, which would be section four. Mr. President, just a moment, just trying to find a, my page with the explanation on it. Take your time, Senator Rest. Thank you. So, um, Senator, Rest. Senator Driskowski, um, you're looking at three section four, um, and this is a um, uh, a provision dealing with uh, taxes paid, as it says in the head, uh, taxes paid by uh, Indians, and what is being changed here, um, in particular is the uh, language on 325, 326, um, uh, and, um, and, and so on about um, how those, how those um, amounts are, are to be um, uh, accounted for. This was um, suggested to us by, um, as a uh, correction in one of the department's bills um, by uh, Senator uh, Kunesh, if she wants to add any additional information or you would like to uh, speak with her. Senator Jaskowski. Thank you, um, Mr. President. Thank you, um, Senator Rest. I, I, w I just want to understand the provision. So um, maybe it sounds like maybe I should ask uh, Senator Kunish to yield, Mr. President. Sen Senator Kunish will yield. She will yield. Senator Jaskowski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Kunish, could you describe for us what happens here? Are, are these tribal members going to be paying less or more in taxes under this proposal? And can you tell us more about it? Senator Kunish, to the question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. So um, in this um, section of the bill, um, so uh, first, this, the per capita refunds under the current tribal state tax agreements are based on Indian population, which is not the same as enrolled members. And the American Indian Population and Labor Force Report relied on data from certain population surveys. 
So since 2013, um, that was the date that the report was discontinued, tribes in Minnesota who have tax agreements with the state have certified their Indian population to the Minnesota Department of Revenue. And second, um, requiring the disclosure or access to confidential tribal membership documents infringes on tribal sovereignty and the right to govern. So uh, what this does is uh, it says that they don't have access to the enrollment information, the data uh, enrollment information. There are several federal agencies that rely on tribal self-certification of its Indian population as a factor for funding, and that includes the USDA, the Department of the Interior, the Indian Health Service, and most recently the U.S. Department of Treasury for release of American Rescue um, Act funds to tribes. So the determination of tribal membership is considered an internal tribal government matter under federal law. And then, so uh, the reason that I asked for these changes is I uh, asked to strike the language in subsection 1D, tribal enrollment records, and replace it with the latest population of Indians certified by an Indian tribe who live on or adjacent to the reservation. So it's, 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 uh, it's the determination of the language under tribal enrollment records or the um, tribe's uh, enrollment or the tribe's information. Mr. Senator Zeskowski. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Kanish. Any further questions on the A37 amendment? Seeing that the secretary would take the roll on the A37 amendment. Members, please vote. Senator Bowden, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. I report that Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Rasmussen, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Anderson votes aye. Senator Anderson votes aye. Senator Howe votes aye. Senator Howe votes aye. And thank you, Mr. President. Senator Lang votes aye. And Senator Lang votes aye. Members, please vote. All senators having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There have been 66 ayes and zero noes. The amendment is passed. Uh, Senator Ress. Thank you, um, Mr. President. I offer the A7 amendment. Senator Ress offers the A7 amendment. The secretary will report the A7 amendment. Senator Ress moves to amend House File Number 1938 as amended pursuant to Rule 45 as follows. Page 329 after line 31, insert. This is the A7 amendment. Senator Rest to your A7 amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, the A7 amendment creates a new article uh, in the bill, Article 18. It is language that's going to be familiar to uh, many, particularly those that serve on the Finance Committee. It is a, uh, a general um, oversight um, process and program for grants management, and it has been in it's been on every um, budget bill that has come through the um, uh, through the body so far. And in particular, it was seen to be appropriate 
um, because uh, when we added the uh, um, Article 12, the stadium bonds, the language is identical as it has been in other um, bills with perhaps a, uh, a minor improvement here or there. Senator Rest, a roll call or no? Okay. Any other uh, uh, discussions on the A7? Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Mr. President and uh, members. This is uh, pretty much has become over time our boilerplate, la boilerplate language coming through uh, the Finance Committee, and I would encourage members to vote yes. Any additional discussions on the A7? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. The, the motion prevails and the A7 is adopted. Mr. Senator, President, Mr. Uh, President, Senator Rest. Uh, thank you. I neglected to do uh, one final thing in the, um, the run through that, that uh, I and members of the tax committee gave, and that is to direct your attention to the, um, the spreadsheet, um, which is uh, date stamped 4 30 9 43 p.m. Um, Okay. Um, Senate file 1811, the first engrossment. And um, um, uh, Mr. President, with your permission, I'm going to go through this sitting down. Uh, Mr. President and members, um, the first lines on page one deal with federal conformity, and you will see there that particularly lines one and two uh, from federal conformity, there is a $90 million uh, revenue um, increase. The rest of those um, provisions go back and, f uh, go back and forth. Um, the first two would have been included in our January uh, bill on conformity. Um, but we decided um, unanimously and in a bipartisan way not to include any kind of revenue raisers there, but to expect them to come up in the, um, in the um, omnibus bill. Uh, starting um, on line 12 um, is what most of us call the rebate provision that has been described to you earlier. Uh, and then the two uh, provisions for pensions uh, Social Security subtraction and the, and the public pension subtraction, and then from the governor's bill uh, on line 15, the child tax credit, Senator um, House Child, Senate File 9, the child and dependent care credit modification, um, Senator uh, Kunesh's bill, eight, uh, 860, uh, increasing. Um, the uh, considerably, actually, the um, K-12 education credit modification, and um, as uh, chair of the Pub education public education finance um, committee, we were uh, very happy to put that in our bill. Uh, uh, line 18 is Senator Putnam's working family credit expansion uh, for I-10 filers. Um, uh, uh, section uh, our line 19 is the angel tax credit. Line 20 is the house child film production credit modification. Um, line 21 is Senator Putnam's uh, uh, beginning farmer tax credit. Line 22 is an improvement in the political contribution reprint um, uh, increase. Um, Line 23 is the Housley Bill on Manufactured Home Park uh, Credits. Uh, line 24 is the Short Line Railroad Construction Credit that was also referenced in the Technical um, minute, uh, Amendment. Uh, line 25, Senator Nelson's New Markets Tax Credit. Um, 26 and 27, and these, these are I'm going into these individually because they are where where really most of the money is in terms of investments in Minnesota are on um, uh, the individual income tax. Um, so we have a couple of um, definitions here, definition of resident trust modification, which we've been trying to get for the last several years. Um, and uh, um, some of the provisions are very small ones, but they can be very meaningful for our individual uh, taxpayers, and I uh, point out 
line 28, Senator Draskowski's um, provision to grant uh, in 2021 unemployment benefit subtraction for 14 to 17 year olds that he heard from uh, constituents in his uh, district. Uh, line 29 is the military credit due date change. Um, line 30 um, has no fiscal impact, but it's the governor's language on the st stillborn credit. Um, and then there are other um, provisions there. The manger and um, revenue raiser in the bill, as Senator Dibble explained, uh, is the worldwide combined uh, reporting, which over the four years is 1.169500. Uh, also, we have Senator Dietzik's historic rehab tax credit on line 44. In uh, four years, it's a $26 million um, tax reduction. Uh, the next section, starting with 54, line 54, are all the sales tax exemptions that we give in this bill. Uh, most of them are for construction projects, but there are a few others as well. Um, Starting on the next page at line 91 um, are the bills dealing with um, property tax refunds, particularly the provisions um, offered by the three provisions offered by Senator Weber and then the two that are offered by Senator Klein um, dealing with uh, either homesteads um, or um, uh, property tax uh, refunds, extraordinary ones, the special ones. Uh, beginning on line 115 are the local government aids and where you will see the LGA and the CPA added and then on line uh, 126 the, um, the um, one-time public safety aid out of which is carved a special provision for uh, grants through the uh, Department of Public Safety to local governments for dealing with um, folks in, uh, who are having um, in crisis situations, mental crisis situations, and also for criminal investigations. Um, uh, there are, um, there is provision for um, one-time tribal na nation housing and homelessness aid of $44 million. That's that is um, distributed for four million for uh, each of the eleven uh, tribes. Um, in on line um, uh, 134 um, is simply an interaction that is provided with about the school building bonds and agricultural credits. Uh, starting on line 141. Um, are uh, miscellaneous general fund items. Um, uh, interestingly enough, I think for many, line 143, um, we were able to uh, reduce uh, revenue by $6 million by taking away um, the fee that um, um, has, to be, has to be paid in the past on um, uh, when there is um, uh, agreements in disputes, that, re that fee has been um, removed. Um, and um, uh, let's see, then um, there are um, a few additional um, uh, expenditures. There is an account for local election expense reimbursement, which I mentioned in the uh, summary. And then um, on page five are the non-general fund revenue changes. Um, and um, other than that, um, uh, embedded in, in, in this bill are uh, all the changes um, through the good work of Senator Housechild and uh, Representative Lesligard um, uh, to um, the, the minerals article. On uh, the last page are simply listed the local sales taxes, the authors and the cities that they deal with, and then the local special taxes, and then the tax increment finance um, um, provision. I'm very pleased to say that the um, uh, the, the 2023 um, 
Senate tax bill has contributions by over 45 members of this body. And um, uh, we heard many, many bills um, on a nonpartisan, bipartisan um, basis. And I assure you that um, regardless of how you vote on this bill, finally, your provision will remain in the bill. Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. President, thank you for your indulgence for allowing me to seat, to sit, um, and we can proceed. Uh, before we go to Senator Kupek, I just want to be clear so that members know why I uh, um, uh, can uh, allow someone to uh, be permitted to speak while seated. If you look at Mason Section 93, it indicates while speaking, members should remain standing at their seats or at a place designated for speaking, and when finished, should sit down. Under certain circumstances, including sickness, injury, or disability, and upon leave from the presiding officer, a member may be permitted to speak while seated. Other than uh, if, if you've not been given permission, then you must stand. With that being stated, I'd just like to make, make sure that everyone understands why certain things happen so they're not uh, caught off guard. Senator Kupek. Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to offer the A24 amendment. Senator Kupek offers the A24 amendment. The secretary will report the A24 amendment. Senator Kupek moves to amend House File Number 1938 as amended pursuant to Rule 45 as follows. Page 34 after line 7, insert. This is the A24 amendment. Senator Kupek to your A24 amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. The A24 amendment uh, would impose a 2.1% tax on net investment income of individuals, estates, and trusts exceeding $250,000. Uh, this is considered passive income, income simply earned uh, by investments uh, that are performing well. And why, ask you, uh, would I do this tax? Well, Mr. President, I would like to uh, introduce the A25 amendment. Senator Kupik offers the A25 amendment to the amendment. The secretary, when appropriate, will report the A25 amendment to the amendment. Senator Kupik moves to amend the A24 amendment to House File Number 1938 as follows. Page one after line three, insert. This is the A25 amendment to the amendment. Senator Kupik, to your amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. First of all, I would like to ask for a roll call on both of the amendments. Roll call. Request a roll call granted on the A25 amendment, which is the amendment to the amendment, and or as well as the A24 amendment, which is the underlining amendment. Senator Kupek, to your A25 amendment to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. President and members. The A25 amendment uh, would eliminate the tax on Social Security benefits for the remaining 24% of Minnesotans uh, that would still be paying it currently under the bill. Uh, the way the bill is structured right now, at the $100,000 level, uh, I think this will help a lot of people, uh, especially even in my district, where the average household income is just $65,000. Uh, that said, I know personal experiences with, I have friends who have recently retired, and they've had good jobs, and they have decent retirement, but they too are actually on a fixed income, and when you reach that fixed income, even if it is at a slightly higher level, you start worrying about how everything is going to stretch out for the rest of your retirement. So I think moving towards a repeal of that uh, would be a good idea. Uh, when I got here, the very first bill that I introduced and signed on to was for the repealing of the Social Security tax. Since I have been here, I have also heard a lot about needs that we have, needs of nursing homes, needs of schools, needs of our transportation system. Uh, these are all things that are also, quite frankly, very important uh, to seniors. Uh, that's why I think it's important to make sure the investment we are making in our seniors, eliminating the Social Security tax is paid for. So this is a major ongoing investment uh, at $2.688 billion uh, just through 2027. I also would like to think that since I have been here, uh, especially in a lot of my committee work, that I've been in one who has reached out, tried to build bridges, tried to work constructively. Uh, so this I see as 
I'm offering a bridge for a way uh, that we can get this done. So this amendment would provide the tax relief that retirees have been asking for, but in a responsible way that preserves many of the reasons why seniors choose to live in Minnesota. A any other discussion on the A25? Senator Weber. Thank you, Mr. President. Would uh, Senator Kupek yield? Senator Kupek, will you yield? He will yield. Senator Weber. Uh, in order to provide uh, this particular uh, uh, benefit to the people of Minnesota, how much money is needed to be raised by your proposed tax increase? Uh, Senator Kupek, to the question. The, the initial uh, amount, I believe, is about $1.6 billion, but again, again it's about $2.68 billion over the next biennium. Senator Weber. So, uh, could you repeat for the next biennium? I didn't catch that. Uh, Senator Kupek. I believe it is 2.68. Okay. Thank Senator you Weber. very much. Any other questions on the, uh, or discussion on the A25 amendment to the amendment? Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President, and if the author would yield for probably several questions. Senator Kupek, will you yield? He will yield. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President, and I do have a series of questions, but my first question pertains to the underlying amendment, and the reason I'm asking that is that the two are, are essentially insepar inseparably linked, and so my question is the net investment income tax, if you could just explain what I see here in the, in the amendment, it says the net investment income has the meaning given in section 1411C of the Internal Revenue Code. I've not had the opportunity to look that up, but if the author could just explain what that means and does a gain actually have to have been realized before it's taxed or is this something before a tax is realized? I'm sorry, before a gain is actually realized. Uh, Senator Kupek, to the question. Sure. Well, it has to do with the fact that if you have uh, made income of a passive nature, that that would be taxed. So, yes, I would think you would have to make uh, some kind of income on that to be taxed, Senator Lucero. Senator Lucero. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. If he would yield again. Senator uh, um, Kupek, will you yield? He yes. will yield. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President. And is, is there not already a tax, just to make sure I understand what's, what income is being targeted here, is this capital gains income that on a federal level is currently taxed, whether it be active or, or, or passive, uh, if it were passive, that it would be taxed at, a, at the capital gains rate? Right. Is, that, is this the income that we are now calling net investment income tax on the state level that you're attempting to create this new tax? Senator Kupek, to the question. Thank you, Mr. President. First, I would like to clarify, we are, not under, we are not on the underlying amendment at the moment. We are not. We are not. So, well, the so we are on the, the A25, which is the amendment to the amendment. Right. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I understand we're not. And my qu the question I'm asking is a definition or clarity in the underlying amendment that would pay for the amendment to the amendment. So that's, I'm, I'm seeking clarity on how this is going to be paid for, hence the reasoning for my questions in the underlying amendment, if the author would yield again. Will you yield? He will yield. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President. Now I'll ask the question again. So I'm trying to understand how the, the amendment to the amendment is going to be paid for, and it's my understanding that it would be a new tax that is called net investment income tax, and I'm trying to get clarity as to what is the target income that, that is going to be taxed under this proposal. If the author could clarify, is what is going to be taxed under this proposal what we call on the federal level capital gains? Senator Lucer, uh, excuse me, Senator Kupek to the question. Thank you, Mr. President. I know with my maroon jacket it can be confusing. Uh, Yes. Uh, my understanding is that it is not capital gains. It is on, net, it is on investment income, whether that be from s sale of taxes, bonds, such like that. So not, not like a, the sale of a house. Senator Lucero. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Okay, so I'm, I don't sit on the tax committee, and that's where I appreciate the indulgence here. I'm just trying to understand. Uh, I don't have bonds. I've never sold bonds, so I don't have any direct experience in this. So that's what I'm trying to understand if a, if a new category is going to be taxed, that is, of which there is certain income that is presently not taxed. Uh, that's what I'm trying to understand, but I, I guess I, I won't be able to get that answered. So, Mr. President, I'll move on to the next thing. 
So as I was listening to the, the remarks, the opening remarks in this bill, I was, uh, it, it became very clear that there isn't a provision on the, the, to the full elimination on the tax on Social Security, and so I began to do some research. In my research here, I, I, and then hence to the amendment to the amendment that's before us, I, I came across a, a letter that was sent out last December. And there are several media outlets that reported this. I'm just grabbing one here. It's uh, KVRR in December 7th. They reported that four incoming Democrat state senators are calling for the full elimination of the tax on Social Security. And it speaks about uh, several issues here. Four of us on the letter, we ran on a platform of eliminating Social Security. We wanted to make sure that we're, we're getting our voice out there, and hence, obviously, the, the letter that was sent. Senators Rob Kupek from Moorhead, Grant Hoschild from Hermantown, Heather Gustafson from Vadnais Heights, and Judy Seberger from Afton say voters told them eliminating the tax is their top concern. I don't see in here that there's any reference that in order to eliminate the tax on Social Security that there would be a tax hike. That's the amendment to the amendment that we're seeking to, to vote on before us. We came into this session with a many, many billion dollar budget surplus. As I'm reading this article, it is very clear that eliminating the tax on Social Security would be paid for by the current overtaxation and tax surplus that Minnesota is sitting on. I further see here in the article it's one of the issues, actually, when I was out door knocking in the summer, it did not matter whether you were a conservative or a liberal. There was bipartisan support for eliminating the tax on Social Security. And I, I obviously, I'm not going to read the whole article, but it concludes by saying, Kupek says eliminating the tax will keep the state competitive as a place for retirement. Well, I think the amendment to the amendment is incredibly counterintuitive. In order to keep Minnesota competitive, and the argument goes from Senator Kupek, Mr. President, is that there has to be an elimination of, of Social Security tax, but not by raising another tax. That doesn't make Minnesota any more competitive. And I'm very concerned that this amendment to the amendment is not going to accomplish the promises to Minnesotans of cutting taxes and paid for by the surplus. In fact, I'm not concerned about it. I know that's not what's happening here. That's not what this amendment to the amendment does. And so for that reason, Mr. President, we cannot vote to raise taxes when there's already a 19 or 17 and a half billion, depending on how you look at it, surplus that we already have and could be used to pay for. Let's not raise taxes, Mr. President. Members, I want to remind us that we're on the A25, which is the amendment to the amendment. Any other discussions? A roll call was requested and a roll call granted. Senator Jaskowski to the A25 amendment to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Would uh, Senator Kupek yield for a question? Senator Kupek, will you yield? He said he will yield. Senator Jaskowski. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, members, uh, if you don't have the amendment to the amendment before you, members, um, the amendment to the amendment is an effort, uh, actually, uh, the underlying amendment is an effort to increase taxes on Minnesotans for investment income. Uh, so any individuals, estates, and trusts in, in excess of $250,000 will be taxed at a rate of 2.1%. A brand new tax on the productive people of our state, Mr. President. So, Senator Kupek, you said that it would raise what uh, is understood to be in your amendment to the amendment, uh, and, and maybe I should save this for uh, after we vote on the amendment to the amendment, but the question, I'm gonna ask it sooner or later, and the question is, how do you know uh, do you have proof of what this brand new tax and the underlying amendment is going to take from the people in your district and mine? Senator Kupek. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Driskowski. I do not know exactly the numbers that that would impact uh, in my district or your district. Um, I know that when I worked with the fiscal staff, this was the amount that they came up with uh, that they said they needed to cover uh, that, which I kind of view it as a transfer from some of the lower amounts that are being taxed on Social Security to some of the higher amounts. Senator Jaskowski to the A25 amendment to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, members, um, this, is, uh, this is not a tax cut. This is a tax increase. Um, the Democrats campaigned, as Senator Lucero pointed out earlier, um, at least a few of them did, four of them did, um, decidedly in a, uh, in a press conference that they held, uh, saying that they want to get rid of the income tax on Social Security benefits. Well, Mr. President, Senator Kupek, um, another question for you might be, how many of your constituents does this brand new tax affect? Uh, because it's residents of Minnesota with investments of $250,000 uh, or more. And as I think about that, Senator Kupek, members, Mr. President, I suspect that a lot of the people, Mr. President, that uh, are asking the Minnesota legislature to get rid of their income tax and Social Security benefits, that those same people are going to be taxed under this brand new tax. We're going to continue to chase them out of the state. We are taking money from one pocket of the taxpayer and putting it into the, po in, into the other pocket and suggesting to them that we gave them a tax cut. The Minnesota taxpayer is going to be looking at this legislature, if this passes, Mr. President, and asking us, are you kidding me? This is not being honest, is what they're going to say to the Minnesota Senate and the Minnesota House in the, in the legislature of the state of Minnesota, the people who they sent here to get rid of the oppressive taxation that is chasing them out of our state. This is not a tax cut, Mr. President. This is merely playing games with the people of Minnesota if we enact this legislation. This is not what they are looking for. Uh, members, uh, you know, I encourage a, a vote, uh, a yes vote on the amendment to the amendment, Mr. President, uh, uh, which will improve the underlying amendment, but uh, I'm uh, not suggesting the same vote on the, uh, the amendment uh, if it is amended. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, just as a gentle reminder, under our rules and Rule 36.2, the members shall speak only to the question under debate. So we're on the A25. When we get to the underlying amendment, you can certainly have at it. But I just want to remind us that the rules call for us to speak to the issue that is before the body. Senator Putnam. Thank you, Mr. President and members. I rise to speak in favor of uh, the Kupec Amendment. Um, I'm one of those individuals who had lots of conversations about the Social Security tax. I authored Senate File 15, and, and with my four friends and a couple other folks, we've been fighting pretty hard for this. And I think it's important in terms of context to realize that there was an effort to end the tax on Social Security two years ago where the DFL minority also made this proposal, and unfortunately, it was voted down. Some of us have been working for this change for quite some time because we understand that it's not just about resources, it's about respect. And this is our opportunity to show our respect for seniors, folks with disabilities, folks who get Social Security. This is our chance to show our respect for people who have worked their whole lives. And to support the Kupec Amendment is to support making this change responsibly, without pitting populations against populations, but instead just taking care of all seniors at the same time. This is our chance to do that responsibly. And so I urge our support of uh, Senator Kupec's work here. Senator Nelson. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Well, I rise in support of this amendment to finally eliminate totally the taxation on Social Security income for all Minnesotans. 100% of Minnesotans should be 100% exempt from the income tax on Social Security. That's what we heard would happen. But I'm shocked 
shocked members that while I will be supporting this amendment, it's un unbelievable that it will be amended onto a bill that increases taxes at a time when we came into this body, members, a $19 billion surplus. And $1.5 billion has already been taken away for um, automatic inflation. Uh, the budget proposals before us in this body now are increasing our state budget from $52 billion to $72 billion, which is an unheard of increase in state government spending. But while well, I'm going to vote for this amendment because it's the right thing to do, it is shocking that it is being paired with the tax hike. And I will n rhetorically ask anyone who campaigned on saying they were going to remove the double taxation, or remove the taxation on Social Security benefits. Did they pair that with saying, and I will do so by increasing taxes just as much? I would be shocked if anyone in this chamber who campaigned saying we are going to reduce the taxes on Social Security income said, was forthright with their voters and said, and we will increase your taxes accordingly. I find it shocking, disappointing. I do encourage a yes vote on this amendment to remove that taxation, but let's be clear with the public. It is not a straight up vote to remove the taxation on Social Security benefits. It's being paired with a massive tax hike. Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess I'll repeat a couple of those comments that Senator Nelson made. Uh, again, we're going to support eliminating tax on Social Security. Everybody, you know, I know Senator Kupek ran on that. We saw that. Uh, but again, I, I deal with investment properties uh, in real estate. And again, folks, uh, we are taxing people out of Minnesota. They are taking their wealth and leaving Minnesota. And these are the people that create jobs, Mr. own President, investment property, point pay of order. property taxes. Uh, it uh, goes uh, on point and of on, order. Mr. President. Uh, Jasinski, for uh, what purpose do you rise? Mr. President, um, I believe that you just indicated that um, pursuant to rules 36.2, we should speak only to the the topic under debate, and people can certainly comment on the underlying amendment when we're done with this, but this is out of order. Members, I will not vote on it being out of order or not, but under Rule 36.2, we are supposed to speak to the matter that's in front of us. The underlying amendment, whether this comes on or not, we can certainly speak to that. So, Senator Jasinski, and I'm reminding even you, Senator Matthews, the issue here that's before us is the A25. Now, I've given us a lot of latitude. I don't mind doing that because I know that we want everyone to be able to speak, but you'll certainly be able to speak to this issue if there's some uh, notion when we come to the underlying amendment, if we ever get there. <laughs> so, Senator Jasinski. Uh, Mr. President, again, I, I did rise in support of the amendment to the amendment because we do want to eliminate the tax on Social Security. But when you're robbing Peter to pay Paul uh, as part of a gimmick or a shift, uh, this is not what we should be doing. Uh, this is not what he ran on. Uh, we should be uh, working on Minnesota with a $19 billion surplus or a $17.5 billion, however you want to shift that inflation gimmick as well. Uh, folks, we had a $19 billion surplus, and we can't just take it alone and eliminate that tax. Mr. President, I support the amendment to the amendment, but the underlying amendment is a huge problem for here in Minnesota. Let's just watch people leave Minnesota by the bus load. Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. President. Would Senator Kupek yield for a question? Senator Kupek, will you yield? He will yield for a question. Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, so the question is, if you are taking a $100 bill out of the left pocket with a tax increase and putting a $100 bill with the uh, Social Security tax cut in the right pocket, did you actually cut taxes? Not the same. Senator Kubek, to the question. 
Thank you, Mr. President. I'm still not quite sure that this is on the uh, A25 amendment, but I'll be happy to answer that. So, I mean, this is going for people uh, starting at $100,000 and moving up. So I would think, yes, for people from who are making $100,000 up to $250,000, that this would be a tax cut for them. Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. President. Yes, this is absolutely on the uh, underlying amendment to the amendment. And we have seen uh, this horrific gimmick that is put up here, as was pointed out, the very same people that's getting hammered on one side is getting taken from the other. And the answer is no. When you take $100 out of one pocket and put $100 in the other pocket, you didn't actually help Minnesotans. And this is the type of bait and switch that just angers the people of Minnesotans and the political games that are played because we didn't go around to people in our districts telling them that we were going to do this kind of gimmick and shift. We all came out saying we're sitting on a $19 billion surplus like Scrooge McDuck. The state of Minnesota is sitting on a giant pile of money, or we did until uh, we started spending out the wazoo here this session. But now, instead of taking that money that Minnesota had and just give it back to the taxpayers, the majority comes here and says, we have this giant pile of money. Point of order, Mr. Order. President. For what purpose do you rise? Under Rule 36.2, we're speak to, supposed to be speaking to the question at hand, and the question at hand is, is uh, Amendment uh, A25, which speaks only to whether or not we should fully eliminate the Social Security tax. There will be, I'm sure, ample opportunity to speak to the original amendment, but could, maybe we could get through this one first, Mr. President. Mr. Mr. President. President, advice? I don't need any advice. Okay, I don't need any advice. Members, will you be so kind as to stick to what's before the body? I will give you as much latitude as you need once we get to the underlying amendment. I don't mind. I think I've always, uh, 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 I've been fair and thoughtful, okay? So if we can to stick to the amendment, that's a gentle reminder to all of us. I'm not saying any particular person and it would just be helpful if we can keep our debate going, all right? So I'm not gonna rule on that, but I'm asking you as wonderful colleagues to make sure that we are sticking to what is before the body pursuant to Rule 36.2. And when you wanna get to the underlining amendment, which I think I heard someone say, oh, we can certainly have a, a all, day, all day debate about it, because I don't mind at all, because you have a right to speak. So with that being said, so you can have a seat under Rule 93, unless you have something you want to raise else, I'm going to turn the floor back over to Senator Matthews. Senator Matthews, we're on the A25. Thank you, Mr. President. I agree. Everything so far has been speaking to the A25 amendment. No, because the people of Minnesota wanted their Social Security fully exemption from the $19 billion surplus that the state of Minnesota was sitting on. And instead, this is being paired with something that is less than that. So we've had uh, that debate here and that discussion, and Mr. President, I want to make it very clear. No, when you take $100 out of one pocket and stick $100 in the other pocket, the net impact is zero. And the very people that are being claimed to benefit under the Social Security piece here then get harmed by what's underneath it, which we'll leave for uh, getting to the underlying amendment. So thank you, Mr. President. Senator Hostile. Um, I don't need to speak anymore, so, uh, Mr. President. Thank you. Senator Lucero. On the Thank 825 you, amendment to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. I was just going to speak to the massive pile of money that the state of Minnesota is sitting on and how this amendment to the amendment 
seeks to not ignore that pile of money. And so it can be and is very much in order to speak for or against this amendment to the amendment in relation to the current budget surplus. That is absolutely in order. And so the words coming out of Senator Matthews' mouth were on that topic of Minnesotans expect and deserve a tax cut. This is one such tax cut that they deserve. Now that is framed within the context of a massive budget surplus that is presently existing. That is in order and it is out of order for any member of the majority party to interrupt another member while that's being discussed. Members, so, Mr. President, members, I highly uh, uh, encourage Lucero, that we pay for... Sen uh, Senator Lucero, I just want to make sure there's order on, on the floor. I'm the one who's the presiding officer. I make the decision based on you entrusting me with being fair as to whether something is in order or not in order. We, we were certainly, I didn't rule on it because I want to always make sure we give deference to everyone that's on the floor. But I do think it's inappropriate for us to say what's in order and it's not without a decision being made, okay? So you can certainly make your connections and nexus. I don't mind that at all. I just want to make sure that the, the matter that is before the body is what we are debating because we do have wonderful um, citizens all across our great state. I'd like for them to be clear as to what we're talking about so that they can follow along. So, Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President. And we have a budget surplus that needs to go back to Minnesotans. If in the course of that discussion, there's an opinion of something that's in order and out of order, it ultimately will be up to the body if a motion is made. This body needs to decide that that budget surplus that was over-collected needs to go back to Minnesotans without shifts and gimmicks. This is a breaking of campaign promises by the majority party. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, we are on the A25 amendment to the minute, uh, amendment. Any other discussions? And remember, when we get to the underlying amendment, you can have at it as well. Any other discussions? Seeing none, the secretary will, will take the roll because a roll call was requested and a roll call was granted. Senator Bowden, all those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. I report that Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Rasmussen, those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Abler votes aye. Senator Abler votes aye. Senator Anderson votes aye. Senator Abler votes aye. A Senator Anderson. Anderson. Anderson votes aye. Senator Howe votes aye. Senator Howe votes aye. And Senator Lang votes aye. And Senator Lang votes aye. And thank you, Mr. President. Senator Liskey votes aye. And Senator Liskey votes aye. Oz, uh, anyone else that wants to vote? All senators having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 52 ayes and 13 noes, the amendment to the amendment is adopted. We are now on the underlining amendment. Senator Reber. Thank you, Mr. President. We have a 17.5 billion, formerly 19 billion, before the accounting change. And we heard the people of Minnesota they said give it back. They did not say raise taxes and then give it back. And I think to go, we all understand what this vote is for. It's to allow those who promised that they would get rid of Social Security, 
uh, and it gives them a chance to vote for that. And at the same time, we, uh, they understand that, you know, this probably will not happen. We saw it in committee. We, we've seen it on the floor before this year. And the reality of it is we gave you many opportunities, Mr. President, to vote for this particular offering. But I repeat, if we cannot find the money to reduce the state tax on 100 percent of Social Security benefits, when we have a 17 and a half, formerly 19 billion before the accounting change surplus, then there is something seriously wrong uh, with this state. Thank you. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President. I am wondering if Senator Gustafson would yield for a question. Senator Gustafson, will you yield? She will yield. Senator, Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Gustafson. Continuing my research here, I see an article from NPR, Mr. President, from December. And in this article, Senator Gustafson is quoted, I stand by my promise to fight for the full elimination of the tax on Social Security benefits, said Senator-elect Heather Gustafson, DFL Vadna Sites. With the release of the budget forecast President, today, it order. is clearer uh, than ever. Senator Lucero, there's someone st that stood. For what purpose do you rise? Thank Senator you, Mr. President. Mayquite? Under Mason Section 112, um, members aren't supposed to read things that are not before the body. Hold on, give, give me one moment to get to 112. 112 part two. 112 point, point two. Members do not have the right to have acts, journals, accounts, or papers on the table uh, read independently of the will of the body. The delay and interruption that, that this might cause demonstrates the impossibility of existence of such a right. Hold on one second. Members, just so that we are, um, just be thoughtful about the time of the body and what's going on, and so uh, you can go forward, but, but there is something to be stated under Masons related to that, but I'm not going to rule on it, but just uh, gently remind us. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President, and I do understand the rule in Masons in the context of potentially reading a long article or other publication or book for whatever purpose. But custom and usage is a higher order than this, and it is absolutely the custom and usage for members to be able to read several lines of news articles, other events, to frame arguments in a context. And that's what I'm doing, so I appreciate uh, that, Mr. President. But I, I truly, and I'm not intending to waste time, I truly lost my train of thought. So unfortunately, I just, I have to start over here. Uh, so I was reading an article, or a, uh, just a snippet from an NPR article from December 7th of last year, and the quote here, I stand by my promise to fight for the full elimination of the tax on Social Security benefits, uh, said Senator, then Senator-elect Heather Gustafson, quote, with the release of the budget forecast today, it is clear now, it is clear, it is clearer than ever that now is the time to relieve Minnesota seniors from the double tax on Social Security benefits, unquote. So when I'm seeing this quote with the release of the then budget forecast, which showed the budget surplus, Mr. President, my question from to Senator Gustafson is, do I understand correctly that he, there was that your remarks here, did NPR quote this correctly, that your interest in cutting Social Security was based, the Social Security tax, was based on the then budget surplus? Senator Gustafson, to the question. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I, I just want to make sure I understand the question because it was quite a monologue. Are you asking if I understand the article that you read? What is your question? Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Lucero to the, uh, Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President. According to the article, it gives a quote and it put your quote is framed on the day of the budget forecast release that showed a multi-billion dollar budget surplus. And it goes on to then frame your remarks that because of that, we need to cut Social Security. I want to confirm that NPR is accurately framing that your interest in cutting Social Security was based on the surplus from the forecast. Uh, Senator Gustafson. Mr. President, point of order. Yes, for what, for, uh, for what reason do you rise? Thank you, Mr. President. I rise to a point of order under section 124 of Masons. Um, we can't impugn the motives of members. The policy is proposals before the body, but the motives of members is not. Members, I'll just uh, just ask you again to, to kindly uh, read the rules and, and, and just make sure that you're operating within those rules. So I'm not going to rule on it. I'm going to let Senator Gustafson uh, answer the question if she uh, decides to continue to yield, and we will go from there. Senator Gustafson. Thank you, Mr. President. So if you're asking, uh, and to the uh, good senator from St. Michael, if you're asking um, if I was quoted in NPR saying that, I would say yes, that is right. Um, but a little bit more context, since we only got a brief quote on what that article was about, was about saying if I was going to stand up and fight for the thing that I said I was going to. And the answer is yes. In fact, I'm doing that right now. I am standing up here saying and doing what I said I was going to do. Um, it might not be in the way that other members would choose to do it, but that's okay. One of the things that I think is important to remember is that when I am going to fight for a benefit to help people in my district or across the state from Minnesota, I'm going to do it in a way that is responsible, particularly fiscally responsible, so that we have the money to do what we say we're going to do. Therefore, I am going to be responsible in that decision. One of the reasons why that is important is because I serve on the, uh, as vice chair of ed finance, and every day I get emails from school districts like St. Michael Albertville who are asking for money, who need desperately to fund their schools, and that's what I'm here to do. So I want to make sure that when I fight for seniors, I'm also fighting for students, and I'm also fighting for all the people in our state who need things. And um, I, I, you know, I, I will just add that I think it is important that we go forward in a way that is responsible. I understand there's a surplus. Not much happened last year, so we're having to make up for the work that didn't get done by Senate Republicans last year. So thank you. I hope that answers your question. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President. That absolutely answers my question, and I am sincerely appreciative of that. And more, I learned more in addition to my answer. I also learned, Mr. President, that the definition of the Democrat uh, word, or I should say the, the, def the Democrat definition of the word responsible is not to actually cut taxes from the surplus, but to cut taxes by raising taxes in another area. That's what Democrats view as responsible. That is not the definition that Minnesotans have of responsible. Minnesotans' definition of responsible is cut taxes to eliminate the surplus. Give the surplus back to Minnesotans who overpaid it. Individuals, families, and businesses across this state are getting crushed with taxes. And the amendment as amended before us is irresponsible because it raises taxes in order to cut taxes. And that is not actually eliminating the budget surplus. And so, Mr. President, shifts and gimmicks are what Democrats are known for. And this is an example. I 
very much appreciated Senator Matthews' analogy of taking a dollar out of one pocket and putting it into the other. But here's another incredibly appropriate analogy. It is now May. While it doesn't necessarily feel like that with the temperature, it is now May, and there are many Minnesotans across this state that have swimming pools in their backyard, or they're going to go to one of the many great Minnesota lakes. And if one were to take a bucket to the swimming pool at one end, fill up that bucket with the water, walk around to the other end of the swimming pool and dump it in the pool, nothing has changed. And that's what this bill, or amendment as amendment, is doing. If a Minnesotan were to go to one of our many great lakes with a bucket of water, or bucket, fill it up in one portion of the lake, walk around and then dump that bucket of water in another portion of the lake, nothing has changed. And that's what this amendment as amendment does. Crafted by Democrats, shifts and gimmicks, not actually cutting taxes, but instead massively raising taxes. That's the reality, Mr. President. Thank you. Senator McQuaid. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And, you know, it's interesting. We've heard a really good analogy. If you go from one end of a swimming pool, fill up a bucket of water, and bring it to the other end of the swimming pool and dump it back in, and that's a shift in gimmick. But it's not a shift or gimmick if you go to someone's huge pool at their home and fill up a cup of water and bring it over to your waiting pool for your ducks and pour it in. That's not a shift or gimmick. One of the things that we keep hearing about is the budget surplus, most of which is one-time money. So we can set aside 65% of the budget surplus. But one of the things that we know is part of the reason that our budget surplus is where it is, is because people who make half a million dollars or more in this state had their income grow by 117% in the last five years. That was not the case for the rest of us. People who make a lot of money already made a lot of money during the pandemic. And so when we are talking about eliminating the full Social Security tax for people for $100,000 and up, for people who make a quarter of a million dollars on taxable investment income, which as a millennial who went through a recession and the housing crisis, graduated right on into that, and took forever to make $38,000 a year, and when I was elected here was the first time I made about $40,000 a year, I genuinely don't even understand what taxable investment income is. Like, I get it intellectually, but I cannot imagine what that means, what that, what that kind of money is. And so when we put a, an iota of a percentage of a tax on investment income, that's like gold and stock sales, so that we can ensure that seniors who are living on the cusp of $100,000 retired professors in Senator Kupek's district to make sure that they don't pay taxes on Social Security and that we don't have to defund our schools. We can't pay our PCAs. We can't have in-home in nursing assistance, that we can pave our roads, keep our bridges strong, that we can have clean land and air and water, that we can continue to have the things that make Minnesota a great place to live. That's not a shift or gimmick. It's responsible budgeting. And so I thank Senator Kupek for bringing this forward to keeping the commitment to his community that he made and making sure that we can continue to keep our commitments to Minnesotans. So we can continue to sit here and pretend like we're talking about, you know, my next door neighbor who drives a bus, or we can actually talk about who we're talking about, which are the wealthy people who made a lot of money during this pandemic. And I'm very, very grateful that we are doing this in a responsible way. So I thank Senator Kupek for his uh, amendment and amendment to the amendment, and I urge people to vote green. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, would Senator Kupek yield for a question? Senator Kupek, will you yield? He will yield for a question. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Kupek. Senator Kupek, with the amendment as amended, is this a net tax increase. Senator Kupek, to the question. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Rasmussen. Uh, from my understanding, from what the fiscal people have told me, that this is not a net tax increase, that this uh, covers the removal of Social Security tax by replacing it with this other fee tax. Thank you. 
Senator, Has uh, Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. President. And th the reason I ask that question is from reading the amendment language, I, I don't think it's going to land dollar for dollar. And if the amendment didn't you know, cover the cost of eliminating the, the tax on Social Security, it would be out of order. And so, uh, Mr. President, my reading of the amendments is that this underlying amendment, as amended, is a net tax increase on Minnesotans. And I just want to remind members of the chamber that we started off this session with a $19 billion surplus. And so far, between uh, Democrats here at the legislature, we've seen more than $9 billion of tax increases proposed. And this amendment, as amended, is yet another uh, tax increase um, that is being put before this body. And I didn't see any Democrats this last campaign cycle out campaigning for tax increases, um, at least not in my area. Um, and I think it's important, Mr. President, members to understand what this would do. If this amendment as amended is adopted and goes on the tax bill today, this would be moving Minnesota's capital gains rate to be the second highest in the nation, just behind California. It would move it up to 11.95%. Uh, and to just give you a sense, and Mr. President, this, this is an important one, um, and one that we notice, especially in the area that I represent, because we border both North and South Dakota. In North Dakota, their top rate for capital gains is 2.9%, and in South Dakota, it is 0%. And Mr. President, that's perhaps one of the reasons why in the last tax year that we have data for, we've seen more than $1.5 billion in adjusted state income leaving Minnesota for other states. Minnesota is in the bottom 10 in terms of GDP growth. We are losing income. We're losing individuals. Ramsey County, Hennepin County are depopulating. And we're yet again talking about another tax increase on Minnesotans when we started with a $19 billion surplus. And I just want folks to know that we have a choice here in the Minnesota Senate. We don't have to, if we, we can decide to eliminate the tax on Social Security without increasing taxes in other places. And you know, we'll debate this amendment and we'll get on to the underlying bill, but ultimately um, we are seeing billions of dollars in tax increases when we started with a surplus. And the only real disagreement that we have here at the Capitol among Democrats is which taxes to increase and by how much. And Mr. President, I don't think that's what Minnesotans voted for. That's not what they expect of us. Um, and I, I will be voting against this tax increase before the body. And Senator Rasmussen, I just want to make sure that you are not uh, uh, making um, uh, a motion under Rule 7.4 because you were asking about the nets. I just want to make sure that you're not asking for that. Okay, thank you. Senator Miller. Thank you, Mr. President. Will the author of the A24 amendment yield? Senator uh, um, Kupek will yield. Senator Miller. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the way I read the amendment, it says uh, this is a net investment tax on individuals, estates, and trusts. Senator Kupek, what is the amount of the tax increase over the next two years on individuals, estates, and trusts here in the state of Minnesota with your S amendment? Senator Kupek, to that question again. Sure. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Miller. So you're just, uh, Ms., uh, could I just clarify the question again? Clarifying the question, uh, Senator Miller. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Kupek, what is the amount of the tax increase on Minnesota individuals, estates, and trusts over the next two years with your amendment. Senator Kupek, did you hear the question? Yes, I did. Senator Kupek, to the question. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Miller. As far as I understand, uh, there is not a, a tax increase because, again, it is uh, neutral with regards to eliminating the Social Security tax. So obviously, there, uh, I don't think that uh, trusts pay the Social Security tax, so there will be some kind of increase on those. Senator Miller. Thank you, Mr. President. Will Senator Kupik uh, continue to yield? Senator Kupik, will you yield? He will yield. Senator Miller. Senator Kupik, your underlying amendment, which has now been amended, the A24 amendment has a net investment 
income tax increase on individuals, estates, and trusts. Senator Kupik, what is the amount of the tax increase in line 1.9 of your amendment over the next two years on individuals, estates, and trusts? Senator Kupik, to the question. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Miller. As far as I know, the elimination of the Social Security tax would amount to a $1.6 billion. So this would transfer that $1.6 billion from a tax on Social Security uh, over to this side. Senator Miller. Thank you, Mr. President. Will Senator Kupik uh, continue to yield? Senator Kupik, will you yield? He will yield. Senator Miller. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Kupik. Uh, the A24 amendment is a net investment income tax increase on individuals, estates, and trusts. On line 1.9 of your bill, this is the net investment income tax on individuals, estates, and trusts. Just that portion of the amendment, what is the amount of the tax increase on Minnesotans over the next four years? Senator Kupik. Uh, thank you, Ms. thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Mill. As far as I uh, have been told uh, from the fiscal department, that it is a total of 2.688 billion. S Senator Miller. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, the A24 amendment in front of us is a two point, I think he said $2.86 billion tax increase on Minnesota individuals, estates, and trusts. And I asked the body, if we raise taxes on some Minnesotans to provide relief to other Minnesotans, Is that a tax cut? Is that tax relief? I'll let others come to their own opinion on that. My opinion, members, is the state of Minnesota has a 19 billion, 19 billion dollar budget surplus. When you account for inflation, it's 17 and a half billion dollars. The people of Minnesota, the senior citizens of Minnesota, expect us to eliminate the state income tax on Social Security benefits without raising taxes. But unfortunately, the amendment in front of us raises over $2.8 billion in taxes, $2.8 billion of new taxes in addition to the tax increases that are already in the tax bill. Members, when we came to this chamber, I don't think that's what Minnesotans expected of us, and I certainly don't think that's what seniors expected us to do in this chamber. Raise taxes on some to provide relief to others, I don't think that's what Minnesotans expected us to do. Senator Hostow. Thank you, Mr. President. Boy, am I excited about this bill. Um, this has been a, a really great ride with, with Chair Rest, looking at how we provide the most benefits for the most amount of people. Almost a billion dollars in a child care credit, billion dollars from the surplus, a billion dollars from the surplus for Social Security tax relief for those earning up to $140,000 a year. There aren't many Minnesotans that make more than $140,000 a year, but there are some. And what this amendment does is it bridges the gap for full elimination of Social Security. Based on estimates from fiscal, 227,000 more seniors will see their Social Security tax eliminated from this amendment. 227,000 seniors. The promise that I made 
was to provide Social Security tax relief to seniors. This amendment would tax those making over $250,000 a year in investment income, and it's 34,000 filers. So you do the math. 227,000 additional seniors getting tax relief on their Social Security, a federal benefit that is their own money going into a federal program and coming back to them when they need it most, a federal program that we promised these seniors, and 34,000 paying an equal amount to create a tax reform that benefits those that need it. That's not to mention the billion or so dollars we provide for childcare in this bill, for young families trying to start a family. It doesn't talk about the property tax relief that we provide seniors and all Minnesotans in this bill. We are doing with this bill the most amount of good for the most amount of Minnesotans, and I am so thrilled that we get to do it. And I'm excited to vote for this amendment. Thank you. Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, again, I, I, I want to go back to this investment income issue. So again, I do commercial real estate brokerage across uh, this, my district. And I have people that have investment income because they invest in property. But these properties are what create jobs. One property loan I'm working on right now, an investment I'm doing, this property creates 30 jobs. 30 jobs. They pay property taxes. They buy equipment. They get their parking lot resurfaced. They get their grass mowed. They get snow plowed. All these things continue on. They're income generators. They're tax generators by investment properties. They are paying taxes on all kinds of different things that are benefiting our state. I'll use one example, a hotel. You know, all of us have uh, small little towns and how beneficial a, a nice hotel would be in that town to attract tourism in, to attract, uh, attract all kinds of things coming to that district, to that town. But if we have folks that don't invest and make investments in investment property, you're not gonna have the hotels. You're not gonna have the restaurants. You're not gonna have the manufacturing facilities. You're not gonna have the retail because these are investment properties that create tax for our state. And if you're overtaxing these people, they're gonna leave the state, and they are leaving the state. We know that. But think of all the things that these create for Minnesota and our small communities. Again, one example, a hotel. If that investment property is there, what does it create? It creates jobs. It creates services. It creates property taxes. The goods that are sold to that property to provide food, to provide uh, sheets, towels, linens, all those things are being taxed in Minnesota. So if you take investment property out or you tax it more, it's going to have a detrimental effect on the amount of overall taxes that the state generates. And if you have a bad tax climate in Minnesota, investors will move out. And we will lose those investment properties. We will lose those things for our cities that are beneficial to tourism, to creating jobs, all those things that are going on. We have to make Minnesota a state where the tax environment is not pushing people out of the state. And that's what's happening here. We're doing a $2.86 billion tax increase that is going to move our investment clients, our citizens, out to another state. And Minnesota is going to lose on all those things I said, the jobs, the services, the property taxes, the equipment they buy, the trucks, the cars, all those things are going somewhere else. You have to look at the big picture. We have to keep people here in Minnesota. If we're overtaxing them, they're going to leave. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. President. This amendment is a prime example of how easy it is for 
a legislator to lose their way in the fog of government, the fog of the Capitol. When you're going around your district and you're campaigning and you're asking people to support you and they ask you, what do you stand for and what are you going to do fighting for us down at the state capitol? And you tell them the list of the things that you're wanting to do. Then you get down here and you get in a caucus and you get surrounded by lobbyists and special interest groups and big packs with the millions of dollars that helped get you here. And they start telling you the exact opposite of what you were telling your constituents back home. And if you get yourself disconnected from the common sense and the fresh air, like in my district out in rural Minnesota, and you just allow yourself to get surrounded by the fog of St. Paul, and this capital surrounding, it chokes out your common sense. On a bipartisan basis in this chamber, members on both sides were telling our constituents, we have to get Social Security fully eliminated in the state of Minnesota. We had a large surplus last year, and this, this caucus in the majority last year pushed really hard to get this done last year, and I won't get into that discussion, and there's clearly differing views on why that happened. But we came in this year with an even larger surplus. And everyone in my caucus was saying all year we're pushing hard to fully eliminate Social Security, and members of the now majority caucus were saying the exact same thing. And so we got here in the beginning of January and early on in session, we put it for a vote right here on the Senate floor. We said, we're saying it, you're saying it, Minnesotans are saying it, we have this large surplus, let's just flip and do it. Let's pass a clean and clear Social Security tax exemption. But the walls closed in and the fog grew thick and convinced some members of this chamber who had campaigned on fully eliminating Social Security to say, oh, we're not ready to. We're going to wait. We're going to vote no on this. We're, we're going to do it, but we're not ready quite yet. And that was the start of the political games that Minnesotans grow so tired of. Over and over and over again, we've given this body ample opportunities to pass a clean and clear-cut Social Security tax exemption, because that's what the people wanted, and that's what they told us last year when we were all going door to door. But when the fog grows thick in the Capitol and you start losing your common sense and you start getting drowsy with the headiness of what all these special interests are saying, they start running Point up to you. For what purpose do you rise? Thank you, Mr. President. I rise under Rule 36.2. The member may speak only to the question under debate and avoid personality. We have had an impugnment of motives uh, from the senator in the front row. Members, I'm not going to rule on it, but it, this is a good time for us to be reminded of what is before the body, which is the um, A24 am amendment as amended. Number two, just be guided by our wonderful Senate tradition and, and the principles that we all have subscribed to to only speak to the issue and not to di divert or diverge and go anyplace else. So with that gentle notion for all of us, Senator Matthews, and thank I think, yes, Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, this is running afoul of the continuous dilatory motions that uh, I think you might need to advise other members that keep rising with the same motion over and over again. When we clearly are sticking with the topic under debate. 
and Point have not order. had a single uh, a Senator Lass, for what purpose do you rise? Accusing people making motions of being dilatory goes to the intent and violates the very uh, uh, rules that we're talking about, Mr. President. Members, we're not supposed to impugn the, the motives of anyone who rises uh, 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 in this chamber. So can we be reminded of that? It, do you have a point of order, Senator Pratt? Uh, I don't have a point of order, Mr. President. It well, was that's the only way that I can allow someone else to interrupt is if there's a point of order. Then point of order, Mr. President. What's your point of order? Thank for, you, for Mr. What purpose do you rise and what rule? Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, it's been a longstanding custom and practice that we minimize the number of interruptions for senators during debate. I know you have restrained from ruling, and, uh, and we appreciate that. We would also hope that the same gentle reminder to stay on topic would also be a gentle reminder to not interrupt senators during debate uh, unless there's a, a compelling reason. Thank you. Members, uh, it's the same gentle reminder on both sides of the equation, and in fact, it's not a point of order for us to stand and just say something, just be reminded. I just want, want to make sure that we create an environment where every individual is able to speak, as long as we're speaking to the issue, and that we do not impugn each other because we know that that is not what we should do or are allowed to do on this floor. So I do have a list, and I'm go going to turn back to Senator Matthews with a gentle reminder where you don't necessarily have to say what someone is doing. Sen uh, Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. President. I will continue to do so. So as the time continues on in this session, we see that solutions come forward that look like this, that are not just clean and clear-cut Social Security exemption that all Minnesotans asked for. It gets clouded. It gets attached directly to a separate tax increase which the author just pointed out, I believe he said $2.6 billion tax increase, becomes the only vehicle, apparently, under which the majority can bring themselves to vote for the Social Security tax exemption that we all talked about to Minnesotans last year. And you may think it's okay because You've been around the Capitol for so many months now, and everybody's saying that in your ear, and, and they're telling you it's okay, and we got to be responsible, and this is the way that we've got to do it. But outside these walls, in the fresh air and common sense of the state of Minnesota, in our home districts, especially in mine in rural Minnesota, that's not what Minnesotans expect. And this form of government's not okay. They didn't ask you to see this giant pile of money that we're sitting on on the surplus. And they did not say when they said to give it back, they did not mean take more of our money first and then give some of it back. But that's in effect what this amendment as amended is going to do. And it's not talking about completely separate people. This $250,000 delineation that's in here encompassing your individual income and estates and trusts falls far short of the uber wealthy that the majority likes to put up as the reason for raising every tax to give to other Minnesotans. As has been said, you put in policies like this, and a lot of Minnesotans that do meet this threshold are going to be forced to take their investments and to move them out of Minnesota. And then where's your money going to come from to fully exempt the Social Security income that your seniors and my seniors so desperately need? It won't be there. And it's amazing to me how we can't, in this body, apparently bring ourselves to go up to this Scrooge McDuck giant pile of surplus money 
and take even one cupful to give back without it being attached to collecting even more money for Minnesotans. Make that pile of gold even bigger first before we pass such a social security exemption. This is not what Minnesotans asked for. They saw the giant surplus and they said, give it back. Sometimes the right answer, Mr. President, is the easiest answer and the simplest answer. What we have before us is a very convoluted solution with members trying to explain away how we'll justify the two going together. Minnesotans wanted the simple answer. You took $19 billion of our tax dollars, more than you should have, give it back. It's that easy, Mr. President, and this amendment fails to meet that low threshold. I urge members to oppose it. Senator Westlin. Thank you, Mr. President. You know, uh, for decades, for a long time here in the state of Minnesota, we have actually underfunded and neglected a lot of things, and I keep hearing about this budget deficit in relation to the conversation that we're having today. <clears throat> and the people in the state of Minnesota actually did not say, take the $17.8 billion surplus and give it back to us. They asked us to do things. They asked us to fund education. They asked us to fund health and human services, higher education, agriculture, housing, environment, and so on. When you look at all of the, the needs in our state versus what we actually had to work with, there are still unmet needs. We've heard from school districts, I think this was discussed earlier, who desperately need more money but all the things we funded this year are really important. So let's talk about what this particular tax does and just to level set here. We are not taxing people who have income of $250,000 a year. We are, we are proposing a tax on net investment income in excess of $250,000. That means you have to have a pretty significant chunk of money invested to have investment income of $250,000. Net investment income, if you look at IRC code 1411C, it defines it there. You all can read and you can Google that for yourself. The federal tax rate for this type of income is 3.8%. What we know is this type of income is often uh, a sole source of income for a lot of people who then actually don't pay their fair share. We're talking about 34,000 people in a state of almost 6 million who might be impacted by this tax. And we're doing this so that we can fully eliminate the Social Security tax. And in conjunction with that, we are providing $4 billion in tax cuts. $4 billion to the people who need them the most. This is really simple. Everybody's been clamoring for an elimination of Social Security tax. We also provide elimination for um, pension income. But it has to be paid for. And this is a revenue neutral way to do it that literally taxes the uber rich. I heard someone say this wasn't the uber rich. If you assume a very low return on investment of 4% in order to have $250,000 of, of gross income from investments, you'd have to have $6 million invested. This is not your next door neighbor, most likely, unless you live somewhere other than where I live. Um, this is literally taxing the people who probably pay the least amount of tax, both federally and in state. And if we want to eliminate the tax on Social Security and on pensions, it needs to be paid for. This is revenue neutral. This should be an easy vote. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator.
Jaskowski. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, we have before us yet another tax increase proposal by Minnesota Democrats. They brought it in the bill. They brought a $1.2 billion brand new tax in the bill, just rolled out in tax committee at uh, everyone's surprise last Thursday. And now we see before us another one that's been represented as 2.6 or 1.6 billion. We're not sure, members, we don't have before us any numbers to show us what this raises. We don't know if it's within the rules. Someone might want to raise a point of order, Mr. President, uh, because I don't, think, uh, I don't think that it adheres to our rules. But the pursuit of more and more of the people's money by Minnesota Democrats in this amendment could not be more crystal clear, Mr. President. Nineteen billion dollars of over-collection of the people's money. Uh, the, the farm metaphor I like to use, Mr. President, is the elevators coming in from the countryside across the state, coming in and dumping it here in St. Paul, and it's landing on a great big corn pile. Well, the corn pile is $19 billion high, Mr. President. And the bins of the hardworking people throughout the state of Minnesota are getting drained out because those elevators continue to run, the, run to here and dump the little bit of corn that they have in their bin here to accumulate, to be spent, and many times wasted by government here in the state of Minnesota. And Minnesota Democrats want to take more of their money, as much as they can. That's what we see in this amendment. As a matter of fact, Mr. President, we look at this amendment, they want to chase people into other states in order to extract more and more money from them. If you look at the amendment uh, on lines 1.11 through 1.13 of the bill, if an individual is not a resident of the state of Minnesota more than half the year, we're still going to go after them and take their income. They could live here one year out of 365 days, and we're taking income from them in this bill. The pursuit of other people's money in order to fund more and more big government to do more to them is so self-evident in this amendment. Mr. President, members, we have people in Minnesota who have worked their whole lives and escaped with whatever they could escape with from this government that wants to take the money from them. They've saved up a nest egg of some sort. They put it in an investment, and the Democrats want to take that money from them. Unbelievable, Mr. President. Where I come from, Mr. President, they've paid enough taxes. I, I think uh, the author of the amendment, I, was, I expect, uh, I haven't talked to the members in his district. Uh, maybe Mr. President, would, would Rep or Senator Kupek yield for a question? Senator Kupek, will you yield? He will yield. Senator Jaskowski. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Ms. Uh, Senator Kupek, uh, thanks for yielding. So tell us, Senator Kupek, do the people in your district want to pay more taxes? Senator Kupek, to the question. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Driskowski. I believe uh, this would be a tax cut for most of the people, if not all of the people uh, in my district. Senator Driskowski. Thank you, Mr. President. Well. Senator Kupek, that's not true. Uh, you've got a huge tax increase in this bill. We don't know, or in this amendment, we don't know how much it is. Uh, it's been described as when Minnesotans want us to give their money back to them. This amendment aims to come in, and as Senator Matthews pointed out, put a hundred dollars in one pocket and then take $100 out of the other pocket and tell them, yeah, we gave it back to you. That's what this amendment does. Smoke and mirrors 
is what we have in this amendment. The people in my district, Mr. President, don't go for this. I don't think many of our districts, certainly many of the rural and suburban districts I've been in, uh, don't want this type of tax oppression chasing them into other states, even if they only live here for one or two days a year, uh, which this aims to take their money in those cases as well. I did see, though, Mr. President, on the um, amendment to the amendment, I saw, I saw 12 Democrats vote no on the amendment to the amendment. And so I'm thinking, okay, so we actually have some members who live in some of our communities who don't want any tax cuts for their members or for their constituents and seemingly want to raise taxes both out of the Social Security tax and out of this net investment income tax that's uh, being proposed in this base amendment. So I think, Mr. President, we should allow them to vote for that. Uh, I wouldn't think um, Senator Kupek or Senator Hochschild or certainly not me and my district, I know for sure, are interested in that. Uh, I would offer, Mr. President, the A78 amendment to the amendment. Senator Jaskowski offers the A78 amendment to the amendment. The secretary will report the A78 amendment to the amendment. Senator Draskowski moves to amend the A24 amendment to House File Number 1938 as follows, page 1, line 9, after trusts insert. This is the A78 amendment. Senator Draskowski, to your amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, members, this would provide uh, that this brand new tax uh, would only be applicable to residents who live in Hennepin and Ramsey counties and would allow the rest of Minnesota to be free from this yet newest oppressive effort by Minnesota Democrats. I ask for your support for the amendment to the amendment. Ask for a roll call. Thank you, Mr. President. Roll call requested, roll call granted. Any other uh, questions on the, on the A78 amendment? Uh, uh, Senator Kupek? Sure. Thank you, Mr. President. I would just ask for a, a no vote on this amendment to the amendment. I, I think we, uh, as all Minnesotans, it should just be applied across the board. Seeing no further questions or discussions, the secretary would take the roll on the A78 amendment. Members, please vote. We're on the amendment to the amendment, which is the A78 amendment to the amendment. Senator Bowden, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. I report that Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Rasmussen, those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Anderson votes aye. Senator Anderson votes aye. Senator Howe votes aye. Senator Howe votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. And Senator Liskey votes aye. And Senator Liskey votes aye. Senator Weber, are you going to vote?
Members, just so you remember, we are voting on the amendment to the amendment, the A78 amendment to the amendment. All senators haven't voted who? Uh, Senator Rasmussen, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Abler votes aye. Senator Abler votes aye. All senators have been voted who desires to vote. The secretary will close the roll. There being 32 ayes and 35 noes, the amendment to the amendment is not adopted. Members, just as a friendly reminder, we are now on the A24 as amended. A roll call has been requested and a roll call has been granted. Before we go to the author of the amendment, Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I appreciate it. And I've been trying to keep track of some numbers as we've, as we've had this conversation. And from what I can gather, we need about $1.6 billion to close the gap, which would allow us to completely eliminate the tax on Social Security for our seniors. And so I would ask if Senator Pratt would yield for a question. Uh, who did you ask for, Senator Duckworth? Senator Pratt, Mr. President. Senator Pratt, yes, he would yield. Senator Pratt, will you not? I know you're sitting next to him, but I just want to make sure that you would yield. He will yield. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Pratt. I appreciate it. Senator Pratt, as a member of the Finance Committee, I'm just curious. You know, we've moved a lot of omnibus bills through, and we're looking at the budget in its entirety. I'm just wondering if there's any money that's left on the bottom line, and if so, where it currently stands for the next few years. Senator Pratt, to the question. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, as far as I can tell, we still have uh, 3.29, basically $3.3 billion left in fiscal, for the fiscal bienniums 24 and 25, and $2.8 billion uh, sitting on the bottom line for fiscal 26 and 27. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Senator Pratt, and thank you, Mr. President. So from what I can gather, you know, we, we started out with a $19 billion surplus. We just heard from Senator Pratt, we've got still billions of dollars in the positive on the bottom line. And all we need is $1.6 billion to fulfill that campaign promise that many of us made to our seniors, which is to fully eliminate the tax on Social Security. So I would ask if Senator Kupek would yield for a question, Mr. President. Senator. You ask Senator Pratt to yield? Senator Kupek. Senator Kupek, will you yield? He will yield. Senator Kupek. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Kupek. Uh, so, Senator Kupek, is, it, is, it, is my understanding correct that even with a $19 billion surplus and billions of dollars still remaining on the bottom line, that it's the position of Senate Democrats that the only way they're willing to pass the full exemption of the tax on Social Security as promised to our seniors is to raise taxes on Minnesotans? Senator Kubek, to the question. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Duckworth. Uh, I cannot speak for the fellow members of my caucus, but uh, for myself, uh, having been here now for a few months and and seeing some of the needs and wants, uh, this seemed like a good way to get a full removal of Social Security tax and move it in just a shift over to a different area uh, and get some tax relief for you know another 227,000 Minnesotans. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Kupek. And I'll be brief, Mr. President. So. What the amendment would have us do is, despite a $19 billion surplus, despite still having billions on the bottom line, and only needing to cover an amount of $1.6 billion to fully exempt the tax on Social Security for our seniors, it's saying the only way per this amendment that folks are willing to do that is by increasing taxes on other Minnesotans, I think I heard, by about $2.8 billion. So I think, Mr. President, that's where some of the frustration is coming from throughout the course of this debate, and really th uh, when it comes to the people of Minnesota. They can do math. When they see the state sitting on that much in surplus, $19 billion, when they see the state of Minnesota continuing to spend billions and grow the spending of government by 40 percent, 
and still have billions left on the bottom line for our seniors to hear, well, we're only going to allow for the exemption for about 75% of you, and we just didn't quite have enough money to cover all of you. Well, that's not an accurate statement, Mr. President, and I think what we're seeing here today is the only way in which the majority party is willing to fulfill that promise of eliminating the tax on Social Security is by increasing taxes on other Minnesotans. And I'm wagering that that part of the conversation didn't necessarily take place at the door when folks were knocking. It wasn't explained to seniors, yeah, we're going to eliminate the tax on Social Security by raising taxes on other Minnesotans. No, obviously it was expected we're going to eliminate that tax using the billions upon billions of dollars the state is sitting on in surplus. So as we prepare to vote on this amendment, Mr. President, uh, you know, I don't like to make accusations that we're you know, playing a game or we're not taking this seriously, but I want to be very crystal clear to the people of Minnesota what's taking place right now. It's obvious throughout the course of this session, starting almost on day one, that Republicans have made a concerted effort to fulfill the promise that both Republicans and Democrats made to the seniors and people of Minnesota, which was to eliminate the tax on Social Security without any strings attached. There were no caveats. There are no ifs, ands, or buts. There are no, we're going to do it only if you raise taxes. It was very cleanly, plain spoken, a promise, a commitment to the people. We're going to eliminate this tax. And here we have the ability to do it. We've been trying to do it. We've got the money to do it, and there's still money left over to get it done. And here we are saying, well, we're only going to do it if you allow us to raise more taxes by billions of dollars. That's a failure, Mr. President. I'm still hopeful that my friends across the aisle will allow us to find a way to do this without any strings attached for the people and the seniors of Minnesota. Thank you. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. Would Senator Kupek yield for a question? Senator P Kupek, will you yield? He will yield. Senator Pratt. Thank you. Senator Kupek, do you have a revenue note on this uh, net investment income tax? Senator Kupek. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Pratt, uh, I do not have that, but this was what I presented these numbers to the fiscal staff, and these were the numbers that they came back with me when I said, here's what I'd like to do, here's how much it will cost. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. Would Senator Kupek yield for another question? Senator Kupek, will you yield? He will yield. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Kupek, was there any testimony in the tax committee over the net investment income tax and what those, uh, what those new funds might generate. Senator Kupek. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator Pratt. Uh, I am not aware. I am not on the tax committee. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, as Senator Miller was talking about this and, and questioning Senator Kupek, I was writing down some numbers. Uh, we talked about a $1.6 billion uh, four-year period that Social Security tax needs to be uh, covered, and that the four-year number on this was uh, $2.688 billion. Mr. President, we've been talking about whether or not there should be a point of order made on this amendment, so I will make the point of order that this amendment uh, under Rule 7.4 should be ruled out of order. Uh, 7. Point, uh, Senator Pratt uh, makes a... Um uh, a motion under uh, a point of order, I'm sorry, under Rule 7.4 to say that the amendment uh, to this omnibus bill or the tax bill is out of order. Uh, pursuant to 7.4, which one? If uh, it will. 7.42. Reduce net revenue to fund for a fiscal uh, biennial. Oh, I'm sorry, 7.2.4. Uh, Create an increased amount in tax expenditures by reducing appropriations, transfers, etc. That is not in the bill as it was reported to the floor of the Senate. Any advice? Uh, Senator Rest. Uh, thank you, Mr. Um, President. It is the uh, custom when such a um, uh, question is um, brought up to consult with our chief fiscal analyst, and I do not see him in the room, um, but. Um, uh, members of the Republican Party have constantly been questioning our fiscal staff, and I take offense at that. Um, uh, Senator Kupak has said that he was acting on the advice of um, 
are extremely experienced and brilliant um, fiscal staff, and I would hope that you would wait to make a decision um, for Mr. Nauman to come and advise you. Any other advice? Mr. President. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, I share the, uh, the admiration and respect for our nonpartisan staff. They do a fantastic job, um, both helping the majority and the minority. I'm simply making my point of order on Senator Kupek's own testimony here today that the bill raises $2.68 billion, billion in taxes, but only needs $1.6 billion in expenditure. Uh, uh, before I go to Senator Kupek, under your notion, I just want to make sure that you're saying creates or increases the amount of a tax expenditure by reducing appropriations, transfers, or revenues to an agency that was not in the bill as it was reported to the floor of the Senate. That's the, that's the whole provision that you're looking at. Mr. It, Mr. President, yes, I Senator think Pratt. I wanted 7.41, a net increase in appropriations from a fund or fiscal by the and without a corresponding increase in net revenue. There's a billion dollar gap between the number that Senator Cooper so gave Senator us. So Senator Pratt, just, just for clarity, because you did say 7.44, and now if you're going to 7.41, I just want to be clear Thank because you, when President. I rule, I just want to make sure I'm in the right space. Mr. President, I was, in, I was mistaken. So 7.41, okay. Uh, advice, Senator Kupek. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, thanks, Senator Pratt. Uh, I will, uh, I misspoke when I said what that number amount was. So the 1.6 billion is the total over the four years. The 2.68, that is actually this removal and the removal uh, that we are doing under the current bill, uh, bringing that up to 100,000. So that's where it is. So it is just 1.6 billion uh, on there that this does raise. All right, we will get advice uh, from Fisco. Um, so if you give us a moment. I will come right back to, to rule on your point of order. Having uh, read the rule and uh, sought advice, the point of order is not well taken. <laughs> Senator Pratt, for what reason do you rise? Uh, Mr. President, I'd like to continue. You sure can. Senator thank, Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. Would Senator Kupik yield for another question? Senator Kupik, will you yield? He will yield. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Kupik, uh, the uh, net investment tax credit talks about um, uh, trust accounts, and I know many family farms are held in family trusts. Can you tell me um, how this will affect our family farmers? It's my understanding, based on what I see, is that this will be a net tax increase to our family farms that generate over 250 million or 250,000 from operations. Senator Kupet. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Uh, and my belief is that it is on the investment income on that, and that is if they are just making income income, then that they would not qualify for this. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, Senator Kupek, I'm not exactly sure how we're going to classify investment income because these farmers have lots of investment, particularly in their land. Um, I know I have a dairy farmer in uh, my community 
they hold their, their property in a trust, and it's an investment property, so to speak, that multiple family members have uh, joined in on. They inherited it along the way, and, and many generations, uh, brothers and sisters and are, are living off this family farm and the money that it generates. Um, this would seem to say that uh, that income, potentially, based on what they're earning from, from that land, from that investment, would be subject, anything over 250000 would be subject to a new rate. And Mr. President, I think it shouldn't go un, unnoticed that this is an entirely new tax being created. We're not changing a tax rate. We're creating a new tax on Minnesota small business, Minnesota farmers. This isn't about the big corporations. This isn't about the uber wealthy. Minnesotan sells their home, could be subject to, if they sell it at a gain of 250000 it's subject to this tax, an additional tax on every Minnesotan. And let's take the baby boomers that were trying to give a Social Security tax increase or decrease to. If they sell their home and downsize, they're going to see an increased tax. I'm not even quite sure, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Kupek, could, would you yield for another question? Senator Kupek, will you yield? He will yield. Senator Pratt. Thank you. Senator Kupek, we have uh, a definition of, next, of uh, investment tax credits on, and income tax credits on, um, in uh, Section 290.17. And I'm wondering, or I'm sorry, uh, 290.06. And you referenced that in your bill. I'm wondering how would this then be on top of those income taxes that are already created? Senator Kupek, to the question. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, would Senator Pratt just clarify that question? Senator Pratt, he wants some clarification. Senator Thank Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Kupek, your amendment references uh, Section 290.06, and it says that a tax imposed on net investment incomes of individuals with uh, trust in excess of 250000 should be at a rate of, of uh, 2.01. This is a completely new chapter of law, but you're referencing uh, uh, Chapter 290.06, Schedules for Rates of Individuals, Estates, and Trusts, and I'm wondering how these two different taxes are working together. This is your amendment. I'm hoping you can tell me how the nuts and bolts of it work. Senator Kupek. Thank you, Mr. President. Yes, it, uh, the way uh, I understand it is that in addition to the tax computed under that, uh, this tax is also in post. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. Would Senator Rust yield for a question? Senator Rust, will you yield? I think that's a yes, Mr. President. She will yield. Uh, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Rest, was this new section 290.033 net investment uh, income tax heard in your committee? Senator Rest. The um, tax on next net investment income from um, the Internal, Red Co uh, Internal Revenue Code is 3.8%, so it's not a new tax. This is a, uh, a different rate on the definition of net investment income, which as you, I think, know, it's interest, it's dividends, um, et cetera. That's how most of us would think about it. It's in whatever is in your savings account, perhaps. But uh, I think people like are being covered by uh, this amendment. Um, we're talking about extremely, in my mind, wealthy income, wealthy people, because the, um, you have to have over $250,000 in interest income, let's say, or dividends, before the surcharge on the income would be taxed. So 
I, I find it strange that anyone would consider it a new tax as, a, as opposed to a surcharge on an existing tax. Senator Brett. Thank you, Mr. President. And Senator Russ forgot to say capital gains as well. But uh, Mr. President, I would say that it's a new tax because we're creating a whole new chapter of law. If we were just changing the rate, we would just be changing the rate on existing law. But we're creating a whole new chapter, a chapter 290.033, which does not exist today. I've looked in our statutes. So to me, this is a new tax. It's not a change in rate, it's a new tax on top of what already exists. And I think has been so eloquently mentioned, when Senate Republicans talked about eliminating the Social Security tax, we talked about it with no strings attached. We talked about it without finding a way to tax seniors another way. And as Senator Duckworth raised, we still have $3.2 billion on the bottom line in the first fiscal year to cover the first half of this four-year $800 million expense and another $2.8 billion that would cover the second part of the $800 million incremental tax relief. We have money on the bottom line. We have money in the surplus to pay for this. We have an ongoing, well, we did have an ongoing, structural surplus at the beginning, at when the forecast came out. Even with inflation, we had a structural surplus. Senate Democrats are trying their best to spend it all plus. I mean, we've got almost $1.3 billion in tax increases in this bill. And now we're going to be adding another $1.6 billion in tax increases with this amendment that will hit seniors as they start to cash out their 401ks and their retirement savings accounts. It will hit seniors as they start to sell their homes. It will hit small farmers. Maybe not on operations income. You might be right on that, Senator Rest, but on other types of income that they get on their land. This is, a this is an attack, Mr. President, on the middle class. We, it's couched. It's couched as, as a tax on the uber wealthy. But this is a tax on the middle class, on the people who have saved their entire lives that will now be pulling out of their retirement accounts, that will now be selling their homes to downsize. And increasing the, the amount of taxes in this bill to almost $3 billion. Mr. President, we should be better than that. And I urge a no vote on the underlying amendment. Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Again, I, I, I want to talk about net investment income and, and investment properties. They're not for the guru wealthy. I'm going to tell you a quick story. So two businessmen in my uh, hometown, Faribault, had very successful practices. One was an eye doctor, one was a dentist. They had separate facilities. Uh, they were building their facilities. My dentist started with one chair. Eye doctor started with one chair. They built their businesses over time, 10 to 15 years, and said, hey, as our businesses build, why don't we build a new medical office building that will host both of us, we can be tenants, and we'll open up more availability space for other people that want to come to this beautiful medical facility. They're very, very lucky and did that and built that facility. They've been up and operating now for about 15 years, and they pay property taxes. And I just want for an example to show you how this benefits the state, these investment properties benefit the state. I have their current 2023 tax statement in front of me. The taxes for that building, it's a 60,000 square foot medical building. These aren't the ubu wealthy by any means. These are two business guys that started businesses that were successful, built them up, and built a building to host more businesses. The real estate taxes in 2023 were $189,176 overall. 
Now let's think how that benefits the individual taxing districts underneath there. The county of Rice County benefits by $48,600 a year. So that goes to health and human services, to roads, to bridges, to you name it, to law enforcement, you name it. The city of Faribault benefits by $62,828. Again, this is from an investment. This is every single year. The state general tax that we collect here, the CNI tax, $42,961 every single year. School districts, we all talk about funding our school districts. Well, how about some money for our school districts? This building, an investment property that two local individuals invested in, now generate $30,700 every single year. The county hospital, the HRA, the EDA, several other small ones. But folks, this goes down, it creates jobs, it creates services, all these things it does. The other taxes that investment properties create are benefiting here, our cities, our counties, our school districts, and now you want to increase the tax to make that person leave the state because they go somewhere where it's not as tax advantages as it is here. Folks, this is not benefiting our state by taxing these investment properties. Cinder Weber. Thank you, Mr. President. We had a lot of discussion here. What is net investment income? Well, if you go to the IRS code that it talks about it, it is, says, in general, investment income includes, but is not limited to, interest, dividends, capital gains, rental and royalty income, non-qualified annuities, income from businesses involved in trading of financial instruments or commodities. The point that Senator Pratt made is very well taken. We have many farm families that own their land in trust. And there may be 1,000 acres, there may be 2,000 acres, but by the time you divide it up by the individual family members, it isn't that many acres between for each of them. But with cash rents at $250 to $300 an acre nowadays, at 1,000 acres, you get to $250,000 or you get to $300,000. Yes, this tax is going to hit not only the uber wealthy, but it is going to hit our normal, ordinary, everyday people out there as well. So I think everyone should keep that in mind. Thank you, Mr. President. Before we go to the author of this amendment, we are now going to Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President. I wanted to just touch one more aspect that, uh, and punctuate what Senator Jaskowski has brought up, and that is the commercial industrial property. And as Senator Weber just pointed out, Mr. President, the income that the Democrats are seeking to tax, create this new tax on, is rental income. During the, the pandemic, businesses were shut down. And this commercial industrial property was among the many other stresses across society were the commercial industrial property that hold the businesses that were shut down. And it created this cascade effect that these businesses were not able to either pay their rent or pay their mortgage. And that didn't end, this, this cascade effect did not end simply when the pandemic ended. Because the value of commercial industrial property is largely the product of the rental income it can produce. And when these commercial industrial properties can't produce rental incomes because the tenants can't pay them, because they're shut down and can't, don't have customers, that lowered the value. Then what happened the immediately next January 1st? Those properties were re-evaluated for its tax value. And the tax value continued to go down. And so compounding the problem of not being able to pay rent, it then permeates in a reduced tax value, and that tax value then needs to be picked up by residential. 
because the tax base lowered. I will have an amendment to that later. But I want it, but on this topic then, commercial industrial, we're still seeing the effects of this. And I recently saw a headline. And Mr. President, I'm wondering if Senator Putnam would yield for a question. Senator Putnam, will you yield? He will yield. Senator Lucero. Thank you, uh, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Putnam. One of the articles that I saw in the Star Tribune just yesterday, it's in regards to the Crossroads Center Mall. Now, I've been to the St. Cloud area several times. I don't know if I've been to this mall or not, but the article is speaking about it is the largest regional shopping mall in the state outside of the Twin Cities, and it could be sold or placed on the foreclosure auction block. And the article says... The malls, uh, I, I, let me skip forward. It has remained delinquent on its loan for more than two years after financial setbacks it experienced during the pandemic. So this is directly what I'm referring to. The pandemic made it difficult for people to pay their mortgage or rent, which has created foreclosures in the commercial industrial area. We're seeing that today, this article was just yesterday. And now there's a tax that the Democrats are proposing on rental income. Mr. President and Senator Putnam, do you believe that the increased tax on rental income will make it more difficult for this mall to find tenants and or a new buyer? Uh, Senator Putnam, we're on the uh, underlying amendment to the question. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Sarah, for the question. Someday you'll have to come up and we'll uh, stop by the old Panda Express in there or something or have a slice of pizza at the food court uh, if you want. It is, in fact, the only major mall of that sort in the St. Cloud area, so if you've been around there, that's the one you saw. Um, I would say, though, uh, that article is not, I've read it myself as well, and I've followed this issue for years because the issue that uh, that mall is facing is more about Amazon than it is the pandemic. That mall has been struggling for 10 years. Um, so uh, that's a, a simple answer to that specific question, is that that mall has been struggling for a very long time, uh, as all malls have been struggling. So this tax would not be the reason that Crossroad Malls is struggling. Senator Lucero. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Well, obviously, the tax that hasn't become law yet would not be a factor in why the mall is presently struggling. Obviously. Because we haven't voted on it yet. It hasn't been signed into law and it hasn't gone into effect. So that doesn't answer my question. My question is, and I won't ask him to, to yield because I, he, he chose not to want to answer the first time. It is very simple. Yes, markets have changed. Yes, online retailers have created presence for brick and mortar, uh, uh, challenges for brick and mortars, obviously. But it's well recognized that the pandemic and Governor Walz's forced shutdowns of businesses created and magnified a very pre existing problem, even worse. Now, as these businesses are attempting to come out still struggling with the after effects of the pandemic. This is just one of many examples of financially struggling businesses and their owners that derive rental income. And rental income is, I'm sorry, rents in part are obviously influenced by the tax rate. And so, Mr. President, what is very obvious is that Democrats seeking to increase taxes on rental income, that increased cost will get passed along to tenants who are already struggling to pay their rents and or mortgages. So increasing the taxes is absolutely going to make it more difficult to find a buyer or for this mall to come out into recovery, which Mr. President, Senator Putnam didn't want to answer. So it is beyond me why the majority believes that increasing taxes on more Minnesotans when there is a budget surplus that could be used to pay for the much needed tax and social security is in any way beneficial. It is devoid of reality, Mr. President, that the tax climate that Democrats are creating is going 
to result in more people leaving. The devoid of reality is that Democrats don't want to acknowledge that truth. People are leaving. It is already difficult to do business in Minnesota. It's going to become more difficult as the result of this Democrat tax increase in a time of budget surplus. Very, very unfortunate for all of Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Kupik, as the last voice that, that will be heard before we vote on the uh, amendment as amended. Senator Kupik. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, members, for uh, what has been a lively discussion about the elimination here of Social Security tax. Uh, I will say, um, and it, it, because it was brought up as to why possibly I would think about doing this way, and I would uh, think- Senator Kupik, yes. will you give me one moment? Because I was alerted to the fact that Senator Latz had been trying to get my attention back there. I, are you okay? I'm sorry, uh, Senator Kupik. Sure. Um, I will bring up the fact that one day, uh, I got kind of shuffled around in capital investments and uh, had to spend the, a very long afternoon uh, listening to requests for water projects. Uh, and it was heartbreaking to listen to so many of these small towns in rural areas who, if the state does not invest in their water system, um, they will be kind of out of business, that there'll be towns uh, because nobody wants to move to a town if you don't have clean drinking water. It seems like one of the basic requirements. And so basically it's become just being here for three or four months. It's come to my attention that there are a lot of needs in Minnesota. And I know that this is, there's a lot of one-time uh, money in this budget surplus. And there are a lot of needs that we need to do. And clearly the Social Security removing that tax, why I think it's a good idea is because it's a fairness thing for those people who paid in Two Social Security got taxed on it once, and then I don't think they should be getting taxed on it when it comes back again. But remember, by moving this, and I think link of it more as a move over to a different area, it's only 34,000 tax returns in the state of Minnesota. So that's not even 34,000 people, that's 34,000 tax returns. And 227,000 seniors, meanwhile, would see a tax reduction under this plan. And I will also remind you that the bill that we are attaching this to also does have four billion dollars in tax cuts on it already so i think that this is a way uh, to get something accomplished for our seniors by not creating uh, a big blowout in our budget going out into out years so i would ask you for a green vote on this the secretary would take the roll on the a24 amendment as amended Members, please vote.
Members, please vote. Just a reminder of members, I'm going to close the board shortly, and it will be just based on the uh, majority that is voted. Senator Rasmussen, those voted under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Abler votes no. Senator Abler votes no. Senator Anderson votes no. Senator Anderson votes no. Senator Howe votes no. Senator Howe votes no. Senator Lang votes no. Senator Lang votes no. And thank you, Mr. President. Senator Liskey votes no. Senator Liskey votes no. Senator Bowden, all those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. I report that Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Dietzik votes aye. And Senator May Quaid votes aye. Senator May Quaid votes aye. Senator Pratt, are you voting? Senator Johnson. All senators haven't voted who desires to vote. The secretary will close the roll. There have been 21 ayes and 46 noes. The amendment to, uh, as amended is not adopted. Senator Putnam. Mr. President, I move the A79 amendment, please. Senator Putnam moves the A79 amendment. The secretary will report the A79 amendment. Senator Putnam moves to amend House File Number 1938 as amended pursuant to Rule 45 as follows. Page 7, line 8, delete the new language and insert. This is the A79 amendment. Senator, to your amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. This is a technical uh, change to a portion of the tax bill that deals with the beginning farmer tax credit. Uh, all it does is cancellation of the carry forward credit, and it creates conformity and consistency between the spreadsheet and the law itself. It's a purely technical change. Any other discussions on the A79? Oh, you don't have it yet. We'll wait until you have it. Uh, uh, but we'll go to Senator Rest, who can speak to it, but we will not do anything until you get the A79. Senator Rest. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Mr. President. I appreciate um, uh, Senator Putnam's uh, making this technical correction at the request of the Department of, of Revenue, and I would urge 
people to vote, aye. Uh, uh, Senator Rest, did you request a roll call vote or you did not? Okay. It, uh, it is now online. The A79 is online. Can I get a thumbs up if you got it? Okay, great. Any other discussion on the A79? All in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. The A79 is adopted. Senator Hochschild. Nope, I'm sorry. Senator Latz. Thank you, Mr. President and members. Um, I actually had an amendment drafted to uh, Senator Kupik's underlying amendment, but uh, wasn't able to get in quickly enough before the vote, and I respect that. I didn't want to, um, there's a lot going on. I didn't want to cut off Senator Kupik, and I can make my point without offering the amendment itself. So I'm just going to make my point. Senator Drowskowski had an amendment to make Hennepin and Ramsey County pay for it. And I really reject the politics of geopolitical division in Minnesota, because that's really what it was. Sometimes that happens. The effects have disparate effects in different parts of the state. But we are one Minnesota. And we ought to be acting as if we are one Minnesota. And unfortunately, amendments like that brought by Senator Drazkowski create divisions, animosities, fears. His amendment was directed specifically to paying for certain benefits. And so the amendment that I drafted said basically the total aid amount under Minnesota statutes must be distributed among cities in proportion to the amount of taxes under, and then it cites the income and corporate franchise tax, estate sales, motor vehicles, charitable gambling, cigarettes and tobacco, liquor, solid waste management, insurance premiums, and liquor gross receipts, remitted by taxpayers in those cities in the previous calendar year. Then only the total aid amount under Minnesota statutes must be distributed among counties in proportion to the amount of taxes that they have paid in the previous year. In other words, every county in Minnesota, every city in Minnesota would have to pay for everything that they want government to pay for, for themselves. You know what would happen if that happened? Every one of Senator Drazkowski's constituents would be facing massive local tax increases to make up for the loss of aid from Hennepin and Ramsey counties. In other words, each county's residents would have to pay for all of their own needs, their own schools, their own bridges, their own roads, their own wastewater treatment plants, their own community colleges, their own trails, stocking their own lakes with fish, without subsidies from metro counties, especially Hennepin and Ramsey County. In fact, we could even let them pay for the statewide benefits that Hennepin and Ramsey County invests in that are available to all of Minnesota. Because the fact is, the metro counties, and especially Hennepin and Ramsey counties, pay a lot more into the state system than they get back in local government aid. And that money gets net distributed around the state to the greater Minnesota counties. So every greater Minnesota county is being subsidized by the taxpayers of Hennepin and Ramsey County. Now, I would submit that Senator Drazkowski's idea was a ridiculous one and that my proposed amendment is a ridiculous one, which is why I was going to withdraw it, because I wanted simply to make the point if we are going to start going after imposing financial burdens from one part of the state on other parts of the state simply because we're playing gotcha politics, because we want to uh, make the burdens more heavy on one county because they're perceived as, as rich counties and they can get the benefits, well, all that does is create conflict, not only here in the legislature, but among the people of Minnesota. I'm here as a state 
senator. So is every other senator in this room. At some point, members, we ought to be acting like that. Senator Miller. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to offer the A4 amendment. Senator Miller offers the A4 amendment. The secretary will report the A4 amendment. Senator Miller moves to amend House File Number 1938 as amended pursuant to Rule 45 as follows. Page 273 after line 2, insert. This is the A4 amendment. Senator Miller, to your amendment, to the Thank A4 you. amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, when I'm back in the district that I have the great honor of representing down in southeastern Minnesota, there are three questions that I'm commonly asked. The first question is, when are we going to repeal the tax on Social Security benefits? By far and away, that is the number one question that I get asked. The second question I get asked is, when is the state going to return the surplus money back to the taxpayers? And the third question that I'm asked on a consistent basis is, when is the state going to legalize sports betting? Well, the A4 amendment addresses one of those questions uh, that I'm being asked on a regular basis. The A4 amendment would establish the Minnesota Refund Program. And members, what the Minnesota Refund Program would do is if the state of Minnesota has a budget surplus at the time of the November forecast, 75% of that surplus would go into the Minnesota refund program. And the legislature would have the opportunity to pass tax relief using the funds in the Minnesota refund program. And if the legislature cannot come to an agreement on tax relief, that money would automatically be returned to the taxpayers. So we've heard ideas from Democrats that the surplus money should be returned to the taxpayers in the form of a one-time rebate. We've heard ideas from Republicans that the surplus dollars should be returned with permanent ongoing tax relief so hardworking Minnesotans would have more money in their pockets every single paycheck, week after week, month after month, year after year. What this proposal does is it combines those ideas. It creates a bipartisan solution to return the taxpayer dollars back to the taxpayers. And I think it's important to remember why does the state of Minnesota have this massive budget surplus? Why does the state of Minnesota have a $19 billion surplus, $17.5 billion when you account for inflation? Well, members, it's very simple. The state has a massive budget surplus because the state is over-collecting from the taxpayers. Had this proposal been law, at the time of the November forecast, taxpayers, individual taxpayers, filing a single return would have received $2,550 back. Joint filers would have received $5,100 back. Members, $5,100 for Minnesota families, $2,500 for Minnesota individuals. The Minnesota refund program does one thing. It gives the people their money back. I urge a yes vote. Senator Ress to the A4 amendment. Um, <clears throat> thank you, um, Mr. President. I am going to um, urge members to uh, vote no, unsurprisingly. Um, but I do think it's important for us to have the information about about the um, reserve accounts, how it's to be uh, used based on um, based on um, 
uh, our cash surplus that we have in November. And um, we have a, um, a list of priorities for how any kind of surplus is to be used. Uh, first and foremost, to the um, cash flow account. Secondly, uh, and that's only, um, it, and that has to be funded until it reaches $350 million. Secondly, that the budget reserve account is staff that is established until that account reaches $2 billion and $377,399. And then there are uh, uh, numbers going on where um, there's an obligation to um, uh, uh, increase aid payments to uh, schools. That's number three. Um, then to uh, reduce property tax, property tax revenue recognition shift, um, which um, those members of ours, um, both sides who serve on the Education Finance Committee know about. Um, uh, number five is no longer needed, but it's still in the language. Um, and then um, the, um, and then, and this is something that I think is popular to any number of people. Certainly, um, Senator Westrom had a bill to eliminate completely the, uh, he had a bill to do that, the uh, June accelerated sales tax liabilities. And I know that uh, Senator Rasmussen was, I believe, was, among others, was interested in that as well. Um, but. Uh, setting up a, uh, a refund program like this, um, I don't believe is um, it, it's necessary. I don't think that it improves the lives of any Minnesotans necessarily. It is a uh, it's a promise, and of course, um, we uh, thrive on promises. Um, what we don't thrive on, however, and this is just a, a minor uh, complaint. Um, Senator Miller, is that we do not in the Senate put purpose statements in any bill. And I am really disappointed that you have Section 7 in your, um, your bill. Um, I do understand um, the, uh, the uh, sincere um, desire to make sure that we do have um, funding in the in the future to um, uh, reach out to Minnesotans and recognize the sacrifices that they make as they earn money and uh, want to uh, derive benefits from it. But um, uh, um, respectfully, this is not the way. Please vote uh, no, and I request a roll call and. Uh, in particular, as well, I request and, and impose a call of the Senate. Uh, roll call requested and the roll call granted. And Senator, did you impose a call of the Senate? The Senate is now under call. Huh? And Senator uh, Russ, I'd just like to clarify, do you want it for the rest of the bill or just for this amendment? Rest of the bill. Thank you. Members, as a friendly reminder for those who are coming in, the Senate is under call for the rest of the bill. <laughs> Senator Bowden. Thank you, Mr. President. I report that Senator Dietzik votes. Yes. Uh, just under call, so you're okay. Senator Russ. Uh, 
Mr. President, I move that further proceedings under the roll call be dispensed with and the sergeant be instructed to bring in the absent members. On that motion, all in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Senator uh, Miller. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, Senator Rest mentioned a number of obligations uh, that are already in current. I'm sorry, Senator Miller. I will let you go last because I want to make sure that you have an opportunity okay. to, to react to any and all uh, uh, issues that are raised. I was hoping I was last, Mr. President. Uh, any other discussion before we let the author of the amendment go last? Senator uh, uh, Marty. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Russ said pretty well a lot of the points. This is a bad way to write public policy. Conditional appropriations, you know, the state budget does go up and down. Revenues come in and we have surpluses, then we have deficits. And when you make a decision like this, it's a fad of the moment. We're going to put on this Senator Miller's proposal. I think others would say we should do it for nursing homes and so on. But if you decide that if there's a year when times are better and there's some revenue in the bank and you decide, well, we're going to put it out this way, and then a couple months later you have a deficit and we've got some problems. Our nursing homes haven't been met yet. I don't think, I think that had overwhelming number of people who thought we need to do more for nursing homes. Well, you're going to take the money away from it ahead of time, but this is a really lousy way to set budgets. I would urge members to reject it just because it's not a good way to make budget decisions. Seeing no other discussion, we're going to the author of the amendment, Senator Mer uh, Miller. Thank you, Senator Miller. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Ress had mentioned uh, a number of obligations that are in current law already uh, that must be fulfilled uh, when the November forecast is released, and the Minnesota refund program would only go into effect after those other obligations are met. And um, there was also a comment about whether or not this would be meaningful for taxpayers. I think a, a, a rebate of $2,550 for single filers and $5,100 for joint filers would be a meaningful amount uh, for the taxpayers of Minnesota. And I will end with this. If, um, if, if Senator Rest would, would be uh, supportive of the amendment, I would, I would certainly be happy to uh, remove the, the statement that uh, she mentioned if that changes her mind on the, on the amendment. I urge a yes vote. The secretary will take the roll on the A4 amendment. Members, please vote. Senator Bowden, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. I report that Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Dietzik votes no. And Senator May Quaid votes no. Senator May Quaid votes no. Senator Rasmussen, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Abler votes aye. Senator Abler votes aye. Senator Anderson votes aye. Senator Anderson votes aye. Senator Howe votes aye. Senator Howe votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. And Senator Lang votes aye. And thank you, Mr. President. Senator Liskey votes aye. Senator Liskey votes aye. All senators having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There have been 30. We are under call members. All members must vote. We are now waiting for Senator Westrom.
Mr. President. Uh, Senator Ress. I move that those members not voting be excused from voting. Would you like to withdraw your motion asking for the others to come in? He's here. I uh, withdraw my motion. Motion withdrawn. How does he want to vote? Aye. There being 33 ayes. Oh, all senators haven't voted. Who desires to vote? The secretary will close the roll. There being 33 ayes and 34 noes, the A4 amendment is not adopted. Senator Jaskowski. Thank you, Mr. President. You know, members, I uh, go home and talk to my constituents about what's going on here at the Capitol. We've got $19 billion over collection of their money. The first thing we saw happen here, Mr. President, in terms of budgetary policy is that after the February forecast, the majority decided to plow 1.5 billion of that 19 billion into the future budgets uh, across um, the different uh, budget areas in state government. And so the first thing that happened is a 1.5 billion was spent. Um, since then, with all of the huge bills to spend all of these piles and piles and piles of the people's money that's accumulated here, we've seen in the neighborhood of 10 or more billion dollars of additional tax increase proposals coming forward. And that includes um, a $1.2 billion over four-year proposal in this bill. We just saw another one uh, that Senator Kupak just brought a, an amendment for another uh, $1.6 billion tax increase. Um, they are popping up all over. Minnesotans, Mr. President, are becoming very frustrated with almost the willy-nilly approach that this legislature has brought to uh, uh, go after their money. Uh, the people of Minnesota are fleeing this state and they are seeking relief. Uh, Mr. President, I bring the A6 amendment to start to bring some of that relief for them. Senator Jaskowski offers the A6 amendment. The secretary will report the A6 amendment. Senator Draskowski moves to amend House File Number 1938 as amended pursuant to Rule 45 as follows. Page 34 after line 7, insert. This is the A6 amendment. Senator Draskowski, to your A6 amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, A6 amendment is simply uh, requires a two-thirds vote of members of each House of the Legislature in order to increase the income tax in Minnesota. And so it's very specific. The people of Minnesota are seeking budgetary refuge from this legislature, Mr. President. And we already have in, the people of Minnesota have already placed in their constitution uh, several provisions that require two-thirds vote. This does not uh, attempt, Mr. President, to place it in the constitution, but into statute. Uh, but I'll read those ones that are already in our Constitution. I believe there might be some in statute as well, though I haven't, I haven't compiled them yet for the body. Uh, the first one is reporting of bills and the uh, requirement for two and three readings of each bill. Uh, the ability to create an urgency requires, Mr. President, a two-thirds vote according to our Constitution. To override a governor's veto requires a two-thirds vote of each body of the legislature. Uh, certainly an urgency there needs to be uh, displayed or exhibited or uh, determined in order uh, to override a governor's veto and a two-thirds vote is appropriate there. Passing general banking laws to change the bank general banking laws of our state, Mr. President, requires a two-thirds vote and the the wisdom of the people of our state to not allow them to be willy-nilly uh, changed uh, in order to um, protect the people of Minnesota from a legislature that may uh, find themselves to be out of control with other people's money, with the, with the money of the people of our state. Um, to revise the Constitution, Mr. President, requires a two-thirds vote and uh, 
in the impeachment powers that's granted in the legislature requires a two-thirds vote um, passed in the Senate in order to impeach a public official. Those are examples of things we already have, Mr. President, in our Constitution. The people of Minnesota cannot believe, Mr. President, what this legislature is attempting to do to them in the threshold, as we've seen on the board over and over, one vote threshold, one vote uh, that the Democrats have over the Republicans each time is the simple threshold that is currently required in law in order to increase taxes. And we've seen all these tax increase proposals. We don't know what else is in front of us. This, Mr. President, is the best way that I can find to help us protect the people of Minnesota from a, a legislature that is out of control with the people's money. I encourage a green vote on the amendment and ask for a roll call vote. Thank you, Mr. President. Roll call request a roll call granted. Senator Klein. Well, thank you, Mr. President. I urge uh, members to vote no on the A6 amendment. Uh, continue to hear proposals to handicap the individual powers of future legislators and future senators who uh, have been elected to this chamber. Uh, continue to hear amendments that would limit our capacity as a legislature to respond to fiscal crises uh, quickly and shrewdly uh, should we face a deficit in the, in the future or another uh, state emergency. And uh, so I, this is, a, this is a, a bad amendment and I encourage a red vote roll call. Any additional discussion on the A6 amendment? Before we go to the author for any final comments, Senator Jaskowski. Thank you, Mr. President. And um, you know, I heard um, I heard Senator Klein's argument, and um, certainly, Mr. President, Senator Klein, members, if indeed there is an urgency that there is a deficit, and that that is the only option, uh, we certainly should be able to pull together two-thirds votes. In, indeed, if it truly is needed. If that threshold is not arrived at, Mr. President, then there are other solutions to the problem. And this legislature, I trust in their wisdom, will find their way through that. The people of Minnesota need relief from the out of control spending nature of this legislature, Mr. President, that has not already spent $19 billion of their over collected money on the corn pile here in St. Paul, but it's a, a, attempting as well to spend another $10 billion uh, that are yet to be collected from them. Uh, the people of Minnesota are fleeing this state. They're going to Florida and Texas, South Dakota, Arizona, and other places to seek refuge from the overtaxation and the lack of respect that this legislature has for the wallets of the hardworking people of Minnesota. We need to pass this in order to protect them. I encourage your support and a green vote. Thank you, Mr. President. The secretary will take the roll on the A6 amendment. Senator Bowden, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. I report that Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Dietzik votes no. And Senator May Quaid votes no. And Senator May Quaid votes no. Senator Rasmussen, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Abler votes aye. Senator Abler votes aye. Senator Anderson votes aye. Senator Anderson votes aye. Senator Howe votes aye. Senator Howe votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. And thank you, Mr. President. Senator Liskey votes aye. And Senator Liskey votes aye.
All senators having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There have been 33 ayes and 34 noes. The A6 amendment is not adopted. Senator Housley. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, we've all talked about um, this summer and this fall when we were going door to door, everybody asking us, you know, what are you gonna do with this 17.5, now 19 billion uh, dollar surplus? When are you gonna give it back? We, we want it back. And the Senate Republicans offered the, the give it back uh, plan. Uh, and part of that was a child care tax credit. Um, it would be $620 per child with a maximum of $1,860 with a income phase out. And I want to thank Senator Rust for including that in this bill because it's, it's good. It helps families, uh, especially families that are struggling to make things meet, make ends meet. But um, in this bill, unfortunately, the, uh, the child tax credit sunsets. And so I have the A2 amendment, Mr. President. Senator Housley offers the A2 amendment. The secretary will report the A2 amendment. Senator Housley moves to amend House file number 1938 as amended pursuant to rule 45 as follows. Page 55, delete subdivision four. This is the A2 amendment. Senator Housley to your A2 amendment. Thank you again, Mr. President. Um, Removing the sunset, uh, it, is a, it is a good idea. It's an ongoing good idea. Uh, the legislature in the future can make changes if needed. There's nothing in there that will prevent them from doing that. And what this does, it provides certainty for families uh, who have young children all the way up to the age of 18. And it's the, it's the reasonable thing to do, Mr. President. And I'm hoping this is a friendly amendment because the sunset is unnecessary. And I ask for a green vote. Thank you. Senator Ress oh, to the you. A2 amendment. Thank you, um, uh, Mr. President. And I certainly share uh, Senator Housley's um, uh, wish that we wouldn't have to have a sunset, but the sunset is in the bill. And uh, I have to raise a point of order under 7.4. It violates um, our uh, target. And puts the bill under balance, out of balance with regard to um, um, the tails. Senator Ress uh, makes a point of order uh, under 7.4. Uh, any other advice? I'm going to talk to fiscal staff. I will return. Hold on, members. Thank you, members. Having uh, listened to advice and um, uh, reading the rules, I find uh, Senator Rest point well taken. Senator Coleman. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to offer the A41. Uh, Senator Coleman offers the A41 amendment. The secretary will report the A41 amendment. Senator Coleman moves to amend House File Number 1938 as amended pursuant to Rule 45 as follows. Page 13, after line 26, insert. This is the A41 amendment. Senator Coleman, to your amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. The A41 um, makes a slight reduction in the um, film tax or the film production tax credit, uh, but that'll make a lot more sense once I offer the A42 amendment to the amendment. Senator Coleman offers the A43 amendment, A42. Sorry about that, Senator Coleman. Uh, your amendment to the amendment. The secretary will report the A42 amendment to the amendment. Senator Coleman moves to amend the A41 amendment to House File Number 1938 as follows. Page one after line 12, insert. This is the A42 amendment to the amendment. Uh, Senator Coleman, to your amendment to the amendment. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Members, what this amendment to the amendment does is it takes that uh, slight reduction in the tax credit and reallocates it to something that I think would go a long way with growing Minnesota families, and that's in two different parts. The first part puts a sales tax exemption on a greater number of baby products. I hear all the time from fellow mothers and growing families that bringing new children, one or two at a time, can be quite expensive, so this adds things like baby wipes, cribs and baths bassinets, um, changing tables, strollers, car seats, all of that fun stuff, adds that to the list of baby products that are uh, exempt from sales taxes. The other portion of the amendment to the amendment allocates a, number, a portion of those funds for a one-week sales tax holiday in August for school supplies. Uh, that's something I get emails and calls about from constituents all the time around that time of year. Oh my goodness, it is so expensive to send my child to school. The school supplies are getting out of control. And this seeks to provide a little bit of relief for those families that are purchasing those products at that time of year. Uh, members, just for a status update, this did similar language was adopted in the other body. And I would encourage a green vote uh, and request a roll call on the amendment to the amendment. Uh, Senator uh, Coleman, only on the amendment to the amendment, or would you like a roll call on the underlying amendment as well? Uh, so a roll call requested and a roll call granted on the A42, which is the amendment to the amendment, as well as the underlining A41 amendment. Senator Ress. So, um, uh, Mr. President, um, my intent, um, Senator uh, Coleman, is to divide the amendment, um, the A42. Um, uh, at line 113 uh, to 125. That would be one part and then the other um, above that. And <clears throat> I'm searching for, uh, so which one do we, are we taking up first here? Let me ask the, the author of the amendment, would you like, uh, which part would you like done first, Senator Coleman? Thank you, Mr. President. I suppose the first half regarding baby products. All right. So the first half, which, uh, so I'll let the, the uh, secretary report the first half, which is going to be uh, under consideration first. So. Um, Hold on, Senator uh, Rest. The, the secretary is going to report the division. Senator request, uh, Senator Rest has requested a division of the A42 amendment um, as follows. The first part will be from lines 1.3 to 1.11 of the A42 amendment to the amendment. And Mr. President, who, Senator gets, Rest. who gets to decide um, what part is voted on first? It is my understanding the author of the amendment gets to decide, and she's decided. She the author of the amendment, uh, Senator Coleman. And she decided that she wants um, the first part, which is lines, uh, which was, which is what was reported by the secretary. That would be the first part. So we're voting on lines one five through one eleven. It's my understanding it's one three, one point three okay. to one point one one. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. I wonder if um, uh, Senator Housechild would yield. Uh, Senator Housechild, will you yield? He will yield. Senator Coleman, I mean, uh, Senator Ress. Um, Senator Housechild, you know I'm, um, I'm partial to um, lines, this section two through one nine, but it also um, uh, affects a provision that you already have in the bill, and I, I'm wondering um, what would you advise? Senator Hotschild, to the question. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Rest. Um, well, I've got a baby at home. <laughs> I know the cost of, of uh, caring for a baby. Um, while I love the film tax credit, it's my bill, and I think it's important for economic development in our state. I also understand Senator Coleman's concerns with affordability for our family, so I would accept this. Senator um, So, um, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Um, President, Senator Coleman's um, amendment, um, I would urge members, and I think we have a roll call to vote green on the first part 
section two, uh, slides 1.3 to 1.11. Any questions on what you're voting on at this point? Seeing none, the secretary will take the roll on the first part of the amendment. Members, please vote. Senator Rasmussen, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Abler votes aye. Senator Abler votes aye. Senator Anderson votes aye. Senator Anderson votes aye. Senator Howe votes aye. Senator Howe votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. And thank you, Mr. President. Senator Liskey votes aye. And Senator Liskey votes aye. Senator Bowden, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. I report that Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Dietzik votes aye. And Senator May Quaid votes aye. And Senator May Quaid votes aye. Senator Carlson, are you going to vote? Senator Carlson. All senators having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 67 ayes and zero noes, the amendment to the amendment, the first part, is adopted. We are now members, just so that we're all in the right place, we are on the second part of the A42. And the secretary will report the second part um, uh, of the division. The second part of the A42 amendment is from lines 1.12 uh, to 1.29. Uh, Senator Klein. Thank you, Mr. President. Will Senator Coleman yield? Senator Coleman, will you yield? She will yield. Uh, Senator Klein. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. I wonder if Senator Coleman has a revenue estimate or any sense of the cost of the sales tax holiday herein proposed. Senator Coleman, to the question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I knew the total amount was what was in for both portions was what was in the underlying amendment. If I could have a brief moment, I could get an official amount uh, for the, just the second portion. Uh, Senator Coleman, we will give you time. Senator Klein, while she's doing that, um, are you requesting a roll call vote on on the amendment? Roll call requested, Senator. Uh, Mr. Okay. President. Roll call requested. Roll call granted. Senator Coleman. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, just to get back to that original question, for the second part of this amendment for the sales tax holiday, it is about 1.6 million for that one week uh, between August 21st or August 15th and August 21st to have a sales tax exemption on items such as book bags that are less than $60 or school supplies having a retail price of 15 or less per item. Any other, any other discussion? Senator Ress. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Well, I'm going to be urging members emphatically to vote no. Um, we've been, um, this state has been friends to retailers for um, a number of years. When we, 20 years ago, dream, uh, joined the Streamline uh, uh, sales tax agreement and worked very, very hard with them, uh, Republicans and Democrats alike, to um, support marketplace fairness, that um, people buying products in the state of Minnesota, um, they know that they're going to get charged a sales tax. When um, previously, um, before we adopted that, um, uh, Minnesota retailers were at a, a great disadvantage because people could go to Amazon or um, other online or catalog uh, companies and purchase something, and the um, th that seller would claim that no tax was was uh, due in Minnesota because they didn't have nexus, they didn't have a, a physical presence. Um, so we worked very hard with the retailers to um, uh, uh, overturn that that um, particular um, provision uh, that had been decided. 
um, a number of years ago in, um, by the Supreme Court um, that um, recognized the right of uh, uh, the state of Minnesota and every state for that matter to um, uh, claim um, rightly that sales tax was owed um, on products even if they were purchased online. Uh, so we are friends in Minnesota with retailers. However, what happens in this and the sales tax holidays um, are under certain circumstances, and I'm assured by our fiscal staff that this amendment um, satisfied the sales tax, uh, the uh, streamline uh, definitions. But imagine um, this would not be collected from uh, midnight, essentially, uh, starting on August 15th. So you have a pad of paper, you know, a notebook, and it costs a dollar. And the state tax in Minnesota is 6.85, so it's going to be $1.07. Um, the day before this would take place, the dollar would be paid to the retailer, and seven cents would go uh, for sales tax. The next day, um, oh, the price changed. And all of a sudden, the price that had been, the price now that had been a dollar, all of a sudden becomes a dollar seven. So what is the impact of that? Is there any savings to a consumer at all? No, it's just where that seven cents goes. Does that seven cents go to um, supporting general purpose government, including schools themselves. Um, uh, it does not. Um, the dollar seven goes to, um, to the retailer. And it is, um, uh, it is, it's one of those uh, policies that sometimes when it gets started in a state, even when people are confronted with the fact that they're not getting any products cheaper, um, there's just on their little slip of paper it says no sales tax, but the product costs the same. So there's no savings. There's no savings to um, uh, the consumer at all. It's just where the dollar seven goes. Please vote red. And I believe there is a roll call requested on this per portion. That, that is correct. Before we go to the author, I want to make sure there's no one else before the author. Senator Upke. Thank you, Mr. President. And as a former retailer, I would have to totally disagree with the last statement. Um, in the store, yes, we collected sales tax, but we just passed that through. The whole idea of retailing, we're all driven to sell more. And I'm not going to worry about the seven cents. I'm going to worry about selling more items. So I, I don't believe there's any retailers that would do that. They're all about marketing and selling, and to use that as the reason for not uh, supporting this, I believe, is totally wrong. So please support this amendment. Thank you. Senator S. Thank you. With all due respect, the research shows um, uh, the opposite in those states that routinely have sales tax holidays. And again, I'm a strong supporter of our retailers and it worked really, really strong, strongly for uh, marketplace fairness for retailers in Minnesota, and that would include um, the, uh, uh, the uh, businesses that Senator Utke is associated with. Senator Coleman, you get the last word as the author of the amendment. Senator Coleman. Thank you, Mr. President. I want to start by thanking Senator Rest for her support of the first portion of this amendment. Uh, members, we can debate about what retailers will or will not do if this were to pass, but what we should be debating is the principle of the matter and who we want to speak for here. I am you know, all in favor of retailers and agreements, and, and my heart goes out to them, but not more than it goes out to parents, particularly ones who struggle more than anyone in this chamber has ever had to that go to buy their students' school supplies, and they have to figure out where that cut comes from in their budget. Are we going to be eating cheaper, less nutrient-dense meals this week? Are we going to be looking at skipping some sports this year because our school supply bill was too much? Are we going to be turning the lights off a little bit earlier? Th those are realities that Minnesotans face. And if there's anything that this body can do, 
to help them, we should absolutely be doing everything in our powers to help growing families, particularly those that just want to send their students to school with affordable school supplies. And I believe this amendment will do a little part to help accomplish that, and I would encourage a green vote. The secretary will take the roll on the amendment, the second part of the amendment to the amendment. Senator Rasmussen, those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Abler votes aye. Uh, Senator Abler votes aye. Senator Anderson votes aye. Senator Anderson votes aye. Senator Howe votes aye. Senator Howe votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. And thank you, Mr. President. Senator Liskey votes aye. Senator Liskey votes aye. Senator Bowden for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. I report that Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Dietzik votes no. And Senator May Quaid votes no. Senator May Quaid votes no. Members, please vote. All senators having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 33 ayes and 34 noes, the amendment to the amendment is not adopted. <laughs> Members, as a, as a gentle reminder, we are on the underlining A41 amend, uh, amendment as amended. Any questions? Any discussion? Senator Rest. Um, uh, Mr. President, I wonder if um, Senator Coleman would yield for a question. Senator Coleman, will you yield? She will yield. Senator Coleman, uh, uh, Senator Rest. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President and Senator Coleman. So the A41 um, does not refer to the, uh, the sales tax holidays. Is that correct? It only references the uh, baby products? Is that your understanding or? Um... Senator Coleman to the question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. It's my understanding that the amount here was to cover both portions of the original A42 amendment. Senator Riss. So Mr. Um, uh, Mr. President, I would want to amend the um, A41 to reflect only the transfer of costs between the um, fill production credit and the um, and the baby products, and I'm going to need um, some help with that from our fiscal staff. If you would give me a moment, I will. Senator Rest, take a moment. Um, the fiscal person is Mr. President and Senator Coleman. Um, they're working on getting the, the numbers right. If you once again would just, and I think it can be an oral amendment because it's just going to be changing the numbers to reflect the work of the baby products. So we'll wait a moment. Thank you. Mr. President. Senator Ress. Um, and I will pass this forward to um, Senator Coleman as well, but on page one, line eight, strike four million six hundred and forty thousand and insert five million eight hundred thousand. That's my oral amendment. The secretary will report the oral amendment. Senator Rest moves to amend the A41 amendment as follows on page one, line eight, delete 4,640,000 and insert 5,800,000. Senator uh, Rest. That's my motion. And Senator Coleman to the, to the oral motion. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I would accept this, and I just want to say that this is what I think a lot of people envision and hope for when they think of a bipartisan legislature working together, giving some, taking some, and I just want to thank Senator Rest again for her acceptance of this and working with me on this. And because there has been a roll call requested, oh, well, not on the oral amendment. All those in favor of the oral amendment say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails and the oral amendment is adopted. Now we are on the A41 as amended. Any other discussion? Senator Ress. Um, thank you, um, Mr. President and Senator Coleman. And I also want to express um, my appreciation for the graciousness of Senator um, Housechild. Uh, it is my intent to work equally hard to keep the film production credit which is uh, also in the other body, um, as well as the sales tax exemption on, on, um, on baby products. They are not, um, they're not rivals for one another. They're both, they're both good ideas, and um, I want to just make sure that the body knows that and that the enthusiasts for the film production credit appreciate also um, the grace of uh, Senator Housechild. Thank you. Any other discussion, Senator Coleman? Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Ress. That reminds me to also thank Senator Housechild for working with us on this. I was a, a co-author on the film production provision last go around, and so I certainly see the importance of this uh, and appreciate us all working together. Thank you, Green Vote. The Secretary will take the role on the A41 amend amendment as amended. Senator Rasmussen, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Abler votes aye. Senator Abler votes aye. Senator Anderson votes aye. Senator Anderson votes aye. Senator Howe votes aye. Senator Howe votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. And thank you, Mr. President. Senator Liskey votes aye. Senator Liskey votes aye. Senator uh, Bowden, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. I report that Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator, say it again. Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Dietzik votes aye. And Senator May Quaid votes aye. And Senator May Quaid votes aye. Members, please vote. All senators having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There have been 67 ayes and zero noes. The amendment is adopted. <laughs> Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President. I will offer the A81 amendment. Senator Lucero offers the A81 amendment. The secretary will report the A81 amendment. Senator Lucero moves to amend House File Number 1938 as amended pursuant to Rule 45 as follows. Page 111, line 14, delete 517,200 and insert. This is the A81 amendment. Senator Lucero to your A81 amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. I will ask for a roll call. Roll call requested, roll call granted. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, while this is being distributed, I will uh, obviously wait for it to get into the hands of Chair Rest. And I'm hoping that this would actually be looked upon potentially favorable, in which I could withdraw the, the roll call. So members, what this is addressing is the homestead exclusion dollar amount. In present law, it is approximately 413,000. The bill before us raises that threshold to 517,200. And what this amendment seeks to do is change the 517,000 up to 650. So effectively, it would increase the threshold for the exclusion from the current 413,000 
to 650,000. Now, Mr. President, why is that important? Well, we've seen all across the state an explosion of home values. And many of the home values that have increased are on people that are not wealthy. Prices have gone up by double digits year over year in terms of value. And there are many, many middle-income families across the state that have home values that have well exceeded that threshold. And it's obviously recognized by this, by increasing the dollar amount in the underlying bill. But it, it isn't enough, the, the proposed dollar amount that's in there. Last week, we discussed the housing bill, Mr. President. And in, the, in that discussion, I highlighted the fact that right now in uh, 2023, as of March of 2023, the price of new construction single family home the median price was 523,000 523,000 is above even the proposed language in this bill so what i'm seeking to do is just recognize that even though there is an increase in the bill it doesn't even reach the median price of new construction single family homes so raising it to 650 will help out those families mainly that it might be on fixed income just because you have a house that's $517,000 doesn't mean you're wealthy. Because people that have been in their homes for perhaps three decades, the value of their home has gone up as they've just tried to live their life. And it's important that we recognize that. Furthermore, Mr. President, I did confer with nonpartisan fiscal staff, and they confirmed that changing this dollar amount actually is a savings to the state. So it would not, I deliberately crafted this amendment so it would not be out of order with the bill so that this hopefully would be considered friendly. So with that, Mr. President, uh, I encourage a, a support for this. Any other discussions on the, the 881 amendment? Senator Klein. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Lucero. And, and these are difficult uh, drawings, uh, lines to draw. I appreciate this was my provision, increasing the market value exclusion for you know higher value properties. We do know, as Senator Lucero said, that the value, property values have increased substantially and our old numbers are obsolete. So what number do you choose you know, to sort of provide this exclusion for? Um, my number was $517,000 for a property evaluation, homestead evaluation assessment. Uh, the one that he is proposing is $650,000. I don't think there's a black and white answer uh, as to which one of those numbers is correct. What I will say is that the higher you go, while the numbers do balance, and he's correct that the, the revenue uh, impact of this is neutral, uh, the, every time you increase this number for homestead value exclusions, you shift onto other properties. And in this particular case, you shift onto the commercial industrial property uh, tax base in your, in your community. Uh, you know, and and th that's a group that has been petitioning us at the Capitol this year that their, their uh, property taxes are already too high. Those are the small businesses in our communities. Uh, and uh, I guess this, the effect of the A81, if adopted, would be in fact a tax increase, property tax increase on commercial industrial properties, small businesses in our communities. So I'm going to uh, ask members to vote red. Any other discussions? Senator Rest. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. President. I would direct people's attention to members' attention to the uh, spreadsheet that will give um, the um, uh, provide the indicators that um, uh, Senator uh, Klein is talking to. And, and as a matter of fact, when I saw the uh, trying to find it on the spreadsheet, when I thought when I saw uh, the reduction in property tax refunds by increasing the amount of the um, market value exclusion, I said, oh my goodness, I don't know what it was, it was like um, $13 million to the good that would be available to spend on other things. And I said, well, $517,200 uh, uh, um, I said, why not $700,000? And <laughs> Um, the fiscal staff kind of um, gasped and said, you can't imagine not only will um, that burden shift on to commercial industrial property, it also is going to shift on to lesser valued property. 
And that may seem counterintuitive, but as soon as I heard that, I said to myself, um, well, I do absolutely inc uh, support increasing it, but that 517,000 um, was reasonable at this point, given the values that are increasing and the um, and giving some sort of of relief, because some of those values, of course, even though they're in the marketplace, they also um, are um, uh, uh, impacted by by inflation. So um, I, um, I also joined Senator Klein in asking for um, a red vote, but certainly supporting the sentiment of Senator Lucero. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Any other discussion before we go to the author, before we vote? Seeing none, Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President. And I do sincerely thank uh, uh, you, Senator Klein, and Senator Ress, because, yeah, this is, it's not an intention to, to at all be uh, partisan in any way, but there, there are real people that are, are being impacted. And I do appreciate uh, the remarks on who might pick up the shift in, in having to pay for the property tax. But here's the other variable that I'll add in as a counter to that, a friendly counter. And as I mentioned it in a previous amendment uh, already, is that the value of commercial industrial as a, as a result of the pandemic has decreased. The value, the taxable value of buildings across the state has decreased because the pandemic forced these, the, the owners of these buildings to not be able to command as much income in rent. And because in, rental income is a direct result of the value of commercial industrial, the taxable value went down. That happened all across the state. So taxes payable this year for ta value established January 1st, the previous year. So January 1st, 2022, for taxes payable beginning January 1st of 2023, a shift had already occurred from commercial industrial over to residential. And so the residential is already picking up more of that burden, less burden on commercial industrial as a result. And so what this is going to help to accomplish by raising that threshold is shift a little bit back to the commercial industrial. And so the, the, the net result of that, sh that shift from commercial to residential is that homesteads and residential uh, families have had to pick up more of the tax burden. The other thing I'm just submitting for hopeful reconsideration, Mr. President, is the fact that even at the new $517,200 number, that is still less than the median price right now, which is 523,000. So that's why I'm submitting for consideration that the 517,200 is not enough. It doesn't even get us up to the middle. Therefore, we're gonna have to revisit this. And so the current 413,000 that's in law, it's my understanding that was set in 2012. So from 2012 to 2023, the value's been at 413,000. What has been the average price in val I'm sorry, value increase in homes from 2013 to the present, or 2012 to the present? It's substantially more than the 24% increase from the 413 to the 517200. Mr. President, I know for nerds in here, like myself, all these bantering about of the numbers uh, make sense. And I know that this is causing the eyes of many to, to glaze over, but the reality is 413,000 set in 2012, proposed to increase to 517,200 in 2023 represents an approximate 24% increase. Even at that 24% increase, it is still less than the 523,000 median price of new home single family construction. Moreover, from 2012 to 2023, home values have dramatically increased more than the 24% that the, five, the, that the 413 to 517 represents. That's why I'm submitting the 650. 
So with all that, Mr. President, I am hoping that Senator Ress, Senator Klein, others would re reconsider because I admit it is a gray area. There's no hard and fast uh, threshold to set, but we definitely need to be higher than the 517-200. Thank you, Mr. President. The Secretary will take the roll on the A11 A81 amendment. Senator Bowden, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. I report that Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Dietzik votes no. And Senator McQuaid votes no. And Senator McQuaid votes no. Senator Rasmussen, those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Abler votes aye. Senator Abler votes aye. Senator Anderson votes aye. Senator Anderson votes aye. Senator Howe votes aye. Senator Howe votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. And thank you, Mr. President. Senator Liskey votes aye. And Senator Liskey votes aye. All senators having voted, who desires to vote? The secretary will close the roll. There have been, th been 32 ayes and 33, 34 noes. The, uh, the A81 amendment is not adopted. Any additional um, amendments? Senator Weber. Thank you, Mr. President. I want to talk briefly about the worldwide reporting portion of the tax bill. For those who really don't know too much about it, I'm not going to try and do a tutorial of, of the tax process, but basically what is going to happen is that every company, whether they're headquartered in Minnesota or elsewhere, that does business in Minnesota will now need to report all of their income to the state of Minnesota. Many states have proposed this before and have abandoned that they have went to an optional situation whereby businesses can report it if they wish, if there's a way in which it will benefit them. But no other state, no other country makes it mandatory. I have included a letter on your desk today from the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce that talk about their opposition to this provision. The Council on State Taxation states that no other state in the U.S. or country in the world currently utilizes such a mandatory worldwide combined reporting to calculate corporate income tax. From the Tax Foundation, the mandatory worldwide combined reporting would dramatically increase the complexity and compliance costs for corporations engaging in business in Minnesota. There's a $1.2 billion estimate of additional income over the next four years, but even the Department of Revenue admits that they really don't know. It's too hard to compute. It may or it may not be right. 
Some people say, well, why should we worry about that? This just affects the big corporations. It affects those that have these big board of director rooms and the directors and what have you, and that's all they think about. But Mr. President, let me tell you what I think about when I think of a corporation. I think about the thousand workers in the city of Wyndham who within a month, if they don't find a buyer, may lose their jobs. And I think about the hundreds of other workers and those businesses that have been developed around that business to provide support services. And I think about the community as a whole and the downturn that such a loss will create. And the reality of it is, Mr. President, that business is currently owned by foreign interests. And in the agricultural processing businesses today, the prospective buyer for such a business could also very well be that with a foreign background. If we pass such a legislation, what are we doing to that business and to those workers as far as a potential new buyer? Or quite frankly, Mr. President, I think about the news story that came out yesterday or today about the 1,100 workers at 3M that are going to be laid off up here in the metro area. And quite frankly, that will have a negative impact on the community from which these people, in which these people reside as well. That is what I think of when I think about a corporation. And yet, what are we going to do? We're going to make it more costly for them to be involved in business in Minnesota, and we're going to cut down on the investment from these companies in the future. In tax committee, it was indicated to us that from 2015 to 2020, job creation went up 40% from companies with foreign investment, while the domestic job creation went down 3%. California, 30 years ago, tried this. But what happened was that the retaliatory moves of businesses in Japan and England and other countries made them soon realize that they could not afford to do this. And yet, we're going to try the same thing, Mr. President. With that, Mr. President, I offer the A-10 Amendment. Senator Weber offers the A-10 Amendment. The Secretary will report the A-10 Amendment. Senator Weber moves to amend House File Number 1938 as amended pursuant to Rule 45 as follows. Page 33, delete Section 23. This is the A-10 Amendment. Senator Weber to the A-10 Amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, what this does, it basically removes the worldwide uh, reporting provision of this bill, and I offer it to help our businesses and to help our workers in the state of Minnesota. Thank you very much. Senator Rest. Oh, Senator Dibble. I'm sorry. Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. If I could request a paper copy of the amendment. Oh. Oh. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. President, I re request a roll call vote. Roll on call this? requested, roll call granted. Senator Dibble to the A10. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Members, I would uh, request a, a red vote on Senator Weber's amendment. Uh, Mr. President, when I think of um, companies and corporations, I think of uh, small businesses, businesses owned by my friends and family, uh, medium-sized businesses in Minnesota that don't have this opportunity. Uh, they don't have the large uh, armies of accountants and lawyers who can set up these uh, shell companies in other countries for the purpose of attributing their sales and their profits to those companies and completely dodging the, the taxes that they would and should otherwise uh, pay in Minnesota. Uh, likewise, Mr. President, I think of uh, the hardworking people of Minnesota who work hard uh, and pay their taxes to pay for things like uh, education, schools, uh, things like roads, uh, bridges, uh, things like our health care system, things like uh, making sure our water is clean and our air is clean and that we have a, 
a, a great place to live and do business and make profits. Uh, Mr. President, um, I'm perfectly comfortable uh, with Senator Weber and others going out and defending this practice uh, and uh, talking about why uh, these large multinational companies should be able uh, to uh, acquire uh, another company in another country and then claim that that's their company uh, and then uh, the sales and, and uh, profits that they earn in Minnesota uh, are they're somehow more special than the sales and the work uh, and the profit that's earned by those medium and small businesses uh, here in Minnesota that are working so hard and striving to create uh, a better place because that's exactly what's going on. We have uh, a number of these large companies, Mr. President, um, that have uh, a zero tax payment, uh, either federally or to the state, despite earning millions upon millions upon millions of dollars. And the claims that somehow uh, this is going to be uh, bad for business or chase, uh, 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 chase a, a businesses out of uh, Minnesota uh, is simply unfounded. That just simply means that businesses are not going to uh, sell. You know, it's really about, uh, about the sales that they have uh, and, and why I, I don't understand the rationale that somehow or another uh, businesses are going to simply pull up their stakes and, and not engage in profitable sales in the state of Minnesota because that's what this is really all about. Mr. President, this is actually much more simple than is being construed. First of all, this idea that these companies don't have the ability uh, to, to report on this income and these profits, they do that. They have these elaborate uh, departments and these armies of accountants uh, who track all of this stuff. So it's, it's already being done by them and so of course they can uh, simply uh, figure out what their overall sales are and what's attributable in a portion to Minnesota. They do that domestically already, so this is not a huge owner's problem. And the Department of, of Revenue has already uh, assured us that this is something that they can administer quite handily and, and quite easily. Um, but, Mr. President, um, I would like to uh, call attention uh, to Rule 7.4. I think this uh, uh, amendment is out of order. It's not balanced. Um, it uh, reduces uh, net revenue uh, w without a... Which, which, which one? Um, which paragraph? One moment, sorry. I'm, I'm trying, to trying to figure out exactly which chapter or which uh, paragraph. There are four elements of the Mr. President. Uh, uh, Senator Ress, um, Senator Dibble has the floor, so I have to let him have the floor unless there's a point of order. Okay. All right. Yes, so uh, sorry, Mr. President. Uh, so yes, this, uh, this amendment to an omnibus appropriation tax bill that is a Senate file on official engrossment is out of order because it reduces net revenue to a fund for a fiscal biennium without a corresponding reduction in net appropriations compared to the bill as re reported to the floor of the Senate. That's 7.4, paragraph 2. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Ress, any advice? Any additional advice? Give me a moment. I'll, I'll meet with fiscal. Having listened to advice and consulted um, uh, the rules, uh, Senator Dibble's point of order is well taken. S any other amendments? Senator Nelson. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I have the A11. Senator Nelson offers the A11 amendment, and the Secretary will report the A11 amendment. Senator Nelson moves to amend House File Number 1938 as amended pursuant to Rule 45 as follows. Page 21 after line 17, insert. This is the A11 amendment. 
I Senator thank you. Nelson, to your A11 amendment. Thank you, uh, Mr. President and members. Um, the A11 amendment is an election. The A11 amendment does what the few other states who are doing uh, mandatory worldwide reporting have opted to do. It is an election. The uh, multinational uh, corporations can choose to either do the worldwide mandatory reporting or to stick with our Minnesota tax law as it is. As was noted, there is no other state in the nation doing what is being required in the tax bill before us today. Not only that, members, there is no other country who is uh, proceeding with the mandatory worldwide reporting. And we had reports in the tax committee about calls already coming in from other embassies, uh, other countries, uh, speaking about this, how this can uh, upset uh, trade uh, and many other issues. So I would ask um, Mr. President uh, that uh, we vote, I would ask for a green vote on the A11, which merely allows an election of the mandatory worldwide reporting. There's about four other states who do that. It is not mandatory, but it's an election. It's a choice. Senator Dibble. Thank you, Mr. President. I think I heard Senator Nelson ask for a roll call. Is that correct? Uh, roll call. Requested roll call granted. Great. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, Mr. President, I would request a, a no vote on the Nelson A11. Um, the, the fact of the matter is, is that the uh, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development is working on a, a fairly major initiative. It's called the Domestic Tax Base uh, Erosion and Profit Sharing Initiative, BEPS. Um, and so, um, so, so, so this is, we're actually in keeping with the conversation that's going on amongst uh, about 135 countries. Uh, the simple fact of the matter is, is that's exactly what's happening. Um, this is uh, uh, eroding tax base. It's creating a, a profit shifting. Um, it's tax avoidance. Um, and it's, it's not onerous and it's not complicated. Uh, Mr. President, uh, this is something that, that is already done. Um, we do this sort of apportionment and attribution um, uh, already, uh, you know, within the confines of, of this country. Um, and this simply uh, says that uh, in those instances when uh, these uh, gimmicks and these shifts are used simply for the purpose of avoidance, uh, we're going to make sure that uh, that that dodge is not uh, supported. This is a um, you know, a policy choice that we had made in some years past, and, and it's, I think, perfectly within our prerogative and power uh, to make a different uh, policy choice, Mr. President. Thank you. Senator Klein. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. And I, once again, I'm going to raise a point of order under 7.4, and I'm sure you'll want to consult with Fiscal and Mr. Mum, but uh, it would be my impression that if we change this uh, revenue source to elective rather than mandatory, certain uh, industries will opt out of it and revenues will decrease, putting this bill out of balance. So I would ask you to rule the amendment out of order. So. Any other advice before I talk to Fiscal? Let me talk to Fiscal staff. Hold on. Thank you, members, for your patience. Having consulted, uh, first of all, having listened to advice and consulted the rules, um, I find the point of order is well taken. Uh, Mr. President? Uh, uh, Senator Nelson. Yes, um, I, I would um, appeal the rule of the chair 
And uh, Mr. President, I do want to uh, correct the record. If you start debating, you will not get your appeal. Uh, I'm just going to let you know that the rules don't allow it. No debating, but we'll correct the record li later. Yeah. Roll call requested. Roll call granted. Let me uh, I'll tell you exactly what is going on. An appeal from the decision of the president must be made immediately after your ruling, uh, you, and, and it was made immediate. Um, uh, uh, um, the question before the body is, shall the decision of the president be the judgment of the Senate under Rule 14, Senate Rule 14.4? Green vote upholds the decision of the president, and red vote to overrule the decision of the president. The secretary will take the roll. Senator Rasmussen, those, those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Abler votes no. Senator Abler votes no. Senator Anderson votes no. Senator Anderson votes no. Senator Howe votes no. Senator Howe votes no. Senator Lang votes no. Senator Lang votes no. And thank you, Mr. President. Senator Liskey votes no. Senator Liskey votes no. Uh, Senator Bowden, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. I report that Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Dietzik votes aye. And Senator May Quaid votes aye. And Senator May Quaid votes aye. All senators having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. Oh, Senator um, Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. President. Under Rule 40.7, uh, Senator Abler votes aye. Senator. Abler votes aye. Okay. Anything else? All senators haven't voted. Who desires to vote? The secretary will close the roll. There being 35 ayes and 32 noes, the, the decision of the president is upheld. Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, uh, I do not have an amendment that is a sweeping change from this particular bill. I do, however, have a clarification that I'd like to have included in the bill, and I'd like to introduce the A34 amendment. Senator Limmer offers the A34 amendment, and the secretary will report the A34 amendment. Senator Limmer moves to amend House File Number 1938 as amended pursuant to Rule 45 as follows. Page 137 after line 28, insert. This is the A34 amendment. Senator Limmer to your A34 amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, this amendment that's before us would clarify the use of some of the public safety aid provisions in the bill. Uh, as many people know, some of our smaller communities partner with other smaller communities for the purposes of public safety service. Uh, it could be a joint powers, well, it is commonly a joint powers agreement. And uh, this bill would specify and clarify that as this money is doled out, that those communities that have joint power agreements would be the recipient uh, of the funds. Uh, I spoke uh, last night with Senator Rest, uh, but I did not have the exact language for her to look at. And so, as an appeal to uh, the author, uh, we now have the written information before us, 
and I would ask that we accept this for those very few uh, organizations that have joint power agreements for their public safety uh, provisions. Uh, a little bit of a background, uh, some of these communities were relying on some of the funds from our COVID uh, money that came from the federal government. And yet, uh, they did not receive it despite the promises that were made and now that there's other funds that are being provided, they were hoping that they could at least be recognized uh, in this manner. So I uh, ask for uh, a reaction from uh, the author now that we have specific language before us. I would ask Senator Rest to yield. Senator, uh, Senator Lemmer, uh, ask Senator Rest to yield. Senator Rest, will you yield? Senator Lemmer asked you to yield. She said, yes, she will yield, Senator Lemmer. Senator, uh, Senator Lemmer. Well, I, I had already presented the question, but uh, I'll repeat it again. Uh, uh, Senator Rest, did you hear the question? I don't think she heard the question. Oh, okay. She did not hear the question. Senator uh, Lemmer. I was hoping that the uh, chair would uh, accept this language in order to clarify the direction of public safety aid uh, in the direction of those law enforcement and fire protection services that are formed under joint power agreement. Uh, this would direct that public safety aid uh, to them. And was hoping for a reaction, uh, Senator Rest, we did not have this language when I spoke to you last night and uh, now that we have it, I was hoping that it would be a little bit more clarifying for you. Senator Rest, to the question. Um, Mr. President, uh, um, no, I'm, I do not support this language. I do not believe that the um, county, tribal governments, or the local government units, um, according to the bill, the language that is in our bill, uh, the dollars of public safety aid go to them to make the best decisions about their communities as they possibly can. And it is independent of their joint powers agreement. They may indeed decide to share their distribution, but it is, um, I think it's, um, uh, it's overreaching to um, require them to uh, do that. And I would request um, uh, a, um, a red vote I believe a roll call has been, um, a roll call is now requested. Um, roll call requested, roll call granted. And um, I know Senator Limmer has the floor, but I'm hoping um, when he's uh, completed his comments that we could also hear, um, I would ask for Senator Gustafson to yield on the same issue, but I understand that Senator Limmer has the floor. Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Rest, thank you for that explanation. Uh, I wanted to make sure that you knew exactly what I was talking about last night because it was a very uh, loud and crowded room as we spoke about it, and I wanted to make sure that you saw the written uh, form of the request. Uh, I want to thank you for your answer and the direction that you're giving, and as a result of that, Mr. President, I will withdraw the A34 amendment. The A34 amendment is withdrawn. Any additional amendments? Senator Uckey. Oh, I'm sorry. Senator Uckey, I did tell Senator Hoffman that he was on the list next. I'm sorry. Uh, Senator Hoffman. And I'll come to you next, uh, Senator Uckey, I promise. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And, uh, Thank you to the good senator from the uh, from the western central part of Minnesota for uh, sitting back down. I uh, I was just on the phone with the uh, good senator from Anoka, wondering when this amendment was coming up, and I just wanted to get to you on a, Mr. President, uh, if I could get the A76 amendment up, I'd appreciate that. Senator Hoffman offers the A76 amendment. The secretary will report the A76 amendment. Senator Hoffman moves to amend House File Number 1938 as amended pursuant to Rule 45 as follows. Page 96, line 27, before low, insert A. This is the A76 amendment. 
Senator Hoffman, two year A, 76th Amendment. Thank you, Mr. President and, and members. This is a, a, a simple uh, transparency on the fact that there's an organization, when you're talking about tax credits in Section 42, the uh, organization that, uh, that uh, has made an agreement not to go with the AMI on, on one property that they have in the metro, but this just exceeds that to the other properties that it has in the metro under Section 42. So specifically, it's there under that Section 42 side of it, um, Mr. President. And I know many members of this body have uh, that type of uh, program within their districts, and this is something that's consistent with where the good senator from Anoka and myself and others in the North Metro, including the other body, wants to get uh, work. And we've worked with the Commissioner Ho about getting certain language that fits into this. It's just another attempt to do that. It's actually a pretty good attempt. And members, uh, help us keep this conversation going. Please vote yes on this. Thank you. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And if it hasn't been requested, I would request a roll call, please. Roll call. Request a roll call granted. Senator Duckworth. Would uh, Senator Hoffman yield for a question? Senator Hoffman, will you yield? He will yield. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Hoffman. <clears throat> uh, I just had time to peruse the amendment very briefly. So the question I have is, it looks like, does this, does this place a, a cap or a limitation on the amount uh, of, of which a property owner is able to increase their, their rental rate? Uh, Senator Hoffman, to the question. Mr. President and members, uh, for this particular uh, issuance, the answer is yes. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I appreciate it, and I appreciate Senator Hoffman's amendment. Um, I would have loved uh, a chance to learn a little bit more about it. It seems well intended. However, uh, I think given recent events and the way in which things have occurred in a certain city that has decided to do something similar, this seems much more limited, to be fair. Uh, but I think we've seen what restrictions on rental rates or violation of property owners' ability to charge what they deem necessary on properties, uh, what, what kind of impact or effects that can maybe have on the housing market. So I'm a little hesitant regarding this amendment due to that. Thank you. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd rise to a point of order under Rule 35, uh, germaneness, um, and happy to offer advice, Mr. President. Advice. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, this is really talking about housing policy uh, here in the tax bill and rent control. Uh, it also refers to housing finance agency, and so I, I think it's a, a substantially different subject than what we're debating here today. Advice, uh, Senator Hoffman. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. The advice is uh, Section 42, if you look up, anybody uh, understands the IRS tax provisions under Section 42, um, it, it gives those tax credits. This is specifically to the organization regarding their tax credits and how they are absolutely uh, utilizing those tax credits to take advantage of right, our elderly. And you guys have seen the papers on this one. Matter of fact, uh, Coon Rapids, uh, uh, Paras just did a whole piece on that, and when told they can rent according to the AMI, the average median income at 12.8%, and they raise those rents. We have people that are elderly living in these Section 42, which, by the way, that's a tax credited Section 42 under the IRS, which is 33% of that um, building property goes to it. So it's very germane to the issue because it's specifically only for those Section 42 housing establishments, as we've done here. And that's what we've been talking about all year, Mr. President. I think it's a good amendment. Any further advice? Senator, Senator Duckworth, uh, be, before I go to Senator Ress. Uh, Mr. President, I withdraw my request for a roll call. Roll call withdrawn. Senator Ress. Thank you, um, uh, Mr. President. I would. Um, ask Senator Hoffman to yield. I'm sorry, who? I would ask Senator Hoffman to yield, please. Uh, Senator Hoffman, uh, just for clarity, Senator Duckworth, you withdrew your roll call f on the point of order, is that right? On the underlying amendment. Okay. So
So, uh, uh, Senator Rez, do you have any advice? Because you cannot ask a member to yield when we're on a point of order. I'm sorry. I, I um, was getting information. I did not realize that. So I um, withdraw my request of Senator Hoffman until after you have ruled. Would you like to give advice on the point of order? No. A anyone else? After reading the rule and also after uh, seeking and listening to advice, the point of order is not well taken. <laughs> Members, before us is the A76. Any questions? And uh, Senator Ress. Me? Yes, Senator Ress. Um, Thank you. Um, I'm going to um, oppose this, and I ask members to um, oppose it. It doesn't. Uh, it doesn't look like it does anything to 4D, but indeed it does, and uh, council assures me of that. And um, that program um, is one that is highly respected for uh, low-income apartments, both for uh, developers and for. Um, renters themselves, and this would disturb that balance and disturb the provisions that we have in in the bill. Senator Hoffman had assured me that uh, it, earlier that it did not, but council informs me that indeed it does. So I would ask for a red vote. Uh, Senator uh, Arrest, I, um, are you asking uh, for a roll call? Because when you said a red vote, are you asking for a roll call or are we going to do a voice vote? vote? I'm sorry, I, didn't, I don't understand what you said. You asked for a red vote, and there's been no roll call requested. So I I'm see. asking if you roll are- Roll call. Uh, roll, roll call requested, roll yes, call granted. Sorry. I was getting the information, and I, I um, got distracted. I Sen apologize. Senator Hoffman. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And, and as we're looking at this, I, I do want to bring up a couple of points, Mr. President, if I may. Um, Please. Number one, uh, it is my understanding, talking to the other body, and I know, and I'll, and I'll quote the good senator from New Hope who says, um, we don't take advice from the other body. Let me be very clear about that. And I won't tell you who she is, but she's sitting right behind me. Um, the, and it's good advice. And so here's what I do know, Mr. President. I do not want to have a Senate position that's negative uh, as they're going into the conference committee, because I do believe that this issue that's in front of us, when you have an elderly person that is 75% of their income is on this rent to this company who took millions of dollars in tax credits from us. It's absolutely wrong. It, this is not Section 8. This is not, it, I don't believe it sits in 4D. I'm not going to ever win a debate with the good senator from New Hope in taxes because, by the way, that's one of her master's degrees, Mr. President. Did you know that? Along with Latin and a few bunch of other ones. And so with that, to the good senator from New Hope, I appreciate you talking to me on that. The advice that I was given from the other body, which is not consistent with what the advice that she's given, I want to withdraw my amendment and make sure that this conversation just does keep continuing on. So thank you. Senator Hoffman withdraws the A76 amendment. I'm going to Senator Uckey. Senator Uckey, thank you for your understanding that I'd already uh, uh, committed myself to call on Senator Hoffman. Senator Uckey. Thank you, Mr. President. Not a problem. Um, Mr. President and members, in the bill, Article 12, and starts on Section 5 is where I'm looking at. But Section or Article 12 is concerns the stadium reserve. Do you have a amendment that you'd like for us to fi find? I, I will shortly. Okay. Okay. Cool. Senator Rucky, sorry for uh, disturbing. Yep. Thank you. And uh, anyhow, with this, under that appropriation is for a secure perimeter. I question what that is all about and the fact that it's $15.7 million um, at the U.S. Bank Stadium, a stadium that was only built, what, seven years ago. Um, why is it needing additional security like that? Um, questions that come to mind is 
police support in the city of Minneapolis. They've had a lot of challenges over there. Um, defund the police, etc. I think we would be better off if we're going to do anything at all, spending money to support law enforcement um, so that we arrest the people that we're trying to protect the building from and uh, make sure that uh, we impose the proper penalties when they are arrested. Um, but that being said, I do have the A13 amendment that I would like to address. Senator Uckey offers the A13 amendment. The secretary will report the A13 amendment. Senator Rutke moves to amend House File Number 1938 as amended pursuant to Rule 45 as follows. Page 271, line 32, delete $15,700,000. This is the A13 Amendment. Senator Rutke, to your A13 Amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, members, uh, this is just going back to the numbers that were before us. The bill appropriates $15.7 million for a secure perimeter. This amendment is taking and removing $5 million from that amount down to $10.7 million. And with that, Mr. President, I would like to offer the A-15 to show you what we're going to do with that money. Uh, Senator Uckley offers the A-15 amendment. The Secretary will report the A-15 amendment. Senator Rutke moves to amend the A-13 amendment to House File Number 1938 as follows. Page 1 after line 3, insert. This is the A-15 amendment to the amendment. Senator Uckey, to your A-15 amendment to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, members, the $5 million that we would capture from the secure perimeter, um, I would like to take and use that as a one-time appropriation to the Border Cities Enterprise Zone program, and this is all taking place in fiscal year 2023. The Border Cities Enterprise Zone program provides businesses tax credits, which include property tax credits, debt financing credit on new construction, sales tax credit on construction equipment and materials, and new or existing employee credits. To qualifying businesses that are the source of investment, development, and job creation or retention in the Border Cities Enterprise Zone, the cities include Breckenridge, Dilworth, East Grand Forks, Moorhead, Ortonville, and the development zone of Taylor Falls. We need to better support our border cities as they are increasingly threatened by the much better tax climates of our neighboring states. The Border Cities Enterprise Zone Program acknowledges that reality. With this bill, the Democrat majority seems determined to make Minnesota even more of a tax outlier. We must do better. Please support our border cities in their struggle to survive and compete with their neighbors. I'm not in a border city, but I'm 90 miles from it, and I see what happens on a daily basis. We've seen reports that hit the news and uh, other types of uh, activities over the last numbers of months and years if you want to go back, but uh, most recently that just shows how uncompetitive we are. And we're just hoping to uh, help out these uh, border cities, make it a little bit easier for them to survive. Um, there's a lot of things I'd like to do down the road, but for right now, members, if we could do this one little bit, I think it's going to be a big benefit to them. So please support this amendment to the amendment. Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. President. And first, I would like to request a roll call. Roll call requested. Roll call granted. Thank you, Senator Rutke, for bringing forth the A-15 amendment. Members, I'd ask you to vote no on the A-15. The security fence is for just that security. This provides security to Minnesotans when they go to visit U.S. Bank Stadium. It is uh, funded this way for a reason and has uh, gone through the vetting process of the proposal, meaning this is the amount of money they need for the security portion only. And by the way, members, those of you that have heard about the plaza, that is not this proposal. This is simply, Mr. President, for those security needs. And I hope we can agree if there's one thing we want is to keep Minnesotans secure. As for the border cities, uh, we should be working to promote them, Mr. President, and to make ourselves competitive, but I would ask 
not with this amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator roll, roll call on both, Mr. President, the A15 and the A13. Thank you. You were reading my mind because I was getting ready to ask that clarifying question. So Senator Friends has requested a roll call on the A15, which is the amendment to the amendment, as well as the underlining A13 amendment. Senator Rasmussen to the A15. Thank you, Mr. President, and I appreciate Senator Uckey bringing this additional support for our border cities, and I'll be voting yes on this today because, Mr. President and members, the tax bill that we're going to be debating, the tax increases that we've seen in the transportation bill, the paid leave mandate that we're likely to see coming up before this chamber, all represents tax increases that put our border communities at a disadvantage. And the district that I represent borders both North Dakota and South Dakota. And if you take a trip up the Red River, you'll see that the communities on the North Dakota and South Dakota side are bigger and faster growing than on the Minnesota side. And that's not because the prairie is any fairer on that side of the river. It's because of Minnesota's tax and regulatory environment that is driving Minnesota families and businesses uh, to leave our state. And so if we're going to be putting all of these additional taxes on our border communities this session, Mr. President, I think the least we can do is to take a little bit of money and to put it into uh, a border city program that will help them uh, be just a little bit more competitive given all the other taxes that they'll be having to deal with this session. So I, I thank Senator Utke and I'll be look forward to voting yes on this amendment. Any other discussions on the A15 uh, amendment? Uh, Senator Rest. Um, thank you, Mr. President. I reluctantly um, rise to a, a point of order under germaneness, and I don't, I don't have um, my rule book in front of me. Um, I think that this amendment, even though it's spending money from one place to another, uh, the purpose of it is is widely um, different than the purpose um, of this bill. And I would ask you to rule, and I'm trying to find the germaneness issue. Uh, Senator Rest, you're raising a point of order, excuse me, a, a point of order under Rule 35.2, germaneness? That's correct. Any advice? Advice, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Rasmussen, advice? Thank you, Mr. President. I would respectfully ask that you find Senator Rest's uh, point of order not well taken for a few reasons. One is that the underlying amendment uh, is pulling you know, money that is essentially allocated in this underlying tax bill. Um, the A15 amendment that we're currently debating uh, is talking about um, tax reductions. It is dealing with deed, which is also uh, in this underlying bill. Um, Mr. President, if, if we found that the other point of order when we were talking about you know, the, the rent control and housing agency, if that was amendment was in order and germane to the bill, this one most certainly is. And so I'd ask you to find Senator Rest's point of order not well taken. Advice, uh, Senator Erke. Thank you, Mr. President. And basically um, what I've got is probably pretty much all been said, but just to the point, this program is administered by DEED, and DEED is included in this tax bill, and we're just taking money from one part to another. Everything is in this bill. We're, it should be ruled in order. So th thank Senator you. Senator Ress. Um, <clears throat> uh, Mr. President, I, um, I think the, um, the power is in uh, on the side of ruling that it is. Um, uh, the point of order is well taken. And just as one additional fact, um, this fence is a federal homeland security requirement, and um, I would suggest that we get other money to help the border cities. Thank you, Mr. President. Give me one moment.
after hearing advice and um, uh, reading rules and, and looking at the chapters, uh, the point of order is well taken. Mr. President. Uh, Senator Rasmussen. I appeal the ruling of the president and would request a roll call. Roll call requested, roll call granted. After, after the, um, an appeal from the decision of the president must be made immediately after your ruling, which was done. The question before the body is, shall the decision of the president be the judgment of the Senate pursuant to Senate Rule 14.4? A green vote upholds the decision of the president and a red vote to overrule the decision of the president. The secretary will take the roll. And remember, this is only on the amendment to the amendment, which is the A15, as far as my ruling. Members, please vote. Members, we are talking about the uh, appealing the decision of the president. That is what's on the uh, uh, board. Senator um, uh, Bowden, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. I report that Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Dietzik votes aye. And Senator May Quaid votes aye. Senator May Quaid votes aye. Senator Rasmussen, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Abler votes no. Senator Abler votes no. Senator Anderson votes no. And Senator Anderson votes no. Senator Howe votes no. Senator Howe votes no. Senator Lang votes no. Senator Lang votes no. And thank you, Mr. President. Senator Liskey votes no. And Senator Liskey votes no. Senator Bowden, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. I also report that Senator Port votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. All senators having voted who desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There have been 34 ayes and 33 noes. The decision of the president is upheld. <laughs> Members, just so that we're clear, we are now on the A13, which is the underlining amendment. Senator Mr. Uckey. Mr. President, uh, and because the A15 um, went, failed, I would withdraw the A13 because they no longer balance. The A13 is withdrawn. Any additional amendments? Senator Jaskowski. Thank you, Mr. President. I offer the A35 amendment. Senator Jaskowski, Jaskowski offers the A35 amendment. The secretary will report the A35 amendment. 
Senator Drazkowski moves to amend House File Number 1938 as amended pursuant to Rule 45 as follows. Page 137, line 19, delete to provide public safety, including but not limited to training programs. This is the A35 amendment. Senator Jaskowski, to your A35 amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, this um, brings an amendment to the eligible uses for the one-time public safety aid uh, members, which is on line 126 of the spreadsheet. Uh, this amendment applies to lines uh, it's on, on page 137 of the bill, 137.19 is the insertion of the amendment. It leaves alone uh, the decision making completely, leaves alone uh, the way the language is in the bill about decision making with the county or the tribal government making the decisions on how to spend the aid. But in the bill, members, is um, a description of what the intent of the aid is for in the eligible uses, and you'll see them uh, outlined expressly in the amendment uh, to provide for law enforcement agency recruitment, hiring, and retention of peace officers, uh, as defined in 626.84, which defines law enforcement agency and peace officers, both full-time and part-time. Um, peace officer training mandated under Chapter 626, uh, other personnel hired by law enforcement agencies, public safety equipment costs, or mental health support for law enforcement agency personnel. So belt and suspenders, if you will, Mr. President, uh, this tightens up the language and uh, uh, gives us, I think, a more focused approach so that um, the direction to counties and to tribal governments is um, more uh, specific and, and complete and gives them better direction on spending this truly for a law enforcement purpose. I also have, Mr. President, uh, yet even more focus, if you will, in, in uh, an amendment to the amendment that is an A36 amendment, Mr. Senator President. Senator Jaskowski offers the A36 amendment, which is an amendment to the amendment. The Secretary will report the amendment to the amendment. Senator Drazkowski moves to amend the A35 amendment to House File Number 1938 as follows. Page 1 after line 13, insert. This is the A36 amendment to the amendment. Senator Drazkowski, to your A36 amendment, which is an amendment to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. The A36 uh, provides one more piece of direction on eligible uses and inserts a paragraph D on line um, 28 of page 137, members, and it says a county, tribal government, or local unit is not eligible for aid under this section if the county, tribal government, or local unit reduced funding for peace officers in the preceding four years. So, Mr. President, in the past four years, we have uh, had a, a great deal of need for our, our peace officers and public safety in this state, and we have seen an inflationary period uh, that has provided for escalations of costs in businesses and certainly in government and local government is no doubt the case. And if indeed um, local governments are focusing on law enforcement and public safety needs uh, properly, I couldn't see where there would be a normal situation where they would actually decrease uh, the funding for um, for uh, peace officers in their jurisdiction. So, I encourage the uh, I encourage members to uh, vote green on this amendment to the amendment. And, Mr. President, I ask for a roll call on both the A36 amendment to the amendment and the A35 underlying amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Roll call requested. Roll call granted on both the amendment to the amendment and the underlying amendment. Senator Gustafson. Thank you, Mr. President. So this is a version of my bill. Um, it has changed slightly, but the idea is still the same. Minnesotans value public safety. Everybody in every neighborhood wants to have a safe community, a place where everybody feels safe. That's why we want public safety. We are not... Uh, we believe that that is a more broad and appropriate term for this bill. This amendment changes all of the hard work that we have done, um, and it uh, really goes against the, the idea of letting cities decide what public safety needs best suit them. So I would ask all members to vote no on this amendment. Thank you. Any additional discussion before we go to the author, before we vote? Seeing none, Senator Jaskowski. 
Thank you, Mr. President. I would just ask members for a green vote. Um, if uh, this, is, this is money that is directed towards public safety and a core of public safety, the core of public safety uh, should make certain that our peace officers for our local units of government, for tribal governments, have the resources they need in, in order to enforce the rule of law and to keep order in their communities. That's their, that's their function, Mr. President. And if we aren't focusing uh, $325 million in this bill properly towards that, uh, that means it's going for different uses. And um, uh, this makes certain that we do focus it and that our peace officers are properly funded with this money, which uh, should be directed to them. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, the secretary will take the roll. As, as you recall, there was a roll call requested on the amendment to the amendment as well as the underlying amendment. The secretary will take the roll. Members, please vote. Senator Rasmussen, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Abler votes aye. Senator Abler votes aye. Senator Anderson votes aye. Senator Anderson votes aye. Senator Howe votes aye. Senator Howe votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Uh, who is the last one? Senator Lang votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. And Senator Liskey votes aye. And Senator Liskey votes aye. Senator Bowden, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. I report that Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator May Quaid votes no. Senator May Quaid votes no. And Senator Port votes no. Senator Port votes no. Senator Rasmussen, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Abler votes no. Senator Abler votes no. All senators having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 32 ayes and 34 noes, the amendment to the amendment is not adopted. <laughs> Members, as a friendly reminder, we are on the A35, which is the underlining amendment. Before I let the author have, have the last word, any, any, any discussion? Seeing none, Senator Jaskowski. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, well, uh, Mr. President, uh, I think Senator Gustafson um, really said it. Uh, the bill, the way it's written, is written very broadly. And this amendment will make certain that the money is used for law enforcement, for supporting our police officers and their needs within their agencies, their mental health support uh, for people who uh, provide public safety and the protection of, of our citizenry and the enforcement of our laws. Um, but as I read the what we currently have in the bill, members, it says uh, on 137.19, including but not limited to. So 
that means the local um, unit of government could use it for almost whatever they want to use it for. And so when this money is deployed, Mr. President, if this goes into law, which it probably will, um, we are going to have police agencies around the state that are going to say, well, this money was used for something over there that is very much t tangential to what their core function is. And it can, uh, so that is what we are doing with the language in the bill. I think the lack of focus here is problematic. I don't think it's, it's expressly going in the direction that maybe the title of this section represents. If we go on further in, uh, in subdivision six there on page 137, we say it can be used or for community engagement. So it can be used for community engagement. I, I don't know what that means, Mr. President. I don't see a definition of community engagement in here. It could be a, maybe it, it could be a block party. Uh, it could be a, a festival. Uh, it could be a circus. Um, I don't know what community engagement is. Uh, or to pay other personnel and equipment costs. Other personnel and equipment costs. So we can hire people, they can hire people, it just says other personnel. It doesn't have to, apparently doesn't have to be public safety staff, doesn't have to be public safety equipment. That's the way the language members is written. If you look at the amendment, it makes it very clear that we're going to focus this, this, um, this funding properly on the areas of local government that will provide uh, for the enforcement of our laws um, and the protection of the people in the state of Minnesota and give our local law enforcement the uh, resources they need to do what they need to do. So I encourage your support for the amendment and I know we've the, already asked for the roll call. Thank you, Mr. President. The secretary will take the roll on the A35 amendment. A roll call was requested and the roll call was granted. <laughs> Members, please vote. Senator Rasmussen, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Abler votes aye. Senator Abler votes aye. Senator Anderson votes aye. Senator Anderson votes aye. Senator Howe votes aye. Senator Howe votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. And thank you, Mr. President. Senator Liskey votes aye. Senator Liskey votes aye. Senator Bowden, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. I report that Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Port votes no. Senator Port votes no. Senator Frentz votes no. Senator Frentz votes no. Senator McQuaid votes no. Senator McQuaid votes no. And Senator Seeberger votes no. And Senator Seeberger votes no. And she voted in person, so we're fine there. All senators having voted who desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There have been 33 ayes and 34 noes. The A35 amendment is not adopted. Senator uh, Nelson. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I have the A44. The A40. A44. Senator Nelson offers the A44 amendment. The secretary will report the A44 amendment. Senator Nelson moves to amend House File Number 1938 as amended pursuant to Rule 45 as follows. Page 279 after line 15, insert. This is the A44 amendment. Senator Nelson, to your A44 amendment. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. President and members. Uh, the A44 amendment is something that is important to uh, many uh, across our state. Our legions, our youth hockey, youth baseball, Elks clubs, Police Benevolent Funds, associate, Fire Benevolent Associations, Relief Clubs, uh, Youth Football, um, just, a, just a number of our nonprofits, um, a, a number of our charitable gaming uh, 
uh, purveyors. And one of the things that you note in the bill before us today, uh, that we are retiring, there's about $180 million actually in the bill before us today, that was being used uh, to pay those uh, stadium bonds, which will no longer be needed. And back in 2012, when we took up the stadium, you might recall when we funded that, that we really funded it on the back of our charitable gaming. Uh, our charitable gaming w was at a tax, pretty extensive tax, was added to charitable gaming to help pay for the stadium bonds. And uh, at the time, some of those, um, some of the charitable gaming uh, games were not very profitable. Now the t tide has turned and they've been very profitable. But the point is uh, now that we do not need uh, those charitable gaming taxes, which now many of our charitable gaming uh, uh, organizations are paying more in taxes than they are towards their charitable mission. And so the amendment before us members, since those stadium bonds no longer will need to be paid for by taxing charitable gaming to the point that uh, they're paying more in taxes than their mission, uh, the bill before us uh, reduces the tax rate on charitable gaming. Uh, we have four different levels, as you know, of combined net receipts. Uh, the lowest level, not over 87,500, reduces it from nine to seven. The next level, uh, up to 122,500, reduces that taxation from 18% to 15%. And the third uh, level, uh, that up to 157, 1,500 reduces that net tax receipts from 27 to 22 percent. And uh, those that have over 157,500 are currently paying 36 percent. Uh, this would reduce that to 30 percent, uh, Mr. President. Mr. President, point of order. Uh, Senator Rest, for what uh, purpose do you rise? Um, this um, amendment is um, out of balance under uh, Rule 7.4. Paragraph two, which is to say, the uh, it um, re re by reducing net revenue to a fund for a fiscal biennium without a corresponding reduction in net appropriation compared to the bill as reported to the floor of the Senate. Advice, Senator uh, Nelson. Yes, uh, th th thank you, Mr. President. Well, the point is. There's $180 million that is no longer going to be used to pay for stadium bonds. Uh, this um, amendment uh, is not, is far less than $180 million. Uh, thank you, Senator Therefore, Nelson. Therefore, it is germane. Thank you, Senator Nelson. I'm going to come, uh, uh, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask you to find the uh, point of order not in well, uh, not in order, um, or not well taken, uh, Mr. President. Certainly, we have the stadium reserve fund in the bill. I think what Senator uh, Nelson is doing is moving a portion of that away from the general fund to this. It keeps the bill in balance, and I uh, encourage you to rule in favor of Senator Nelson's amendment. All right. Thank you so much. I'm going to take uh, some additional advice. Thank you, dear. <laughs> Nearby. 
Thank you so much, members, for being patient. After receiving advice and listening listen to the advice here, also reading rules, uh, Senator uh, Ress's point is well taken. Uh, Senator Appeal. Nelson, you appeal, appeal the, the decision of the, of the chair. No. Uh, roll call, uh, Senator Klein. President, I request a roll call. Roll call requested, roll call granted. Members, uh, whenever you're appealing the decision of the president, it must be made immediately after, your, after my ruling, and that was done. The, the question before the body is, shall the decision of the president be the judgment of the Senate pursuant to Senate Rule 14.4? As you know, members, but I'll remind you, a green vote upholds the decision of the president, and a red vote overrules the decision of the president. The secretary will take the roll. <laughs> members, please vote. <laughs> members, remember, this is uh, uh, we are. Uh, uh, the decision of the president has been appealed. That's what you're voting for. Please vote. Senator Rasmussen, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Anderson votes no. Senator Anderson votes no. Senator Howe votes no. Senator Howe votes no. Senator Lang votes no. Senator Lang votes no. And thank you, Mr. President. Senator Liskey votes no. Senator Liskey votes no. Senator Bowden, those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. I report that Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. Senator Frentz votes aye. Senator Frentz votes aye. Senator Gustafson votes aye. Senator Gustafson votes aye. Senator McQuaid votes aye. Senator McQuaid votes aye. And Senator Seeberger votes aye. Senator Seeberger votes aye. Mr. President. Uh, Senator Pratt. Absentees. Okay, absentees. All senators having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 34 ayes and 32 noes, the decision of the president is upheld. <laughs> Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. President. I would offer the A33 amendment. Senator Rasmussen offers the A33 amendment. The secretary will, re will report the A33 amendment. Senator Rasmussen moves to amend House file number 1938 as amended pursuant to rule 45 as follows. Page 273 after line two, insert. This is the A33 amendment. Senator Rasmussen to the A33 amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the A33 uses a surplus trigger to eliminate the June accelerated payment for excise taxes here in Minnesota. Um, this uh, is, in my view, Mr. President, just an improvement in making sure that we are cleaning up uh, an old budget shift that would be good tax policy. I appreciate the work that Senator Westrom, Senator Ress, Senator Klein, and Senator Putnam have done on similar bills, and there is a hearing on a similar bill in the Taxes Committee this year. And Mr. President, members, uh, following the advice of Senator Rest, this trigger would only occur if the surplus was beyond all other state obligations, including our budget reserve. Um, and so would would ask for member support on the A33 to help clean up uh, one of these budget shifts that we used uh, in previous days here in the legislature uh, and to try to make our tax code a little bit more simple and clean. Senator Rest. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I would urge members to um, vote no. This is an amendment uh, with a slightly different um, cause, if you will, that we addressed earlier in the day. Um, the um, 
uh, portions of the um, <clears throat> June accelerated tax are in here and uh, as a, um, a priority. Um, but at this point, um, I think it, we need to be extremely more conservative and, and cautious, and we voted that way um, um, previously. So um, um, I request a roll call and would ask members to vote no. Roll call requested, roll call granted. Any other uh, thoughts or, or discussion before we go to the author of the amendment? Seeing none, uh, Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. President. And you know, for those who maybe aren't as familiar with the history on this amendment, we are basically taking a tax and having uh, the remitters of that tax pay early uh, to help us with one-time budget needs. And so what this would do is it effectively is a one-time cost to go back to having these remitters of this tax pay it on schedule. Um, I think it is something that we should take a look at, and I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to get this fixed eventually. Um, but with that, Mr. President, I would withdraw the A33 amendment. The A33 amendment has been withdrawn. Any further discussions or amendments? Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. President and uh, Senator Rest. I hope this one can be considered a friendly amendment. I'm going to try. Uh, so this has to deal with Article 9, uh, dealing with the St. Paul, a 1% uh, tax, local tax, uh, for street improvements. Um, so with that, I'd offer the A21 amendment. Senator Jasinski offers the A21 amendment. The secretary will report the A21 amendment. Senator Jasinski moves to amend House File Number 1938 as amended pursuant to Rule 45 as follows. Page 201, line 22, after improvements, insert. This is the A21 amendment. Senator Jasinski to your A21 amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And again, I know Senator Dibble will support me in this for roads and bridges and money that we can put towards our roads and bridges. And all of us travel the streets of St. Paul, especially this spring. It's been a terrible year. And what uh, St. Paul's 1% uh, tax would do is go towards street improvements. So this is no shifts, no gimmicks. All I'm asking for out of the $738 million that St. Paul's going to invest in the roadways, that they come up with a specific plan uh, to deal with annual pothole repair and maintenance. Uh, members, I know I've brought, talked about it before, but on John Ireland Boulevard, there's about a nine inch deep pothole that I seem to try and maneuver around every day, and there's so many more. So uh, this would really improve the pothole uh, problem here in St. Paul. And with that, I'd ask for, hoping it's a friendly amendment, if not, ask for a green vote. Uh, Senator Rest. Uh, thank you, um, um, uh, Mr. President. I'm sorry to disappoint you. Um, I would urge members to vote no. And if you drove into um, the uh, MSB, it is uh, the potholes are filled. Did you notice that today? Yeah. Please vote no. Roll Sit call. Uh, roll call requested, roll call granted. Any additional discussion before we go to the author of the amendment? Senator Jaziski, anything else before we vote? Uh, thank you, Mr. President. No, just again, I want to add that there's a lot of potholes out there, and this would surely, it doesn't say any amount that they have to do, it just says they should come up with a pothole plan every year for maintenance. So I still ask for a green vote. Thank you. The secretary will take the roll on the A21 amendment. Members, please vote. Yep. Senator Rasmussen, those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Abler votes aye. Senator Abler votes aye. Senator Anderson votes aye. Senator Anderson votes aye. Senator Howe votes aye. Senator Howe votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Senator who? Senator Lang votes aye. Lang votes aye. And thank you, Mr. President. Senator Liskey votes aye. And Senator Liskey votes aye. 
Senator Bowden, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Port votes no. Senator Port votes no. Senator Friends votes no. Senator Friends votes no. Senator Gustafson votes no. Senator Gustafson votes no. Senator May Quaid votes no. Senator May Quaid votes no. And Senator Seeberger votes no. And Senator Seeberger votes no. Senator Carlson, are you planning to vote? All senators haven't voted. Who desires to vote? The secretary will close the roll. There being 33 ayes and 34 noes, the A21 amendment is not adopted. Any additional uh, amendments? Senator Jaskowski. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to offer the A26 amendment. Senator Jaskowski offers the A26 amendment. The secretary will, will report the A26 amendment. Senator Draskowski moves to amend, <clears throat> excuse me, House file number 1938 as amended pursuant to rule 45 as follows. Page 142, line six, before secure, insert A. This is the A26 amendment. Senator Draskowski to your A26 amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, members, this is related to the firearm storage units, the, the gun safe uh, exemption on sales tax. It's included in the bill. Uh, I thank Chair Rest for bringing this provision. It's uh, one that uh, we had a, a lot of good, very good support for in committee. It's a small provision, uh, but uh, uh, I approached uh, the chair about this earlier and showed her the language, and I'd like her to uh, take a look at it again now that it's before her again, and maybe a chance for her to comment. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Rest to the A26 Amendment. Um, thank you, um, Mr. President. I support the amendment. And um, ask for a roll call and vote green. Roll call requested, roll call granted. Any additional discussions before we go through to the author? The author doesn't want anything else. He doesn't have anything else. So the secretary will take the roll on the A26 Amendment. Senator Rasmussen, those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Abler votes aye. Senator Abler votes aye. Senator Anderson votes aye. Senator Anderson votes aye. Senator Howe votes aye. Senator Howe votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. And thank you, Mr. President. Senator Liskey votes aye. And Senator Liskey votes aye. Senator Bowden for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. I report that Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. Senator Friends votes aye. Senator Friends votes aye. Senator Gustafson votes aye. Senator Gustafson votes aye. Senator May Quaid votes aye. Senator May Quaid votes aye. And Senator Seeberger votes aye. And Senator Seeberger votes aye. All senators having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 65 ayes and zero noes, the A26 is adopted. Senator Drehein. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and uh, I'd, I'd like to thank all the, the members for the great discussion we've had today. Um, we've had a lot of discussion about the stadium reserve account. We, we've had some discussion about how important charitable gambling is to our local communities and how successful e poll tabs have been. Without e poll tabs, we would not be able to pay off the stadium. And I, I thought, wow, you know, we, we have a long history of supporting professional sports teams which I enjoy. I, I'm a, as you know, Mr. President, I'm a huge sports guy. Um, I, I get to travel watching my son play ball. I got to watch my daughter play. 
I get to travel every corner of the state, and I hear something everywhere I go. The need for more resources for kids' sports facilities. So late this year, I dropped a bill, Senate file 3214, that I thought was the happy medium. Let's take that very successful program that helped us pay off the U.S. Bank Stadium early, which is rare for government, and instead of investing in millionaires and billionaires, Mr. President, I thought, let's invest in kids. And not only let's invest in kids, but let's make sure whatever resources we can scrape together for our kids, we spread it out to every corner of the state. So with that, I'd like to offer the A-14. Senator Dreheim offers the A-14 amendment. The secretary will report the A-14 amendment. Senator Dreheim moves to amend House File Number 1938 as amended pursuant to Rule 45 as follows. Page 270 after line 1, insert. This is the A-14 amendment. Senator Dreheim to your A-14 amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. And, and thank you, colleagues, for, for bearing with me on this. Um, pretty straightforward. We, we, after the stadium's paid off, we take the existing structure and we reinvest in kids. We give 65% of it to the Amateur Sports Commission to grant money to the different congressional districts. We give 20% to Men State and all our college campuses. We give 10% to the U of M. And the reason 20% for Men State, they have more campuses and their facilities are older than the U of M. And then we give a little bit for the Sports Authority to pay for the program. And then we have local units of government apply for the grants by congressional district to make sure there's no favoritism in different parts of the state, to make sure every kid, no matter where they're born, has a chance to play on a field that isn't full of potholes. So with that, um, I offer the A14. Uh, Senator Rest, the A14 Amendment. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Mr. President. Well, I love this amendment, and Senator Draheim knows I'm such an enthusiast for um, youth sports. One of the best moments of my sports life was um, throwing out the first pitch at a Crystal Little League uh, uh, game some, um, some years ago. Um, and I certainly hope that um, those of us um, uh, in this chamber who are going to be meeting and discussing um, the stadium reserves and just um, how we're going to go about supporting um, uh, youth sports, take the suggestions that are given in Senator Draheim's amendment, but I reluctantly um, have to ask for a, a roll call and a uh, red vote. Roll call requested, roll call granted. Senator Marty. Mr. Chairman, pursuant to Rule 7.4, I would challenge the, um, that this bill violates um, the rule both on the fact that it's sending money to an agency that's not in the bill as it was reported to the floor, and number two, because it would be taking revenue from the fund without a corresponding reduction in, in uh, corresponding increase in revenue. Mr. President. Advice, Senator Draheim. Thank you, and, and thank you, uh, Senator, for, for bringing that up. I have, I had talked to Senator Rest before today, um, and if, if she wasn't gonna support it, I was gonna withdraw the bill or the amendment so to save time, because I'm sure we all want to get out of here, I will withdraw the A14. The A14 has been withdrawn. Any additional amendments? Seeing none, the secretary will give the bill its third reading. House file number 1938, a bill for an act relating to financing and operation of state and local government, modifying provisions governing individual income and corporate franchise taxes, et cetera. Third reading. Members, any final comments before we always go to the author last? Uh, Senator Klein. Uh, 
Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President, members, and thank you for a good debate on the tax bill today. Uh, I just want to say a couple comments about the process of the committee itself, which is such a thrill. They're, one of the special gifts of participating in the tax committee is that you're participating in a historical part of the Senate, an institution that really carries a great deal of gravity with it and a great deal of history with it. Uh, I've been honored this year to serve with Senator Rest, Chair Rest but also equally graced by the, the experience and wisdom of Senators Weber and Nelson, Dreskowski and Miller, uh, Senator Diedzik. I had the opportunity this year to connect with uh, retired Senators Skoy and Senator Bach and their, their perspective from, from a 30,000-foot you know, view on what we're doing in this committee. Uh, it's important work. It benefits Minnesotans, and the people who do it take it extremely seriously, and I'm honored to be a part of that. Also, I uh, want to dub double up on Senator Ress's uh, thanks to our staff that uh, makes us better while staying invisible. Um, Krista Broton, Nora Pollock, Eric Sylvia, Bjorn Arneson, and Casey Mum. Uh, members, I, I support the bill. Uh, I think we've uh, found a balanced way to uh, deliver what we promised to Minnesotans in terms of tax relief while sustaining the ambitions we have for a better state. And we've done it in a responsible way that does not raise individual income taxes on anyone. Uh, and members, I urge a green vote. Thank you, Senator Rust. Senator Miller. Thank you, Mr. President. I just want to take a moment to uh, thank Senator Rest and the rest of the tax committee. Um, while we didn't always agree in committee, it was a very respectful committee, and um, her staff, the, all the staff, uh, did a tremendous job. I especially want to thank uh, Senator Rest staff, Christy, and um, especially Mitch. Mitch did a fantastic job uh, just making sure that everyone was updated and communicating. Uh, with the members of, of both parties um, on that committee. So I, I appreciate Senator Rest and, and uh, the staff on both sides of the aisle, uh, as well as especially her team. There's a very important provision uh, in this bill for the city of Spring Grove. Um, they had a devastating fire in December uh, that uh, not only devastate, completely destroyed a hardware store, but also displaced uh, several families because of the apartments that were destroyed above that hardware store. And while the dollar amount in the big picture is, is relatively small, uh, it is going to make a huge impact on this small community in southeastern Minnesota. So I want to thank uh, Senator Ress for including that in this bill. Um, I'm concerned members about uh, the tax increases, especially on uh, businesses, and it's going to make uh, any companies that do uh, business in Minnesota, uh, it's going to make many of those companies um, have a competitive disadvantage because of this new mandatory worldwide tax. It's a first in the nation, uh, first in the world mandatory worldwide tax. I'm concerned that it's not going to generate uh, the revenue that was uh, in the revenue note, uh, and that's going to create a shortfall uh, in our budget that I'm already concerned about because of the massive amount of spending that's going on. Um, but there are, some, uh, there are some good things in this bill, like uh, the provision for the city of Spring Grove and some others. Um, if this bill comes back, from conference committee. I can't support it today uh, with the tax increases in there, but if it comes back from conference committee uh, without any tax increases and it includes a full repeal of the state income tax on Social Security benefits and provides uh, more relief for uh, Minnesotans, um, then it would be something that I could support. But uh, just wanted to stand up and thank Senator Ress for all of her good work as well as the rest of the committee. Senator Nelson. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. I, too, wanted to uh, thank Senator Rest for running um, a very good committee. Well run, very respectful, lots of important conversations where all views were valued. And quite frankly, there's a large number of good things in this tax bill. A number of them were ones that were part of that 
uh, by that um, conference committee report agreed to last year with the House, things that have broad bipartisan support. The historic tax credit, the angel investor tax credit, the child tax credit, certainly uh, a, a great disappointment that we did not see full elimination of uh, Social Security uh, income tax, uh, taxing those benefits, but a step in the right direction there. And there were also a couple new things that I think were uh, critical. Um, I'm very supportive of allowing the citizens of Rochester the opportunity to vote on a potential local sales tax. Senator Rest also included the new market tax credit, which is really uh, innovative and important in actually bringing that economic development to all corners of our state, particularly those census tracts that have not seen uh, the economics and the economic value of industry. And so those things are incredibly, incredibly helpful. And I particularly like the public safety the public safety aid. Certainly that has never been more important than it is right now. And I could go on and talk about a number of those things and, and I would be remiss if I did not thank Senator Rest for tasking uh, Senator Hoschild and I to go through all those local sales taxes. Uh, I, I believe it's a, it, it is a great uh, format for uh, tax committees in the future to do that. Those, uh, all of those were so well vetted because of the distribution of labor that she tasked Senator Hoschild and I with. So I'm incredibly thankful for that. But there's a couple really big clunkers in this bill that I'm wrestling with trying to get my mind around. And it is hard to comprehend, members, it is hard to comprehend starting this session with a $19 billion surplus and ending up uh, with um, over a billion dollars, $1.2 billion of tax increases. The tax itself is problematic as we've discussed so much. And my hope is as things progress through conference committee uh, that this bill will get better. We do want to keep all of the good parts, but it seems that there's some priorities somewhere along the line that uh, should cause us to uh, not, not increase taxes by over a billion dollars, 1.2 billion, at least just in that one um, mandatory worldwide reporting requirement, which no one else in the world is doing. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a wrestle uh, to wrestle through this, but there's no doubt that uh, it was a very well-run committee, and I do tip my hat to all of the staff uh, on um, both sides of the aisle, nonpartisan staff. They did a phenomenal job, and the tax committee is, uh, is the place to be. Thank you. Senator Hauschow. Thank you, Mr. President. When I got to the Senate, uh, one of the first conversations that I had was with uh, Senator Rest. And I went to her as a freshman and I said, uh, Senator, I'd like to be on the tax committee. And let's just say her reaction uh, was, was skeptical at best. Um, but, but we worked it and, uh, and serving on this committee has been uh, an incredible experience. And as part of being on the tax committee, the, the reason I really wanted to be on there was because I had really big priorities. And I really had wide eyes about what we could accomplish together with what we had. I wanted to look out for our wisest and our seniors, those on fixed income, by getting tax relief for social security income. I wanted to look out for our youngest and our families by providing childcare tax credits so that our families could afford childcare and continue to work during these workforce shortages that we're facing. And I wanted to provide for public safety to keep our community safe. And all of these things are funded at historic levels in this tax bill. A billion dollars for rebates for middle class families, a billion dollars for social security tax relief for 76% of seniors, middle class and upper middle class seniors on fixed incomes, a billion dollars for childcare expenses for families, and a billion dollars for some of the poorest families out there to reduce childhood poverty. 
These are all exceptional historic things that we're doing with this tax bill. And today we did have an opportunity to fully eliminate the tax on Social Security. Unfortunately, that was stopped in order to protect 34,000 Minnesotans at the expense of 227,000 seniors who could have had their Social Security income fully eliminated. So that's unfortunate, but I'm proud to have supported the full elimination of the tax on Social Security, and I look forward to continuing to work in a bipartisan fashion to make that happen in coming sessions. The other things in this bill that I'm proud of are the film tax credit that we've already talked a lot about. I think there's tremendous opportunities in our state to expand the film industry. We have some of the most diverse geography in the country in Minnesota, and especially uh, selfishly in my district, where I hope we can see the film industry flourish along the North Shore and in the Boundary Waters. In addition to that, uh, as is custom, Iron Range Senators have the opportunity to look at our mineral taxes. And in this bill, there's six million dollars in taconite money that are going directly to communities, snowmobile clubs, schools, and the like that are going to make a huge difference in the communities that I represent and the region that I represent. Lastly, I just want to say thank you to Senator Nelson for working alongside me on the sales tax request that we heard. It was a very long Friday and several meetings. Um, I think we were probably in there for about seven or eight hours straight listening to communities talk about the critical needs that they have. And if you really want to get a perspective of what communities need, listening in on those sessions, I think, is, is really a learning experience because you hear what is most important locally on the ground from the real leaders that know what they need. And that's why I'm supportive of these sales tax requests. It's why I supported it as a Hermantown City Councilor and why I'm proud that we have them included in the Senate bill. I want to thank Chair Rest, Vice Chair Klein, and the other members of the tax committee, the staff are some of the most incredible staff that we have here in the Senate, and I genuinely mean that. Uh, when you have a question, they get back to you immediately. Um, it's, it's honestly shocking to me how, how much information they can pack in um, and get to us so quickly. So um, I look forward to, to supporting this bill, and I think we can make a real difference for Minnesotans. Thank you. Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I want to thank Senator Rest for this bill uh, and really uh, thank her for the historic tax credit provision in this bill. Uh, it's very, very important to a lot of our small cities, but especially to my city, Faribault, which has the second most number of historic buildings in the state of Minnesota outside St. Paul. And this tax credit really does help uh, property owners, investors, and developers uh, to improve these properties, to keep them here in a, a safe manner so they, c they look like they always have and they can be improved. So it's very, very important. I want to thank Senator uh, Rest for that. Uh, also, Rice County has a, a provision in here uh, for a 3 cents sales tax for a Rice County Public Safety Center, which is very, very important. This way, it'll be able to go to the voters in uh, Rice County to decide if they want to implement that sales tax or not. Uh, but I am concerned about the increase in taxes, and this is nothing political. I don't want to get partisan about it, but as I've said many times, I'm involved in real estate uh, development, a lot of businesses, and they are concerned, and they are leaving the state. And a lot of these businesses are the ones that are creating jobs, uh, providing investment, uh, paying property taxes. There's just a lot of, of businesses that are concerned about the tax uh, environment here in Minnesota, and folks, they are leaving. And we all hear about it uh, in your district, about business either not, not leaving or they're not expanding, or I'm sorry, they are leaving or they're not expanding. Uh, so it is a concern to me. Uh, also, uh, by not eliminating the complete uh, tax on Social Security, uh, I have a tough time voting it. But again, I want to thank Senator Rest. Uh, she's someone I, I, I deeply appreciate here in the Senate and respect. Uh, I think it's a uh, bill that uh, hopefully when it comes back, uh, as Senator Miller said, we can vote for it if there's a few uh, changes. Uh, but I know Senator Rest has, has fought and off new taxes as best she can. Uh, which is good for Minnesota, so I, I appreciate that. And hopefully when it comes back, uh, we'll be able to vote in favor. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Dibble. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, members, this is a tax bill we can be very, very proud of. And uh, for those of my friends who are sitting on the other side, I urge you, take a good close look at this bill. Consider voting for it. $4 billion in funds that are going to go back 
to Minnesotans, a billion dollars uh, in, in rebates, uh, $1.24 billion in tax savings for uh, those who are currently paying taxes on their Social Security income, uh, almost a billion dollars for those to help those with kids in child care. Uh, and what's really exciting, $1.34 billion for the child tax credit, lifting so many kids up and out of poverty. That is really, really exciting. And that is worthy of us and worthy of the work we do here in the Senate, uh, helping communities with public safety, uh, helping on property taxes, uh, increasing the market value exclusion, increasing the targeted property tax refund. Members, we talk so often about property taxes and the, the relative regressive nature of it. Uh, and, you know, I'm proud of the fact that our state is, I think, rated the fifth or sixth most in terms of progressivity in its overall uh, tax system. This bill makes it more progressive, and that is something with, we can be uh, very, very proud of. More uh, assistance in local government aid and county program aid. Uh, we have suffered uh, grievous, grievous hits uh, under uh, a governor a couple of governors ago and have not made up the ground ever since. And think about what the genius of local government aid is. It means that we share in the overall prosperity of the state and deliver those local services that touch people's lives on a daily basis and at the same time uh, make sure that those local units of government for historic or geographic differences that are no fault of their own uh, are not made to be over-reliant on their local ability to generate those funds and those services from their property taxes. Uh, and in particular, I want to thank Senator Rest uh, for recognizing community land trusts under the 4D program. Community land trusts, an important innovation here in Minnesota where people can come into affordable home ownership and now uh, enjoy the benefit of a lower property tax rate and make that a particular form of home ownership first access for many families starting on that path of building wealth, intergenerational wealth, made more accessible by that inclusion of, of the 4D provision. So members, um, there's a really, really good uh, progressive proposals in here. I was disappointed to hear about the defense of corporations that are hiding their profits and hiding their, from their responsibilities here in the state and the uh, effort to protect the, the very, very wealthiest when we could have expanded the Social Security income deduction to everyone. Um, but nevertheless, you have an opportunity here to redeem yourself from those arguments and those debates and vote green on this bill. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll be very brief. This tax bill represents an incredible failure in opportunity. All session long, Republicans have been offering ideas, amendments, and multiple opportunities to have a full repeal of the tax on Social Security over and over and over again. Early weeks, early months of this session, we heard Democrats give excuses, delay tactics, stalling, let's have committee hearings, let's have a full vetting. Well, now is that opportunity to actually fulfill campaign promises. And when the rubber meets the road, what do Democrats do? Shifting gimmicks. They put forward an amendment with an amendment to the amendment so that they can say they voted for the full repeal after weeks and months of stalling and voting down efforts to have a, a genuine, sincere, full repeal of the tax on Social Security. It's not going to fly, Mr. President. Minnesotans are watching, and they know full well. They remember the Democrats in these districts around the state with their promises to have a full repeal as a result of the $19 billion budget surplus. Not, not to raise taxes with a pseudo message of saying, I fulfilled my campaign promise with a disingenuous attempt to vote by raising taxes on others. That's not going to fly, Mr. President. 
The other provision I'll mention in this bill is the film tax credit. What I see happening, Mr. President, is there will be people who want to write films, come to Minnesota, film, films I should say, using this provision to write a documentary, to create a documentary, how to destroy a state in one session. That's the documentary that film people and industry are going to come to Minnesota. How businesses are laying off just today. There's a headline, 3M is laying off not 600 employees, Minnesota-based, but 1,100 employees. Businesses are closing, laying off, or otherwise relocating. That's going to be part of the legacy of the Democrat majority. Bus schools are failing. Schools are failing. It's abysmal what's happening. The documentary that the film filmmakers will make on Minnesota is how Democrats are absolutely tone deaf to the reality of the failing schools. The crime rates, the documentary that needs to be written and will be written on Minnesota is how Democrats have a revolving door of not holding criminals accountable but letting them back out on the street to terrorize law-abiding citizens. And the film makers are going to have to include in their documentary the Democrat attacks on religious liberty. Their attempts in multiple areas, multiple topics. Again, in the documentary of how to destroy a state in one session or less. It's not even been a full session yet, and we have already see the results of the impacts of the Democrat failed leadership. And this bill is just another in a long line of examples. So Mr. President, we have an opportunity to vote this bill down. We should vote this bill down, send it back to committee to do what's right. Not only to have a genuine full repeal of the Social Security tax, not just a talking point that I voted green on an amendment to an amendment before that amendment was voted down. That's not going to make anybody happy. Minnesotans are going to see right through that smoke and mirrors. And we can actually do what's right for everybody across this state by giving the surplus back to hardworking Minnesotans. And for that reason, Mr. President, I encourage a red vote on this terrible Democrat bill. Thank you. Senator Weber, before we go to Senate, uh, Senate Minority Leader Johnson, Senator Weber. Thank you, Mr. President. We heard Senator Rest at the beginning of today talk, uh, give thanks to the members of our staff, and I would like to echo that. Certainly, we, our, our nonpartisan staff is, is top notch. Casey, Bjorn, Eric, and Nora are always there and always helpful and really know their stuff, and there's just no way around that. I thank, I'm thankful for my partisan researcher, Daniel Mickelberg. Uh, without him, I would truly be lost. And I would like to comment that the, the DFL staff, the uh, researcher, Krista Broughton, uh, the committee legislative assistant, Christy Blood, and committee administrator, Mitch Bergren, have been most helpful and polite uh, during this entire, entire season. I want to thank my fellow members on the Senate. I agree with Senator Miller when he earlier said we had a truly respectful debate on the issues that were in front of us. Do we agree on everything? No. Some days we don't even come close. But we had good discussion and we had a thorough discussion of the bills that were in front of us. I thank uh, Senator Klein who was tasked to, together with me to go over the uh, different uh, TIF legislation bills that were in front of us. And I thank Senator Rest. Certainly, she approached her job with a sense of bipartisanship in the terms of the bills that she was willing to hear 
and in terms of what she has included in the final bill that is before us today. Mr. President, we have learned a lot this session. We have learned that a $17.5 billion surplus, formerly $19 billion before the accounting change, will not stop tax increases. We have learned that a $17.5 billion surplus, formerly $19 billion before the accounting change, will not be shared with all who helped create it. We have learned that there is little appreciation for those who create jobs and employ Minnesotans, simply more costs to do business here. What is the sum of what we've learned? Certainly not $17.5 billion, formerly $19 billion, before the accounting change. Representing a border district as a state senator and having served as a councilman and mayor for a border community, I have been used to offsetting the problems caused by the state of Minnesota. And truthfully, I honestly do not feel that this bill will help our communities to develop the business and jobs that they need, nor will it stop the migration of our retired people from this state. It offers modest tokens of relief to some, but certainly not to all. I recognize that some don't care about businesses and higher income level people who have been successful in their careers or their businesses, but you will when no one is left to pay the bill. Earlier today, Senator Gustafson talked about we have to do some of these things because the Republican Senate didn't get it done last year. Well, let me tell you, Mr. President, what the Senate did get done and who caused the problems. Last year in the Tax Conference Committee, we had agreed to full elimination of state tax on all Social Security benefits. The only thing that we had left to do was to meet, to finalize the final conference and approve the final conference report and send it to the House. What happened was that the governor and the Speaker of the House would not let the House members come back to that committee meeting to approve that. The Senate conferees sat there waiting for them and waited for them and waited for them and they never showed up. And we did that, Mr. President, with a projected $12 billion surplus. Today, we have a surplus that's or $7 billion more, but we could not pass full exclusion of state tax on Social Security benefits. Last year again, before the Governor and the Speaker pulled the plug on the Tax Conference Committee, we had raised the homestead exemption of real property, of agriculture, of residential, of resort homestead property. And in my bill, I had taken $26 million from the state general levy to offset the shift that would occur to our commercial and industrial properties. This year, I appreciate the fact that Senator Resch took my bill again and increased those homestead exemption amounts. However, the $35 million that I included to offset the shifts this year is not there. However, mandatory worldwide reporting is a measure that will create international trade issues and problems for the businesses of this state and will negatively affect major economic areas of this state, including agriculture, agricultural process, product uh, processing, the lumber business, and many other businesses within the Twin City area. Part of the issue that arose is with the early agreement of joint targets between the legislature and the governor, there was not a target large enough given to the tax committee. Now, Senator Rest will not complain about that, but I will. They basically made sure that her tax bill would not be able to offer full benefit 
to our Social Security recipients. And so the moment of truth is here, Mr. President. As the lead for the Tax Committee, I will just simply say this to you. If you are against raising taxes, you can vote no on this bill. If you campaigned for full elimination of state tax on Social Security benefits, you can vote against this bill. If you believe that tax relief is deserved by all, you can vote no on this bill. Unless, of course, Mr. President, you are a Democrat. Then you are expected to ignore your campaign promises that you must ex you're expected to ignore those businesses that provide your constituents their jobs, and you must ignore the fact that a $17.5 billion surplus, formerly $19 billion before the accounting change, is not enough to keep your party from raising taxes and fees in order to increase this state's budget by 40 percent, an increase that even then will not solve our nursing home problems, even then will defund our education system with the mandates that you are thinking of passing, even then that will continue to chase people out of this state. I encourage you to vote no. Senator Johnson. Thank you, Mr. President. And first of all, I just want to go a little bit off script. Uh, Senator Rast, I just want to say thank you for uh, the bill that you've proposed here today. In the fact that you've been able to work across the aisle on a number of issues that impact our districts, which has been very important for our members and has built up a great deal of respect because it is something that we have not seen this legislative session. So for you to do that uh, is, is uh, a model for chairs and members on both sides uh, to emulate. And it was good to see on the floor today your willingness to work with Senator Coleman on getting proposals done that the state of Minnesota will benefit from. However, going back to the bill, when we're looking at this particular bill, it brings up a, a quote that John Kennedy, President Kennedy, once said, where he said, an economy constrained by high taxes will never produce enough revenue to balance its budget, and just as it will never produce enough jobs. That's what we're seeing here in the state of Minnesota. Minnesotans being one of the highest tax populations in the nation, with such a large surplus at the beginning of this, uh, of this session, certainly did not need an increase in taxes. Nobody in this state needed their taxes increased. Yet Democrats in the Senate, the House, and the Governor's office are proposing upwards of $9 billion of new tax increases spread across a number of bills because $18 billion of surplus, $18 billion was not enough extra money to finance this single party spending spree. In fact, Democrats can't find enough in a $72 billion budget, which remember, last biennium, it was $52 billion. We've increased it here by an order of, of uh, $20 billion, a growth of 30%. We can't find enough money in that to give our most vulnerable, our, our seniors, a bit of a break for the work that they've done. That's out of touch. That's a broken promise. As we've been reiterating over and over again this session, that is a high priority for Senate Republicans. Senate Democrats have even campaigned on those promises. You know, we can't get that done in these bills. There are 33 votes to repeal the tax on Social Security. Republicans are here to work on that. That's what we want to make sure, that that tax relief is getting back to Minnesotans. This bill offers some small rebate checks and a little partial Social Security relief. If you said you are going to give back the surplus, this bill does not do it. We could have bigger rebate checks, but again, we can't find that from Senate Democrats. That's, that's just part of my concern. Another part of my concern is what happens when this tax bill goes over and meets up with the House tax bill, which we've seen, again, higher taxes than that one yet. 
Mark Twain said it best that no man's life, liberty, or property is safe while the Minnesota State Legislature is in session. Now, I'm not sure, that might be a paraphrase, but we're certainly proving that this session. There are many reasons to vote no on this bill. As we've discussed here, uh, many members have talked about that today. I'll just reiterate, with an $18 billion surplus, there is no good reason to raise taxes. Let's give that surplus back, and let's give seniors a the relief they need. This is a disappointment. We can do better. We can unite and serve Minnesotans. That's what we are elected for. That's what we're here for tonight. Members, please vote no. Let's do better for Minnesota. To the bill author, Senator Ress. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. President and, and members. Um, first of all, I want to thank the President of the Senate. He has often a job that um, calls for mediating between people who have very strong opinions about issues that are before us, and he does it uh, masterfully, and we should all be grateful for him, to him, and thank him for that. Secondly, um, I want to especially uh, thank Senator Nelson and Weber, um, not only for their work this year, um, but for the bill that uh, at least three of us um, helped um, and participate in putting together uh, last year. At the beginning of um, today's session, I uh, thanked all of our staff members, and I want to call out one more time um, Senator um, <clears throat> South Childs, L.A., um, Jamie Hishlin, who uh, dealt with uh, and ran the, um, did the staffing for the um, uh, local sales tax um, group, and was, that was much um, appreciated. And then finally, um, uh, this is my favorite day. I've told my own caucuses, my favorite day of the whole session um, to, um, uh, to deal with the tax bill. Um, it went by for me in a blink, in a blink. I urge a green vote. The secretary would take the roll on final passage of Senate file, of House file 19, 1938. <laughs> Members, please vote. Senator Rasmussen, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Abler votes no. Senator Abler votes no. Senator Anderson votes no. Senator Anderson votes no. Senator Howe votes no. Senator Howe votes no. Senator Lang votes no. Senator Lang votes no. And thank you, Mr. President. Senator Liskey votes no. And Senator Liskey votes no. Senator Bowden, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. I report that Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. Senator Gustafson votes aye. Senator Gustafson votes aye. Senator May Quaid votes aye. Senator May Quaid votes aye. And Senator Seeberger votes aye. And Senator Seeberger votes aye. Members, please vote. I'm going to close the board shortly. All senators having voted who desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 34 ayes and 33 noes, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. <laughs> Members, we will now go to the 13th order of business, announcements of Senate interests. Uh, Senator, friends, hold on one moment. We're waiting for the excuses. 
Sinner, uh, uh, sinner. Without objection, the following senators will be excused from today's session. Latz from 6.55 to 7.10 p.m. Rest and Klein from 2.35 to 2.45 p.m. Any additional announcements of Senate interest? Seeing none, Senator Frentz. Thank you, Mr. President and members. I move that the Senate do now adjourn until Wednesday, May 3rd at 11 a.m. On that motion, any discussion? All in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. The Senate is now adjourned. <laughs>